Are you still up? The Nightingale Conat Corporation is proud to present The Power of Purpose, How to Create the Life You've Always Wanted by Les Brown. From the humblest of beginnings, Les Brown has emerged as one of the most sought-after motivational speakers and consultants in the world today. He is one of the nation's leading authorities in understanding and stimulating human potential. He is also the author of the highly acclaimed books, Live Your Dreams, and It's Not Over Until You Win. Discover your purpose. Let Les Brown guide you to a life rich with integrity, freedom, and passion. And now, here's Les Brown. I want to talk to you about those that are making it today or what it takes to make it today. In a time of great uncertainty, in a time of change that's taking place around the world, in a time when people are feeling a great deal of anxiety and fear and reservations about the future, at a time when people are going to work and don't know whether or not they will have a job when they get off, and not necessarily because of their performance, but because of what's happening in the economy. At a time when there are challenges, more so than ever before, in personal relationships, we look at what's happening on a crime level, and what's happening with our youth, that many times I'm sure that we've all taken time just to stop and reflect many times when we hear what's happening in the news or read the newspapers, Where's all of this leading to? What's going on here? And so I think that now more than ever, we must begin to look at what are the things that we can do that would put us on some firm footing in life, that will enable us to do some things and, and use some powers that we have that many of us go through life never ever discovering that we have those things going for us. And part of that, I believe, is knowing what it is your life work. What is it that gives your life a sense of meaning and purpose? Because once you find that, it puts you in your power place. See, if you know what your life work is, I encourage you to start working on it. If you can't do it all at one time, do just a little bit of it. And if you don't know what it is that you showed up to do, if you don't know why you're here, I encourage you to find out what your purpose is here. What is the meaning of your life? What will be different? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I've done that. I, I remember coming from a friend of mine's funeral and I was reflecting on how much time I had left. And I went for a walk in a park thinking about this guy whose life was so promising. And I mean, he wasn't an old guy. He was quite young, in fact. And I thought about all of the things that he said he was going to do, and he never got a chance to do those things. And I start thinking about my own life and how much time I had left to do the things that I would like to do. And at that time, I wasn't sure what my life purpose was, what my life's work was. I wasn't sure about it at that time. And I thought about it quite a lot. I had some idea, but I, I wasn't convinced that I don't think I felt worthy. I didn't believe that it could be me to do this kind of work that I'm doing right now. And I say to you that if you begin to take a conscious effort to find out what it is that you're supposed to do, I say that it can literally save your life. I said that it can literally save your life. I was telling a group of people of a study that was conducted. Dr. Larry Darcy, who wrote a book called Recovering the Soul, he said, human beings are the only living species that has achieved the dubious distinction of dying or having a stroke or a heart attack on a certain day. If you ask most people, what would you say the primary cause of why people will have a heart attack or stroke. Many people will say, well, because they smoke cigarettes or because of high cholesterol or because of stress or because of obesity. And all of those things are contributing factors. But ladies and gentlemen, more heart attacks take place in this country 
on Monday morning between 8 and 9 a.m. That's when the majority of people who have their first heart attacks have them. 85% of the American public, according to recent studies, are going to jobs that they hate, working on jobs that do not challenge them. They get sick thinking about going. <laughs> Migraine headaches. After the Sunday afternoon football game, or 60 minutes, the anxiety began to build. And come Monday morning, they drop dead of a broken heart. Some of you ought to think about not going to work on Monday. <laughs> think about that. People are literally dying to go to work. <laughs> Because, see, when you go to a job and, and you already know how far you can go, you can already see that proverbial glass ceiling. It's like going to a movie when you've gone in in the middle of the movie and you've seen the end and, and you sit there to, for it to start all over again, but something is missing. You know what the outcome is going to be. You can't get excited about going through that movie all over again. Am I correct? See, when you're going someplace and you already know how much you're going to make, you already know how far you can go, you're in a dead-end position. It erodes your self-esteem. It lowers your sense of yourself. It creates an inner turmoil. It creates an emptiness in you. So I say that your life is worth finding what it is that you're supposed to do. And I'm not saying quit your job, I'm saying find it and do just a little bit of it. When I wanted to become involved in speaking, I started just learning quotes, listening to other people's tapes, going to seminars, going to workshops, asking other people to help me. Just start working at it just a little bit, but do find out what your work is and hold on to it and don't let your dream go. Don't let it go. See, and here's a, something else I want you to begin to look at. Why is it that most people don't pursue their dreams or don't do better than what they're doing if they're capable of doing it? I think that many of us don't go the next step because we don't know what to do yet. <laughs> and I say that, that the reason that we don't even explore the possibility of what to do is because subconsciously we don't believe that it can happen for us and we don't believe that we deserve it. So here's what I'm suggesting. How much time do you spend working on you? How much time do you spend every day working on your dream? In the last 90 days, how many books have you read? In the last year, what new skill or knowledge have you acquired? What kind of investment have you made in you? So I'm saying that as you begin to look at where you want to go, if you want to make it today and things are changing so fast you have to literally run to stand still, I'm saying that you've got to make some conscious effort to begin to work to develop you. Here's something else. Most people are not living their dreams because of fear, ladies and gentlemen. I was in Columbus, Ohio yesterday speaking for a particular Ohio department. A young lady named Karen who greeted me, who organized the event. Very talented, very skillful. And she was talking about she wanted to become involved in the consulting business. I said, why aren't you doing it? I said, you have the abilities. I said, you're not here because they like you. You're here because you're doing the job. You're making things happen. And she came up with all kinds of ideas, but finally she said, I guess I, I can't see myself doing it. I guess I'm afraid. Fear, limited vision, and lack of self-esteem is what keep most people doing things they don't want to do. I was, flew from Columbus, Ohio to Denver, Colorado to a major communications company, and the person that picked me up at the airport told me about the fact that the company was planning on having a major downsizing, 
And they offered some of the employees there an early retirement, and some of them will earn as much as $300,000. And they said, this is the last time that you can take this offer. If you don't do it, when we have the downsizing, you might be among those who will lose their jobs, and all you will get is your severance pay. And only 50% of the people who were eligible to take the $300,000 took it. The others were afraid to take a chance on themselves. The others couldn't see themselves beyond that company. They couldn't see life after that company. The same reason that people stay in relationships where they're abused or they're unhappy or it's unfulfilling. They can't see themselves beyond that relationship. They can't see themselves enjoying life without that person. They think that this is all that they can do. The same reason that people get stuck at a certain level in life. They can't see things being better for them. And they think that this is it and this is all they deserve. This is all they've ever seen. It's been passed on to them. And they think that this is it for them. Oh, no. I was looking what Dr. Blanton, Smiley Blanton, who is a colleague of Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, what he said about fear. He said, fear is the most subtle and destructive of all human diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, fear kills dreams. Fear kills hope. Fear put people in the hospital. Fear can aid you. Fear, ladies and gentlemen, can hold you back from doing something that you know within yourself that you are capable of doing, but it will paralyze you. And it seemed like you're in a hypnotic spell. And I ask you a question, what is the benefit? What's the benefit of allowing fear to hold you back? What's the benefit of giving up on yourself, of not stepping out on life and taking life on? What is the benefit for you? What's the plus in that? It's one of the things I had to ask myself. So I didn't want to make any mistakes. I wanted everybody to like me. I wanted to be perfect the first time I did something. It's not going to happen. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to hurt some folks' feelings. You're going to create some enemies whenever you decide that you want to begin to take life on. You've got to ask yourself, how long am I going to allow this to hold me back? I like what Zig Ziglar says. He said, fear is false evidence appearing real. That is an illusion that we create in our mind. It is a state of mind that can be changed. So let's look at how we can begin to take some steps to restructure that fear, to begin to expand our visions of ourselves, to begin to increase our self-esteem. Webster said that self-esteem means confidence and satisfaction in oneself. Look at your life right now. Whatever you've done up to this point in time, your life is working. Whatever you have produced, it came out of you as a result of the kind of person that you have become. It's a result of your choices. It's a result of your consciousness. Now you have to ask yourself, are you satisfied with what you have produced? Is this what you want? Would you like for things to be better than this? Do you believe that you deserve better than this? Or are you content? This is it. You don't have to do every, anything else. That you've already resigned yourself in life and say, well, I'm happy. I'm not starving like the people in Calcutta. Are you allowing yourself to get off the hook like that? Or do you believe somewhere in the back of your mind or in your heart that there is some other great work for you to do? There's something else that life has for you. And that's why you're here. How do we handle this fear factor? How do we increase our self-esteem? You have to begin to fortify yourself. How do we do that? I believe that you have to begin to consciously monitor your inner conversation and start talking to yourself. Start building yourself up. Sometimes the only good things you will hear about you are the things that you say to you. young lady that, that was in the audience this afternoon said to me, I told myself yesterday for the first time, I'm proud of me. And she said, I felt good about that. So I'm saying learn to be your own booster. Start building yourself up. Start encouraging yourself. Start saying, I can do this. I can make this happen. When I started thinking about becoming a speaker, I said, yes, I can do this. 
I can make this happen. When I start trying to convince myself I can be a businessman after flopping and failing and losing thousands of dollars and feeling stupid and dumb and having people take advantage of me because of what I didn't know. I had to talk to myself because people were saying to me that I was dumb. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I was saying, you're right, look at what I've done. I had to say, no, 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 Les. Hey, hey, come on, man, get yourself together. You can handle this. You just haven't figured it out yet. It's all right. This is your training period. This is the tuition you have to pay for what you don't know. You can do this. Other people have done it. It doesn't take an Einstein. Get you some people that can teach you some stuff that you don't know. Get you some people that have done it successfully and learn from them. Take some seminars, workshops, read some books on how to manage a business. Change the way you see yourself and begin to tend to the personal details. Understand that nobody's going to take care of your business better than you. And when I start changing that kind of mindset of beating myself up because of my mistakes and start looking at the possibility of my doing better, of my making the adjustment that would enable me to do what I want to do successfully, things begin to change. And I say, stop beating up on yourself. You do do it. I know you do it. I've done it. It's a natural inclination for us to put ourselves down. See, we are born negative, I think, in a negative consciousness because we live in a negative world. See, you don't have to teach children to lie. They'll lie automatically. <laughs> Did you wet in your pants? No, I did not. <laughs> well, what is that? I don't know. <laughs> you don't have to encourage kids to misbehave. They will do it by themselves. You don't have to encourage them to do the wrong thing. They would do it automatically. You have to correct their behavior. So I'm saying that we have to work through the challenges of life in learning how to begin to work to fortify ourselves. Repeat after me, please. I can live my dream. I can live my dream. I can find my purpose in life. I can find my purpose. And live my purpose. And live my purpose. I deserve more for myself. I deserve more for myself. I deserve more from life. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you deserve more from life too. <laughs> Here's some other things, ladies and gentlemen. Begin to guard your mind against negative programming. Like turn off the television. Don't watch the news. Don't watch it. I think that, that, that more people have a sense of hopelessness and anxiety about life. If you look at the news, you cannot feel good looking at the news. You'll be scared to death. You're scared to go to sleep. I mean, it turns your power down. You've got to be conscious of that. Don't pick up the newspaper and read it. No, no. I, just try this. Just experiment with yourself. Now, if your job depends upon you knowing certain things, let somebody tell you just about those things. But start filtering the stuff you allow to come in your mind. You know that song you used to have? I said, don't let nobody bring you no bad news. I tell my staff, look here, don't tell me any bad news while I'm on the road. Let me handle it tomorrow. I don't like anybody to tell me any bad news at night before I go to sleep. I can't do anything about it anyhow. Why let me go to sleep with that on my consciousness? No. No, and my, my staff, they know that. Say, so let it wait till tomorrow. And I have a period of time. Tell me bad news between 10 o'clock and 12 noon. <laughs> After I prayed and meditated and read my books, I'm fortified, I'm ready to handle it. I deal with them, then I'm out of there and I'm going on to something else. So you've got to guard the kinds of things that you put in your mind. See, if you don't program your mind, your mind will be programmed because human beings are goal-oriented. That's why we die of broken hearts early. That's why we're running through life to early graves. We're going through life, ladies and gentlemen. And I think that Henry David Thoreau said that most men live in quiet desperation. Most of us go through life running scared. Larry D'Angelo, who I think is going to be one of the greatest motivational speakers around today, told me a story, a true story of a friend of his that every day when he came home from school, when he would get to uh, a certain block in his neighborhood, there was a neighborhood dog that would chase him. And that dog would start after him barking. Boy, he would run, just running from that dog every day, every day. Finally, he just got tired of that dog chasing him every day. He said, this dog come around here today. I'm going to take a brick of something and bust him in the head. <laughs> so he was walking home that day, minding his own business. Sure enough, same area, there was that dog there. 
And the dog started barking. He started running. He saw a brick and he stopped and picked up the brick and turned around. And the dog got close to him. He realized the dog didn't have any teeth. <laughs> He said, he put the brick down and said, get on out of my way. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, all our lives, many of us go through life running from things that ain't got no teeth to do us any harm. <laughs> Haven't you been afraid to do something and then after you did it, you say, whoa, if i known it was this easy, I would have done it before. Haven't you ever had that experience? Raise your hand. Absolutely. So we had created this in our minds, false evidence appearing real. We made it real in our minds. That's why Churchill said there's nothing to fear but fear itself. That's the destructive monster. So turn off things that can contribute to your fear. Turn a deaf ear to people that all they can do is talk about how negative things are because they have bought into the consciousness of the world. Start attending workshops, seminars, listening to tapes on a daily basis to begin to recondition your mind, to retrain your thinking. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing and hearing. Listen to things that can empower you, that can enable you to create a new reality for yourself in a new life for yourself. You might appear to be strange around most people. You know, most people think you're strange if you're happy today. People say, how you doing? I said, better than good. Whoa, what's wrong with him? <laughs> Just go around smiling and watch people. Look at this, is this a weird guy over here? Because most people don't smile. Watch him, look at their faces in the morning. Here we go, another Monday morning. How you doing? Haven't had my coffee yet, don't ask me. See, these people have not found their purpose in life. That's why they're grumpy. That's why they're miserable. That's why they're so negative. They're hurting and they want to hurt other people. So start practicing using programs for your mind. Seminars, books, workshops. Keep a journal. Record your thoughts. What's happening with you? Every day when you get up, have a journal near you. I use a Jack Boland journal so that I can write down my ideas. I keep it by my bed. So I can write down my thoughts. See, ladies and gentlemen, we get three to four thoughts a year that if we would act on those thoughts, they could change our life. Don't say, well, I'll, I'll remember that. No, write that thought down. I got a thought today I wrote down. A friend of mine is in the hospital. His morale is low. They're talking about amputating his foot. He's got to feel very bad. So I said, you know, I'm going to... I'm not only am I going to see him, but I can't be there with him all the time. I said, I'm going to create a tape for him that, that he can listen to that will heighten his level of morale. We told him the other night, don't go to surgery. You are depressed. Your energy level is down. No, no, tell him not now. Don't do it now. In fact, most doctors who have any sense of awareness don't perform surgery on patients that are in a state of fear. They don't think they will make it. They wait till they're in a different state of mind. So I said, what about making tapes for people that are facing physical challenges? I said, that's a good idea. All right? <laughs> See, there are ideas that can come to you out of things that appear to be negative. I have a friend out of Chicago, just met him. He was 23 years old. And this guy, he went financially bankrupt two years ago, ruined his credit. Guess what he decided to do? He found a blessing in it. He wanted to restore his credit. It was very challenging, very difficult. And he realized that a lot of other people during these particular times have ruined their credit. So now he started a credit repair business. Last year he earned over $100,000 helping people to restore their credit. I met a young lady who attends this church that she was at her father's funeral and, and she was putting flowers on her father's grave and she looked around and saw the other grave sites they did not look well groomed and they were not attended to on a regular basis. She started a grave site maintenance business. Out of that tragedy, something positive has come out of it. And now she's earning more money doing that than on her present job. What idea are you sitting on? Write your ideas down. And then, once you get that idea, take the leap. Hello? Take the leap. 
See, a lot of people get the ideas and just walk around with them. Have you ever had an idea and all of a sudden you looked around and somebody had that idea and gone with it? Think you're going to be going with my hospital idea. Forget that, buddy. We will be out there together, Jack. <laughs> take the leap. See, it's out here in the universe. If you don't take the plunge, I guarantee you, somebody else will. Take the plunge. Go into action. And ladies and gentlemen, you will be surprised at how things will come together. You'll be surprised. Now, you're going to have some difficult challenges. I can tell you that now. Be aware of that. Things are not going to work out exactly right. For a time, they will, sometimes. And that's when life is just playing a game with you. I want you to feel good and relax. And then after a while, say, okay, the honeymoon's over now. And then life will come over there and slap you side to here. Say, what you doing out here? Well, this is my dream life. Is that right? Come over here a minute. <laughs> oh, you went to the seminar, huh? Come here. <laughs> I can tell you that. But ladies and gentlemen, go into action with your dream. And don't avoid where the fights are. Get in the midst of the fight. And get some hickeys on your head. Get knocked down so you can learn how to fight, so you can hold your position. See, most people don't get out in the arena of life because they don't want to fight. Most people don't get out there because they don't want to get knocked down. They don't want to be dropped to their knees. But see, you're going to be dropped whether you're on the field or whether or not you're sitting on the sidelines. You're going to be dropped. So at least get dropped for something. Don't get knocked down while you're sitting down. See, that's how most people are spectators in life. You don't want to be a spectator. You want to get out in the field where the action is. And you will be amazed. After the struggle, there will be a calm period and things will begin to click for you. Come out here with what you got. You don't have enough money? Don't worry about it. You got the dream. You got the idea. You don't have enough resources? Don't worry about it. You need some help? Don't worry about it. You get out here in the arena, someone will look at you and become inspired and say, hey, can I help you? But if you're sitting up on the bleachers, nobody's going to ask you anything. You've got to get into the flow of action. Frances Hart called me from Chicago. She had been sitting on an idea of a show that she wanted to produce for 10 years called Mind Body Connection. So someone saw me speaking in Chicago at a sorority convention and said, I saw a guy that perhaps can host this show for you who has energy and charisma. She called me. She was so fired up. I said, listen, on the day that you want to do that, I'm speaking in Chicago. I can do it for you. And I said, by the way, I met somebody two weeks ago in Baltimore who has an idea of the same type of show and she's doing it on radio. Why don't you call her? And then she called me back. Who else would you suggest? I said, well, I know Deepak Chopra. He wrote the book called Quantum Healing and Bernie Siegel. Could you get his number? I tell you what, I have a friend named Jack Bolin at the Church of the Day. He knows how to get in touch with him. Call him and he will give you the number so you can get in touch with Bernie Siegel. That lady started calling all around, did not have the resources, but she had this idea and dream. And she said the other night when she came before the audience that had gathered in the studio, she said, I feel like I've been pregnant for 10 years. <laughs> and tonight you're going to witness a beautiful delivery. <laughs> and it was. She said, I couldn't believe less how things began to happen, how it all began to come together. And how many of you ever started on some dream and you didn't have all your stuff together, but you just went out there with nothing but faith and things begin to happen for you. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, those hands up there, it's, it's proof. The proof is in the pudding. These people have demonstrated it. And if they can do it, you can do it. You can do it. Experience the pain. Experience the rejection. Experience the hard times. That's how you grow. That's how you develop yourself. That's how you begin to appreciate what you get. 
When you're working on a dream, at some point in time, a transition takes place. And the transition is, is what you are becoming in pursuit of the dream. Because even if you don't get the dream, you become such a strong and powerful person, it will so change your life, you can look at something else and say, well, I think I'll go do this then. Because you have now developed yourself in such confidence and such competence in how to deal in the arena of life that you can move into another area and not miss a beat. Once you begin to discover who you are, then you really realize how you have been given authority and dominion over everything on the face of the earth, including all the dimensions of your life. But you can only do that through the struggle of life. And most people avoid the struggle. Most people go through life avoiding pain. And when you go through life like that, something in you dies. Something in you that you never activate is lying dormant in there. That you never get a chance to call on because you have not challenged yourself. Somebody said, the land of familiarity belongs to the dead. That most people like to feel like they're a king in the area of their comfort zone. They only want to do those things that they know how to do well. Osborne said, unless you attempt to do something beyond that which you've already mastered, you will never grow. So if you want to begin to grow, you've got to put something out here that you can't reach easily, that has got to make you stretch, got to make you jump for it, got to make you get back a little bit and dig in so that you can take a leap for it. And maybe you jump up there and you miss it and you skin your knees and you come back again and you bust your lip next time. But you keep on and through that process, you learn how to leap higher. You start challenging yourself to dig deeper and then you discover some things about you that you don't know right now, some talents that you have in you that you didn't know that you can do. I started out just talking to kids. And now I'm speaking at corporations. Now I'm traveling. I didn't know I can do this, but had I not given myself a chance, and I'm saying to you, give yourself a chance. Here's something else. If you want to begin to make your stuff happen for you, I think that it's very important that you start trusting yourself. Listen to yourself. Listen to that still, small voice within you. Don't try and make everything logical. There are some things about life that defies logic, that you just can't explain how the outcome is going to be. I think that's why Paul said you've got to learn how to walk by faith and not by sight. That once you begin to trust yourself and your ideas and your instincts, life takes on a whole new meaning because now I want you to do that feeling that you are led. Just feel, I am led. I remember the worst speech I had ever given in my life. I let someone exploit a fear that I had. For years I had a tremendous inferiority complex because I'm not college educated. And this person knew this. And she said, let me write this speech for you. You're going to speak at Ohio State University. Those people are very educated there. And they're going to know when you make grammatical errors, and they're going to know because of the substance of your speech that you are not literate. I, I care about you, and I don't want you to embarrass yourself. So this person proceeded to write a speech for me. I had a speech in my mind, but this person was stronger than I was negatively than I was positive about my own thoughts. And I gave my power away. With my permission, I allowed this person to guide me to do something that I really didn't want to do. But I didn't feel enough inner strength and conviction about my skills as a speaker and the message that I had to bring to stick by my guns. And I got up there at the Ohio Union and I read this straight speech and did not move and did not take my eyes off the page because I'm not accustomed to reading. And after I finished, some people gave me a standing ovation because I read it extremely well and I was very tense and I was very nervous. <laughs> but Boo was with me and we've been together since second grade. And I didn't want to go on the side of the room where he was. I saw the look in his eyes. And another friend of mine by the name of Mike Williams, and I knew what they were going to say. And they had the look on their face like, what happened to you? And so I didn't go over there. I went over here where I could get some compliments. <laughs> and these people were saying, you were very good. Oh, thank you very much. I wanted to be fortified before I got this whipping. 
So finally we were going to the car and we got in the car and Boo was trying to be as tactful as he could. And then he just said, that was the worst speech you have ever given. I said, oh Boo, I know, I know. Why did you read the speech? What happened to your spontaneity? You've always been an extemporaneous speaker. Les, why did you do that when she told me that they wouldn't accept what I said? Les, let them take you as you are. I gave my power away. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, don't give your power away. You don't need anybody to approve your dream. It was given to you. If they can't see it, it's because it wasn't given to them. It was given to you. Hold it, nourish it, cultivate it, work on it. It's yours. It's your baby. Work on it until it comes into fruition. I gave away my power and I said, I'm not going to do that no more. If you've ever given away your power, repeat after me, please. I'm not going to do that no more. <laughs> Is that something good to say? Uh-uh, no, 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 all right? Here's something else for those who make it today. Do what you know is right. Treat people like you want to be treated. Don't try and take any shortcuts. Don't try and cheat. Pay your dues up front. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, what goes around comes around. You can pay now or you will pay double later. So, do the right thing. There might be a tendency sometimes, because of the negative part of our consciousness and our own programming, for us to want to say, well, I just do it this time. It won't matter, won't nobody know. Ladies and gentlemen, everything matters. And you know you're somebody. You know. i rather lose out on my dream, doing the right thing, than the cheat, trying to make a shortcut to get to my goal. I want to be able to look myself in the mirror. And that's what you want to do. There's no saying, judge a man not by what he does, but by that that he doesn't have to do. And to judge the true quality of a man is what do you do when nobody's looking. See, there's some good out there for you in the universe that has your name on it. And nobody can get your good. It has your name on it. They can't take your stuff. It's your stuff. So when you know that, when you know that whatever you're seeking, it's also seeking you, you don't worry. You don't run scared. You don't think somebody's going to take it from you. You listen to your inner voice and you always take the high road. There will be the tendency, the natural inclination to take the low road. You must resist that. Repeat after me, please. I will always take the high road. I will always take the high road. And do the right thing. And do the right thing. No matter what. No matter what. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, do the right thing. <laughs> Here's something else I encourage you to do if you want to make it today. Keep your agreements. Keep your agreements that you make and establish a network of people who will also do that. Establish a network of people in your life that you can count on, that will be there for you when you need them and you be there for them. And test them sometimes. Find out how many flaky people you've got in your life. <laughs> Ask them to meet you someplace and say, this is very important for me. Will you be there for me? I need you. And whoever shows up, write their name down. <laughs> Those that don't show up, draw a line through their name. And when they call you, make sure you're not available for them. Are you busy? No. I just choose not to deal with you in this way. Get all the flaky people out of your life. I asked a friend of mine today about a mutual friend. I said, have you talked to him? She said, no. I said, why? He's so negative. I had to cut him out of my life. I couldn't risk having him in my life. In my office, I have a lot of fruit. 
and I had a basket of apples on the table and I had a plum that had spoiled. When I picked the plum up off this granny apple, it left a brown spot. You ever heard said one spoiled apple will spoil a whole barrel? One negative person can spoil your whole life. Leave the flakes alone, people that are seriously not serious. And if you're surrounded by flakes, that tells you who you are. <laughs> because like attracts like. Hello? I know you don't like that. I bet you won't applaud that one. <laughs> you applaud for them, huh? <laughs> Here's the other thing is you're working on your dream. A lot of people have been calling me saying, hey, man, I read about you in Ebony. Boy, you're lucky. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. Here's something else. Three Ps to have in your life. In working on your dream and doing your life work, you must be patient, persistent, and positive no matter what. I called John H. Johnson for two and a half years to get in that magazine. The first time I called him, he wouldn't talk to me. Then I was persistent, trying to find out who knew him that could invite me there to meet him or an opportunity to speak so that he could hear me. And I met a guy who worked for him. And I said, hey, I'd like to speak to you guys free. I just want to know, will he be in the audience? They said, yes, good. I spoke and I tried to tear the microphone up. <laughs> and he said after I finished, hey, young man, you're quite impressive. I'm going to have my staff do an article on you. I said, thank you, Mr. Johnson. And I sent him information on me, Federal Express. <laughs> and it didn't happen. Waited for a month and it didn't happen. Waited for two months. It didn't happen. I stopped calling. Every month. Hello, how are you, man? Speak to Mr. Johnson. I'm sorry he's not available. Tell him Les Brown calling. I just want to say thank you very much for the article when he puts it in. I kept on doing it, kept on calling, kept on calling, sending new articles, sending new information on me, kept on upgrading the information on me, sending him thank you letters, thank you Mr. Johnson. I was always positive. I could have gotten negative saying, where did you lie to me? Why are you going to tell me you're going to put me in the magazine and you didn't do it? I could have got an attitude, be positive no matter what, because when you are negative, ladies and gentlemen, you're sending out negative energy and you're blocking your good. So don't send out any negative energy. Don't take it personal. I didn't care what he thought of me or the staff that I was a nuisance to them. They get paid to deal with people like me. I wanted to be in that magazine. They got a subscription of 1.7 million people. Ask me, do I care what they think about me? Any sensible, reasonable, intelligent person knows if somebody doesn't call you back after two and a half years, they don't want to talk to you. <laughs> Ask me, do I care about that? Results don't lie. I'm in the magazine. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> See, a lot of people have an idea or a dream and they give up on it. No, no, don't do that. Work your dream until it get hot. See, most things don't happen as soon as we think they should happen. The messenger of misery might drop in on you and say hello. <laughs> Murphy's Law might come by and thump you on the head. <laughs> Any number of things can happen to interrupt your flow. It's okay. Don't take it personal. Just acknowledge what's going on. It's called life and keep on working on your dream. Continue to keep on knocking, keep on knocking, because this is your life. This is what you love. This is your passion. Step back. Don't judge it. If you judge it, judge not yet, unless ye be judged. Why? Because when you judge it, you invest emotion in it, and that mo emotion could be anger, and guess what? That hurts you. That doesn't hurt anybody else. One doctor said, the man who angers me killeth me. And then he allowed someone to egg him into an argument on the floor of the National Medical Convention and suffered a massive heart attack. When you're in a state of anger, you have so much acid in your blood, if they withdrew some blood from you and inserted it into a pig, it would die from the acid. So what do you want to take yourself out early for by internalizing things? Shakespeare said, nothing is neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. So judge not according to appearances, but write judgment and feel that everything is going to work out for you because you're patient, you're persistent, and you're going to be positive 
no matter what. Don't allow other things or people or circumstances to determine what your reaction is going to be. I was out to dinner with some people and we had a waitress that was quite discourteous and rude. And the people around me took a, an attitude about it. I learned how to observe life. I think that in order to overcome life, you've got to learn how to observe it. Just stand back and watch what's going on and choose not to buy into it. I said, excuse me, ma'am. I said, do you know what TIP stands for? <laughs> she said, no. I said, TIP stands for to ensure promptness. We've been sitting here a long time. I want to give you $5 up front to ensure a prompt meal. Would you assist me? She gave me the biggest smile and said, oh, of course I will. <laughs> And I said, by the way, I'm not with these people. I'm going to be sitting at another table. Please put my meal over there. Serve them by themselves. <laughs> See, I don't want to make anybody angry who goes behind closed doors to prepare my food. <laughs> oh, no. I got my food. If I told them, I said, if I were you, I would eat that. <laughs> Where's the manager? I want to see him. She said, I'll get him just a minute. I know what she did to their food. <laughs> oh, no. I said, eat that at your own risk. I don't even want y'all driving me home. I'll get your cab. No, no, no. I don't know when that's going to take effect on you. <laughs> so don't allow people to determine how you are going to respond to them or circumstances. Learn to look at it. A friend of mine, Tom Perkins, handsome, articulate man in his mid-50s. He had a tremendous business, and at the height of his success, someone was killed in his business. He was sued and lost $750,000. Lost his business, lost his family, lost his home, everything. He was devastated, ladies and gentlemen. He started living in his car. He would wash up in a McDonald's across from Howard University on Georgia Avenue in Washington, D.C. He said, Les, I was so depressed. He said, I had everything, and then one day I lost it all. He said, I didn't want to live anymore. He got some sleeping pills, and he took over 35 sleeping pills, and he laid down, folded his hands across his chest, and he said he went to sleep to die. Two days later, much to his amazement, he woke up. <laughs> He couldn't even get that right. I said, what happened then, Tom? He said, an incredible thing happened. He said, he was laying there for a moment. He said, and a voice said to him inside his mind, it wasn't your life to take. That was one thing. He said, since that day, when I get any major challenges, I don't take it on myself personally. I feel that I've got somebody with me. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, hey, I said, God, you got to handle this for me. This is too much for me. He said, I don't sweat the challenges of life. Repeat after me, please. Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. Because it's all small stuff. <laughs> <laughs> See, whatever you're worried about, if someone called call you right now and say, listen, you got two days to live, I'm telling you, you won't be worried about your bills, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you won't be worried about whether or not somebody loves you or cheating on you <laughs> because you're about to check out. <laughs> okay? So put things in perspective. Here's something else Tommy said that I think is important. He said that the voice also said to him, if you change your ways, I'll give you far more than you ever lost. Look at your life right now. If you want to keep on getting what you're getting, keep on doing what you're doing. You've got to be willing to change your ways. Your life is working. If you don't like what you have produced, you are director, you are the star, you wrote this script. You produce this, whatever it is. If it's a hit, you produced it. If it's a flop, you produced it. Take ownership of it and decide to go back to the drawing board and rewrite the script that you are the star of. You have the power to do that. On this day, you can declare 
that I'm going to change. As you look back on your life, you can decide that I don't like what I produced here and I want higher ground. I want to begin to experience more love. I want to have more adventure in my life. I want something that gives my life a sense of meaning. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been selected to head up a program called Project Life in Chicago, training thousands of kids. And I had the experience, This we had our second session this past Monday. And to see these young people when they came in, and to see the young people and the parents and the community volunteers when they went out, one young man from the Cabrini Green Housing Projects who didn't want to be there, who came up and said, I want you to know I'm so glad to be here. And he said, I'll never be the same again. He said, thank you, Mr. Brown. He said, I just got to go now, but thank you, sir. I'll never be the same again. To see a letter I got from a young man who was in the Cook County Jail where I work on Monday morning. And this young man will not be out of jail for at least 50 years. At least 50 years. They gave him 100 years. This guy has shot at least 60 people that we know of and killed 10 at least. And this letter he wrote, he said, since listening to your tapes, he said, I have not changed, but I feel a different person in me. Over 70% of these young men are in there for murder. We wanted to have a two-prone attack where we would train people on the outside and train those that are in the jails because I believe if you cage them like animals and treat them like animals and they're out on the streets every 22 months, they're going to get out and act like animals and go back in like animals. So we said, let's take an approach. This gives me my life. This, now this might be insane. But I felt so good, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, if we can accept the possibility of that this is the decade of consciousness. That's what I believe that this is. The decade of consciousness, if you please. A time where we can begin to create in folks' minds the idea, the possibility that we can create a more humane society, the possibility that we can create more love, communication, and understanding in relationships, the possibility that we can create a drug-free America, the possibility that we can create the kind of respect for diversity and difference in our multicultural society, the possibility that we can begin to develop the mindset to bring out the best in people, to encourage them to achieve their greatness and support them in their dreams, that if we can, in this decade of consciousness, to begin to see and envision that happening and that we all can play a role, that we were born for such a time as this, that we showed up for this, that we survived one out of nine million sperms and we have been chosen for this great work. What an exciting time to be alive. Here's something else to recognize. Wherever you are on the ladder of life, and I was reading in Dr. Norman Vincent Peale's latest book called The Power of Positive Living, which I think is his greatest work. And he has something in there, a section called Comeback Power. Wherever you are in life, ladies and gentlemen, you've got comeback power. I don't care how low you are. I don't care what you have done. I don't care what you have experienced. I don't care how devastated your life might appear to be. The shambles it might be in. There's a power in you that can enable you to be stronger and better than anything that's out here. One man who came to the training, he was not a kid. And I knew he had a drinking problem and he was looking at me and I can smell alcohol on him. I said, excuse me, come here, come here, come here. He said, what is it? I said, let me tell you something. I want you to know you've got something in you that's stronger than that poison you're putting in your body. Do you understand me? And he was looking, he was backing up. He said, he said, no. Uh, uh, no, no. He said, I, I, I don't know, man. I said, it is. I said, that's why you're here. Something drew you here. And that which caused you to come, you said you want some help. And you need to be around some people that can help you get in touch with your power because you know that your life deserves this. See, I think that the reason that we abuse ourselves with drugs and alcohol is that we're trying to numb something in us 
that's, that's aching us, that's, that's urging us, that's nagging us to do something bigger and better. It can't be because it tastes so good. It can't be because crack feels so good or cocaine is not that simple. But when we are deluding ourselves or polluting our minds, it numbs us where we don't have to face reality. Because we don't know what we've got going for us. See, once you discover who you are, the truth of knowing who you are will set you free from ever wanting alcohol, from ever wanting any kind of drug that's going to destroy who you are. Once you begin to know who you are, it will set you free from believing, I can't see myself doing any better. Once you discover this power, this, the perfect essence of who you are that's in all of us, that's permeating our being, that enable us to be the directors of our lives, that you truly can live a healthy, happy, prosperous life, and that you can make it in what are called the worst of times. I think it was Robert Shuley said, tough times never last, but tough people do, and you are tough. You're made of some special stuff. There was nobody here before you. You brought something here that was not here before you showed up. Guess what? Nobody's going to do your work for you. Nobody's going to write your book for you. Nobody's going to open your boutique. That has been given to you to do. Nobody can help those people you want to help. They will only respond to your voice. You were sent here to speak a word that will wake them up. As sure as the word was spoken 2,000 years ago, Lazarus, come forth! You will speak that word and ignite and bring to life many who have entombed themselves in fear and mediocrity and a limited vision and low self-esteem. So as you leave, I hope that you challenge yourself to begin to look within, knowing that you have comeback power, knowing that you came and brought something here that was not here before you came. And whatever that dream is, whatever that great work is, don't let anybody take it from you. Fight for it. I like Mark Hughes of Herbalife. When the FDA attacked them like they did to Cambridge, they died. Repeat after me, please. When you're hot, you're hot. And when you're not, you're not. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, I'm hot this evening. Look out. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Y'all out there fanning like y'all about to get happy or something. Look out. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to see you. Now, let me tell you what this is symbolic. We set it up just this way. The reason that we are here this evening to talk about Joe versus the volcano. And so what I wanted you to do was to really experience this. <laughs> now, what is it when you're near a volcano that's, that's boiling over and about to explode? What is it that you feel that lets you know you are in the area of a volcano? What is it you feel? Oh, I know, I know. You feel heat, right? So you're going to experience this volcano because we have things in our lives, ladies and gentlemen. And because we don't handle them, because we don't deal with those things, they begin to get kind of hot. You know, you, you've heard the expression, boy, I'm in hot water. <laughs> have you ever heard that before? And that means that there's something that you're in, that some dilemma that you've got to handle, something that you've got to deal with. So let's begin to look at this guy called Joe versus the volcano, and let's see what's in it for us. I took the liberty of changing some things to enable them to be symbolic for us. And Tom Hanks plays this role, and for those of you that have not seen the movie, it's about a guy who was going to work every day. It was very depressing. I mean, when you see it, I mean, the photography is very dingy looking and gray and very dim lighting and, and the people are going and looking drab, doing the same old thing every day in the same old way. Some of you work with people like that. There are faces that you wish you never ever saw. Am I right? I mean, if you never saw them again, it would be too soon. I am I right? I'm going right, all right? So this is what was going on. This guy was going into this job where it was a dead end job. He wasn't happy. He was miserable. And many of us can identify with that. 
He knew that he was capable of doing more, but he had really given up on himself. He had really sold himself out. Yeah, some of us have done that. He made a trade-off. For whatever reason, he decided to do this. That's why we can identify with him. And the volcano is symbolic of the challenges that we invariably face in life, of the problems that many of us run away from handling. And he had to handle this. And how did he come in contact with this volcano? Well, what happened was he was going to this doctor constantly. He's a hypochondriac because he wasn't living his purpose. His dream had not found his life work. He would create illnesses for himself. And so what happened in the process, this doctor decided, he set him up really. See, when you're not living your goal, you go through life living like a victim. And people can set you up for anything. They can run any kind of game on you and you go for it. I had a saying when I was in radio, stand up for what you believe in because you can fall for anything. <laughs> well, Joe didn't believe in very much, including himself and his dreams, see? So he was very vulnerable. And so Joe was set up by this doctor. This doctor told him that he had a rare disease and he had six months to live. This disease was called a brain cloud. <laughs> oh, Kadumbo Joe went for it. <laughs> he believed it. But you know something? It changed his life. It changed his life. And so he was told, look here, you, you, don't, you don't have long to live anyhow. The guy said, why don't you do this? I'm going to give you all my credit cards, and this way you can live like a king, and there's something I want you to do. There was a catch. There's a volcano on an island that's about to erupt, and, and unless somebody jumps in that volcano, sacrifice their life, these people on this island will perish. Well, your life isn't worth much, and you don't have that long anyhow. <laughs> So why don't you take my credit cards, all my credit cards, American Express, Master Charge, all of them, take all of them, go live like a king and die like a man. And Joe said, okay. What did he have to lose? He was going to die anyhow. And his life didn't have any meaning and value to him as it was. So this was no big sacrifice on Joe's behalf. Now that says something about us, people, human beings that when you have not structured your life so that it can have some meaning and value for you, that you'll be willing to throw your life away into anything. See, the volcano could be alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be a job that does not meet who you are. That you go through life, you're doing it so long, you, you're operating in this and you're acting out that role of mediocrity for so long, you think it's you. It could be a relationship that's no longer giving you what you want and creating dis-ease in your body. It could be any kind of circumstance, like in his work environment. It was toxic. It wasn't good for him. But he didn't have the guts to do anything about it, to act on it. So therefore, it was making him miserable. And as a result, he couldn't see the beauty of life. In fact, in the movie, see, they had in the concrete, there was a, a daisy growing up through the concrete. But people were so caught up in the depression and the gloominess of life, they couldn't even see the daisy when somebody just stepped on it one day. They couldn't see the beauty in life. See, that's what can happen to you in life, that you can get so caught up in the misery of it and the pain and the sickness and the depression and playing a victim and blaming everybody and everything rather than taking responsibility. It will blind you from seeing the stuff out there that's really beautiful. That's what Henry David Thoreau meant when he said that most people go through life in quiet desperation and miserable. I have friends been married for years, live in two different rooms. Why would you live like that? I mean, miserable, don't even talk to each other, grumble. I think that was supposed to mean good morning. <laughs> miserable, just making each other miserable. Every, why live like that? People go to work like that. I said, why even show? I used to work with a guy like that. You couldn't say good morning to him before 9 o'clock. He'd look around and say, does he know me? Anybody know me know you don't talk to me before 9 o'clock. I don't play that, all right? I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the people like, how many ever work with people that are just grumps? Raise your hand. Just grump. Miserable. Why show up? Come in complaining every day. The best day on the job is when they're absent. <laughs> Am I right? So this is where Joe was. So this doctor told Joe, hey, man, you're going to die with this brain cloud. And you know something? All of Joe's other illnesses left. <laughs> Joe decided to live. 
Joe decided to live his life. Now that is interesting. A psychiatrist did a study and he was talking about how his patients reacted when they got information that they were going to die immediately. He said that many of these patients that had gone through years of therapy that should have been making decisions about their careers, or about their marriage, or about their circumstances, and somehow or another they were stuck and didn't have the personal power, or the wherewithal, or the willpower to act in their own best interest. But when they were told, listen, you've got three months to live, or you've got six months to live, all of a sudden these people who were initially victims or powerless, all of a sudden they started acting in their own best interest. They started living their lives. And it's amazing to me that, that what a paradox, that once people are told they're going to die, all of a sudden they start seeing the daisies in life. They start seeing the beauty in life. I remember, it's a monologue. And it's called The Last Mile. It's a, it's a monologue about a guy who was sentenced to die in the electric chair for a crime that he did not commit. And he was pleading to the jury to understand his case. And I remember one of the parts of the monologue where this guy talking to the jury and talking to himself and going the whole gamut of emotion. And I remember something he said that struck me right now. He said, you know, he said, it's queer, ain't it? How, even though life has done you wrong, somehow you still want to live. He said, you never again find me complaining about life, about life has given me a, a short deal. No, I, I, I just want to live. I take the park benches, the crumbs, I, anything. I just, I just want to live. But they're not going to let me, are they? All of a sudden, this guy who before from Sloat's Corner, Indiana, never really cared about life. All of a sudden, now that he knew that his life was going to be taken away for a crime that he did not commit, he wanted to live. It was, it's a very passionate, powerful monologue. I used to read that quite often and study that. So what is it that we can begin to do? Do we have to get a pronouncement that we only have six months to live in order to decide to live? in order to live in a spirit of integrity? See, most of us go through life living a lie. The Platters had a song. Oh yes, I'm the great pretender. What a beautiful voice. Oh, don't faint, it's okay, it's all right. It's all right. Whew. Now I hit that note, it just gives me a chill. But anyhow, <laughs> that many of us go through life being great pretenders. We should get an Academy Award. Pretending that we're happy, pretending that we're content, pretending that everything's happy and gay and carried away. And that's not the way that it is. Going through life feeling that we can't do anything about our situation like Joe did. But when they told Joe he was going to die, Joe became a new person, went back to work, and the young lady he'd been wanting to talk to for a long time, he said, hey, I want to take you out. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't worried about rejection. Joe had his eyes on her. He said, Lord is my shepherd, I'll see what I want. <laughs> Old Joe said, I might be going, but I ain't dead yet. <laughs> he wanted a little bit more living. You hear me? I like that, Joe. Don't lose that. Don't lose that. All right, so, so here's what I think that we can begin to do. To live our dreams. To begin to let life take on some new meaning for us, some new power and some new value is to begin to look for the daisies in your life right now where you are. Regardless of what's happening to you, regardless of what's going on with you, begin to look for some beauty in it. Begin to look for some lessons that you can learn from where you are and what you're going through. See, the volcano. See, when Joe jumped into the volcano, and he eventually did that with a young lady that fell in love with him, they were thrown out of the volcano and they survived. Think about that. Now, see, I think that when you decide to take a leap and you handle the challenges that you're facing, read something about fear. That's one of the things that keeps us from beginning to live life. Here's what happened. Um, this guy John Rogers wrote, he said, when people take the courage to journey into the center of their fear, they find nothing. It is only many layers of fear being afraid of itself. And Eleanor Roosevelt said, you gain strength courage and confidence by every experience 
in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You're able to say to yourself, I've lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes alone. You must do the thing you cannot do. See, that's what the volcano is. It is the thing that we cannot do. And because it is that, we must do that. Once fear is acted upon, the death of fear is certain. So what volcano you have in your life? Let me ask you some questions here. If you had six months to live, what would you do differently with your life? What would you do differently? Would you have the same job? Would you be worried about things that you're worried about right now? Would you have the same relationships? Would you have the same people in your life? I was sitting on the house of the Ohio legislative floor. I had just been elected for the third time as a chairman of the Human Resource Committee, powerful, prestigious position, and I was reading a book on how to manage your time in your life, and it talked about what are your long-range goals two to three years from now, what are your short-range goals, six months goals, and then it said, if you had three months to live, what would you spend your time doing? So I wrote down, I would, I would spend my time, I wouldn't, one thing, I would resign from the legislature, I would go and back to Miami and I would buy my mother home something I'd promised myself that I was going to do and I had continued to procrastinate and put all kind of reasons why I couldn't do it and you know I wanted to make sure that she was financially secure my children would be financially secure and I would do lectures and I would go around talking to people and working with kids that's what I said I would do then it turned to the next page and it said for all you know you don't have three months to live you might die today so whatever you wrote on the last page, you want to spend as much of your time doing that today. So I looked at Mr. Vern Rice, the Speaker of the Ohio Legislature, and I said to the guy on my right, State Representative Mike Stenziano out of the Ohio State District, I said, Stenzi, 25 years from now, who would care what legislation we passed? He said, nobody would care one year from now. Now here's what was happening with me. I came to the Ohio legislature with great expectations. There are things I wanted to do. I wanted to make a change in society. I wanted to make an impact. But I was just disillusioned after being there for a while. I introduced some legislation that I'd worked months to get this legislation passed, got it out of subcommittee, voted to the major committee, and then went from there to the reference committee, and then they introduced it on the Ohio legislative floor and this legislation was designed to provide protection for senior citizens and poor people who bought money orders. People buy money orders thinking that it's cash. But what they did not know that there's no bond or insurance security in the event that the money order company files bankruptcy. And so this company filed bankruptcy and just left a lot of people just holding worthless paper. So I wanted to introduce some legislation so that senior citizens would not be victims of this anymore. After months of hard work, after introducing the bill and having the votes lined up, guy raised his hand, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Rife said yes. He said, I'd like to introduce the amendment for Mr. Brown's bill. He said, we will hear the amendment. He said, I'd like to amend it and change the word shall to may. I said, excuse me, Mr. Speaker, may I speak please? Yes. I said, ladies and gentlemen, of the Ohio legislature, this legislation is not something we wanted to make it optional to provide protection for Ohioans and senior citizens. We want to make it mandatory. And then this guy said, no, Mr. Speaker, I, I just think that he's taking it a little too far. This is an honorable gesture on the behalf of the state, but he's taking it too far. Let's make it optional and leave it up to the goodwill of these money order companies to provide for the protection. Let's have the vote. And they had the vote, and I lost. And I said, oh, wait, wait, this is not why I came here. And then all of a sudden, this job that at one point had meaning to me and value, it no longer had that for me. And all of us have had some experiences where you went to a job and you were excited about that job. Boy, it had so much promise, and then you got there, so much you wanted to do, you thought it was an opportunity for upward mobility and growth and development and expansion. And all of a sudden, after you got there, you found out it was nothing but a glorified cubby hole. Old grave with no dirt on it. 
So it, be it became very depressing going to work. And so that's what happened to this guy, Joe. And a lot of us have done that before. I used to get my headaches start throbbing on Sunday afternoon after the Sunday afternoon football game, a basketball game. I just hated to go to work. Some days I just drive by just for nothing, just drive on by. I came back though, I came back. Because I had bills, I came back, you know? <laughs> Many of us stay in relationships like that. I had a friend talking to, she said she was so miserable in her marriage that one day she went home, I said, when did you get your divorce number? She said, Les. She said, I went home, put the key in the door, and she said, I couldn't go in. She said, I was so depressed, had so much pain in my body. She said, I couldn't just walk in. She said, I dropped to my knees. She said, I had to crawl in. I had to crawl in the house because it, I just couldn't. She said, I knew then I had to get a divorce. <laughs> so, so that what happened to Joe. And Joe decided to act on that. So what can we do? Well, here's what we can do. Wherever you are, decide that, that you're going to focus your time. I lost my job in broadcasting, and it was a major blow to me because broadcasting was all that I had. That's all that I knew. And I'd been doing that for like 15 or 20 years, and that's, that was my specialty. But because I was so controversial and couldn't keep my mouth closed, I lost my job. You know, and so it was a depressing time for me and I could not find a job immediately. No one would hire me locally and because I was good and I would send off my audition tapes to other radio stations, program directors would hear it and they wouldn't bring me in. I was a seasoned veteran. So you have that experience. If you're real good, many people will perceive you as a threat and they won't hire you because they want somebody that they can control and they don't want anybody in there that's going to outshine them. See, sometimes being good can be a liability to you, am I right? Sometimes women have to scale down their ambitions and drive and what they can do in deference to men's egos. So what I did was, in the meantime, in the between time, I started focusing on my flowers. I got into flowers. See, they say when I was a kid, that an idle mind is a devil's workshop. You know, that's true. See, if you don't have anything on your mind, you know your mind can play all kinds of tricks on you, you know. See, when I wasn't busy, sometimes I wanted to call Bert Childs. I said, Bert, can I get my job back? <laughs> my mind was saying, well, if all you had to do, just keep your mouth shut. Now you unemployed. Run in your mouth. Wah, 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 wah. Why didn't you just shut up? They told you to shut up. Man told you you're going to get fired. No, you had to keep on talking. Oh, ego, 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 ego. Now you're unemployed. Won't nobody hire you, because your mouth too big, mouth too big. <laughs> Stop beating myself up. Why don't I shut up? Boy, you're right, you're right. You know, these boys, you ever talk to yourself? Raise your hand. You know what I'm talking about? You ever talk to yourself? <laughs> so I just kept busy. I started working on flowers. I got it really into flowers. I knew my flowers had names for my flowers. Grow real good. I talked to them. Hello, how are you today? Oh, you're beautiful. I want you to rise. People would bring their flowers over to me. They were, were dying and wilting. I would speak to them and say, rise. Those flowers straighten up like that. Uh. <laughs> That was phenomenal, all right? Then the other thing is, I did a lot of volunteer work. I'd go to the hospital and I'd read the Bible to people. And I would go to friends whose parents perhaps were ill or facing a challenge, and I'd talk to them. I became involved in all kind of community volunteerism. So I'm saying that if you're going through a challenge, not that you've been laid off, but the universe has given you an opportunity to find your real true making on the planet, then use that time wisely. Volunteer, give yourself away. My high school teacher, Charles L. Williams, said something I love. He said, love and happiness are like perfumes. You can't sprinkle it on others without getting a few drops on yourself. Isn't that beautiful? See, what you give is what? What you get. All right, repeat after me, please. I'm going to give my life away. Because what you give is what you get. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, share some happiness. Now, here's something else. Fear of change. See, the reason that I think that Joe stayed there as long as he did, Joe feared change. Most people fear change. A lot of people stay in jobs where they're miserable or stay in relationships where they're miserable. Sometimes in order to begin to see the daisies in life, you've got to be willing to change cities, change friends, change relationships, change jobs. 
See, after a while, you get bored doing the same old thing in the same old way, day in and day out. Human beings were designed to achieve. And when you are not on a path of developing your greatness and growing and being more productive and being more effective, then your life literally becomes depressing just like Joe. So Joe was resisting change. And as a result of resisting change, Joe made some trade-offs. See, this psychiatrist talked about the fact that these people who had been on his couch for months and years not being able to make decisions about things, but when they found out that they were dying, they got up and started making all kinds of decisions. They decided no longer to sell out. And you know what happened to me when I lost my job? You know what I think it was what life said to me more or less? Les Brown, you know you can do more than what you're now doing. Les Brown, you have sold out. Les Brown, go home, go in your drawer, pull out your check stubs and see how much you've sold your soul for. See, one of the things that got me about the movie is what Joe said to his boss after the doctor told him he was going to die. He went back to work and he confronted him. He said, because I was afraid, too afraid to live my life, I sold it to you for $300 a week. I sold my soul for $300 a week. And when I look at Joe, ladies and gentlemen, I know that I'd sold out on myself at different points in my life. That when you go home and you look at, if your life is not what you want it to be, if you're not living the way that you want to live, if you're not experiencing what you want to experience, if it's not giving you what you want, you've got to ask yourself, what have I sold my soul for? Remember that song? Sixteen ton. And what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. Saying, Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. Oh no, this is not Luther Vandroff tonight. No. <laughs> Last time I sung, Luther called my hotel and made a bomb threat. No, 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 no. <laughs> is depressing, ladies and gentlemen, that many of us have sold our souls for a home in the suburbs or a brand new car or three meals a day and a roof over our heads or because we want to be popular with our friends. See, when you decide to make a change, it's challenging that there's going to be some resistance. Everybody is not going to agree with that. There's a price to pay. Am I right? See, when I had to think about getting a divorce, it was time for me to grow. And sometimes you stay in a situation too long. Many times you say, well, I, I, I need to do it for the kids. Well, see, staying there too long can be harmful to the kids. I had a friend of mine who finally got a divorce after agonizing it. She said, I stayed there as long as I did for the kids. She said, but if I had it to do over again, I would have left sooner because it wasn't healthy for them. And it wasn't healthy for me. Many of us stay in jobs where it's no longer good for us to be there. But because we can't see ourselves having the capacity to do more and to achieve more and can't see life after that job, we stay there as victims, volunteer victims. Because nobody's making us do it. We volunteer to be victims. We volunteer not to be in charge of our destiny. We volunteer. We willingly do it. If you're going to sell out, don't do it in a hurry. Do it slowly. Let somebody come and have to take it from you. Don't just give it up willingly. And that's what Joe had done. Think about a guy who, he had everything going for him. Went to Harvard, became a lawyer, joined a large prestigious law firm, married the perfect wife, had children. And guess what? He was going through the motions day in and day out, but it wasn't giving him what he wanted out of life. He was going through an act. He was acting out a role. And one day, he couldn't get out of bed. He was just there in bed, couldn't get up, paralyzed. They got the doctors. They looked at him, examined him from head to toe. and said, there's nothing physically wrong with him. Get up, John. Come on, get up. He couldn't get up. He stayed like that for a month, had to take therapy. See, because there was dis-ease, there was conflict in his body. Many times when life calling on us to change and to grow and to expand, we said, no, no, I don't want to hear that. No, 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 we resist that. 
So we can go back to that lifestyle of mediocrity. We, we resist that, that change, that growth. We go back so we can go back to sleep. Winston Churchill said that truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but at the end, there it is. Carlisle said, truth crushed the earth, shall rise again. And we know scriptures say, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But the truth that will set men free is the truth that men don't want to hear. So we don't want to hear. You got to change. You got to take responsibility for your stuff. You got to clean your act up. You are not your act. You need to get your life together. We don't want to hear that. We want to talk about the circumstances. We want to talk about how bad things are, why we can't do it. See, that's where Joe was. So what we have to do is decide to live with integrity in our relationships and the things that gives our lives some meaning. Stop pretending and decide to become real. Decide that we're not going to trade off because we don't realize what we have in our hands. I'm reminded of the story of, of some explorers who were in Africa and they saw these little boys playing with these little rocks. They were shooting marbles, a game similar to that. And these marbles, so to speak, were shiny. And, and these explorers asked these little boys, say, here, taste this candy. Gave them some candy. Say, you like that? Say, yeah. Say, good. Tell you what, give me those marbles, I'll give you some more candy. And they did that. And the explorers went off. And they discovered that these shiny rocks were large, uncut diamonds. The little boys did not have enough awareness to know what they had in their hands. And many of us are like that. Many of us have genius within us. We have ideas that we, we use it for the company. We have, we put in long hours, 60, 70 hours a week for the company store. We'll break our backs for the company. But when it comes to us, when it comes to using our genius in our own behalf, taking a chance with our own creativeness, acting on our own dreams and ideas, somewhere along the line we get paralyzed. We find some reason not to do it. Oh, I did that. I'm not as good as they are. I don't have their education. I felt inferior because I never had a college education. So I felt inferior. I thought people with college education were the most intelligent people in the world. And I felt inferior and intimidated by them. So I wouldn't want to speak before people that had more education than I did. What? Come on, Les, you can do that. Oh, no, I can't. Les, you're a good speaker, man. You can just communicate with people, period. Well, you know, they, you know I, I'm not, you, there's just some things I just don't know. And, I just, can I pass, you know, get somebody else. I got a friend, man, he, this guy has a master's degree. He's real good, you know, get him. But I just, I'm not the one to come speak to that group. See, I didn't know what I had in my hands. And fortunately, I had somebody around me who saw what I had and was willing to work with me until I could see it too. See, that's, that's what many times we have to have. Somebody could look beyond our thoughts and see our needs and, and hold that vision until we are able to capture that vision ourselves. How do we handle some fears? I was talking with my friend, Pat Johnson, who's the president of Begin Within Seminars. If think about some major fear you have, here's one thing she said, which is good. She said, Les, if you got a, a real major fear, she said, take a deep breath and see yourself strong enough and more than able to handle that fear, whatever it is. Everybody take a deep breath. Whatever that fear, just feel that you have the strength and the power and the capacity to handle it. Another friend of mine, Ron Weiner, he says, when I'm confronted with a fear, I just practice the art of looking beyond the fear. I go behind it and see it already completed, see it already resolved, and then I carry myself accordingly as if it already is taken care of. That dispels the fear for me. Another friend of mine by the name of Jack Wilson said, when I experience fear, I think about when I was in Vietnam and what I handled back then and I look at what I'm dealing with right now, and the fact that I survived that, the fact that I had other kinds of situations that were close calls or that I was overwhelmed with fear and I came through it, then I look at this and says, this is nothing here. And we've all had that experience, what Jack had. How many of you had some situations that you were in that you were overwhelmed with fear? 
You didn't know how you're going to come out, how you're going to survive. And you did. You survived and you didn't die. Raise your hand if you survive. All right. So what you got to do, whatever that was, whatever that state of consciousness, whatever that self-confidence that you had, however you stood up within yourself, here's what we know. You survived. Here's what we know. You're still here. You didn't die. Hello. You did not die. You didn't die. You hear that? You didn't die. You're here right now. You got it and you handled that fear. You kicked it out of there. All right? Remember that play Color Purple? I remember when, when Alba told the girl she couldn't go with sure. He said, where you going? You know, this girl been wondering all her life, live her dream. But she was afraid. She felt incompetent, and he had beaten her down, and her self-esteem had eroded. He said, where are you going? You can't talk. Sure can talk. You ugly. You dumb. Sure got class. You ain't got nothing. Where are you going? You ain't going to make it. You're going to fail. She said, look here. I might be ugly. I might be dumb. I might can't talk. She said, but I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here. And so as you begin to look at the fears in back of you, you came through those fears and you're still here. See, that's a testament about how powerful you are. And so whatever the volcano is, you have the capacity to take that volcano on, the capacity to jump in it and find your true identity. Here's another thing that keeps a lot of people from taking on the volcanoes and jumping into the challenges that they're confronted with, the fear of making mistakes or not feeling good enough, guess what? You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. Guy said this, and it's true. He said, the person who has never made a mistake hasn't done anything. <laughs> if you're going to make some mistakes if you want to do something out here. <laughs> you're going to fall flat on your face. You're going to be criticized when you come out into the arena called life. You're going to feel awkward and stupid and dumb sometimes. It goes with the territory. But it's okay. What's important is that you bring your stuff out here. Are you good enough? Prepare yourself. See, there's no substitute for competency. A positive attitude won't get it. Being enthusiastic won't get it. So you've got to prepare yourself. You've got to develop yourself. You've got to practice. You've got to work. You've got to do your homework. You've got to do your research. See, a lot of people have a yes, I can attitude, but a no, I can't aptitude. <laughs> and competency builds confidence. And confidence feeds into competency. See, the better you become, the more confident you feel. And the more confident you feel, the better you want to become. You realize that you have no ceiling. That you can better whatever you've done so far. You can go beyond that. You don't become cocky and arrogant, feeling that you've already arrived as most people have. And that's why they've settled for less than what they rightly deserve in life. Because they feel they have arrived and they say, well, I can rest now. I can rest on my laurels now. I've, I've made it. <laughs> no, no, no. As long as you're breathing, you've got some more work to do. There's something else for you to achieve. The publisher of USA Today said that unless you've made some major mistakes in life, you haven't started living yet. So a lot of people, if you've never made any major blunders, made some major mistakes, lost some serious money, taken some serious risk, you haven't started living yet. You don't call that living, not rocking the boat, going through life quietly, tiptoeing safely to an early grave. No, 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 no. You've got to take some chances. You want to bring some adventure to your life. Repeat after me, please. I will develop myself. I will develop myself. Sharpen, my Sharpen my skills. I'm good. I'm good. Better than good. And better than most. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, keep getting better. <laughs> keep getting better. Keep getting better. Keep getting better. Here's something else. See, a lot of people, because they don't want to make any mistakes, it takes us to the next level. A lot of people don't want to fail. Fear of failure, fear of success, and guess what else? Fear of the unknown. I saw a guy last week, came up to visit me, haven't seen him for years. Bob Boyd from Columbus, Ohio. Bob Boyd introduced me to motivational tapes. Introduced me to a lot of 
motivational speakers and positive thinking and a multi-level marketing company at that time called Best Line Products had an inspirational leader named Bill Bailey. Jim Rowan was in that as well. And so Bob Boyd, that, that folded. And, but here's what about Bob Boyd, why I was interested in seeing Bob last week that drove up from Columbus. Bob Boyd, that I know has been involved, personally I know, and I've been involved in business deals with him. Bob has had at least 30 failures that I know. 30 business failures since I've known him since 1972. Incredible. So I wanted to hear this deal that Bob was bringing me. Les, I've got to talk to you. <laughs> so he came in in the traditional Bob Boyd fashion. Hello, Les, how you doing? I said, fine, Bob. I wanted to know if Bob had lost in his fire steam, had life beaten his dream out of him. Bob said, Les Brown, I've got a deal. You know, you get exposure to a lot of people. Man, I've got a deal. I'm thinking, does he want me to join Amway? What is this? <laughs> man, I've got something going. Man, this thing, man, Les, it's a money machine. I said, tell me about it, Bob. But here's what was going on in my mind. Bob didn't mention anything about all the losses, deals we'd lost some money on. He, it never came up in conversation. It was like this is the first deal he ever brought me. I said, what courage. You know what Winston Churchill said? <laughs> you know what Winston Churchill said about courage, Pat? He said, courage is the ability to go from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. <laughs> so you want to courageously hold on to your dream and not lose enthusiasm. See, Bob has not internalized failure. Things just didn't work out the way he wanted them to work out. He's still looking for his pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And he was so fired up, traditional Bob Boyd fan. He took his coat off. Les, let me tell you something, man. You've got to see this deal. With the things you're doing, you're now on PBS. My God, Les, you'll make a fortune, man. I just can't wait to tell you about it. I said, tell me, Bob, tell me. <laughs> when he got to talking, I said, Bob, I want to be a part of it. He said, now explain to me what I just told you. I said, I don't know what it is, but I want to do it. I want to do it. <laughs> I didn't even know. I felt like the lady that was with Joe. Joe decided he's going to jump in the volcano. He said, I'm going to go with you. He said, oh, you can't go. She said, oh, I want to go too. See, you get fired up about something. People will come to see you burn. They want to go too. <laughs> So I like the fact that Bob has not lost his fire. Bob is still hungry. Bob still sees his dream. Bob is still searching for a way to make it happen. He doesn't care about people talking about it. Man, he's never kept a job. Guys had 15 or 20 different jobs, all these business deals. Bob has turned a deaf ear to that. You know, that's what you gotta do if you wanna conquer your volcano. A guy in Los Angeles, all over the front page of the newspaper, he just passed the bar after taking it 48 times. That bar was his volcano. He had more than enough reason and excuses not to take it. His son has a law firm. He could have been a legal assistant, a clerk, and people all of a sudden, used to laugh at this guy. He was a laughing stock. Are you taking the ball lately? <laughs> Can you imagine what they did to this dude? You know what that guy is? Man making a career taking the bar. <laughs> but by the way, he need to make a career to pass it. <laughs> people will do that too. You know, people talk about John Kennedy Jr. failing the bar. Did you read in the newspaper that he passed? Yes. I didn't see that. But did they make a bigger deal about him passing as they did when he failed? No, you know why? People like to see you fail. They like to see that. It, people like that. I don't know why it's set up like that. I was on the expressway, traffic was jammed up. You know what was happening? It was an accident. But people pull over to the side to get out of their car to go look. <laughs> to see somebody else is suffering. That's why talk shows are so popular. So people like to hear other people's misery. Get it caught up in that. Then they go magnified in their own life because that's all they focus on. I bet not catch you going to any accidents here. <laughs> Bob Boyd went to conquer his volcano like that gentleman who decided it doesn't matter how many times I fail. 
I'm going to courageously pursue it. I don't care what people say. I don't care what they think. This is something that I want that gives my life meaning and value. You've got a volcano like that in you somewhere. There's something. See, at some point in time, all of us have seen our destiny. I was six years old, man by the name of Reverend Ed Graham, a Mount Zion Baptist Church in Miami. I was six years old right before Christmas. My mother was ill. We had no food in the house. And this tall, strapping man around 6'1 came to the door with a food basket in his hand. And he says, hello, is this the Brown family? My mother said, yes. I understand that you have two sons and a daughter and that you have no food. Yes, I'm from Mount Zion Baptist Church and around Christmas time we pass out food baskets to needy families. Take the basket in behalf of the church and have a nice Christmas. And when he walked out I said, oh boy, I'd like to be like that man. And I went to his church and I used to watch him speak and tall and powerful and dynamic speaker, such eloquence. Uh, one of his favorite people was the poet Kipling who wrote, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. <laughs> what eloquence he had. And I said, oh, I would hunt Wesley. I said, Wesley, I like to be like Reverend Graham. Boy, he's powerful. <laughs> A friend of mine, Mildred Singleton, my former fiance, she was with a school outing. <laughs> but we're still good friends. She's in a. Y'all always dipping in my stuff, but anyhow. <laughs> Somebody say, I take you, it's all right. <laughs> but she was on a school outing, and, and they took her to a hospital, and she was in the operating room watching from a distance. And she saw someone working or doing eye surgery. And she says, that's what I want to do. She's just a teenager. And today she's an ophthalmologist. All of us have seen our destiny at some point in time. And we decided not to listen. We decided to ignore it. To no, that's, that's not for me. Life came in and slapped us side the head. And we stopped dreaming anymore. Bigger Thomas said, the impulse to dream has been slowly beaten out of me through the experience of life. And that's what causes many of us to give up on our volcano. The experiences and the challenges, the defeats, the disappointments and the failures of life. That we decide to prematurely throw in the towel on ourselves or to sell out on our true potential. Sell out on living our dreams. Feeling that we're not good enough. Not wanting to make any mistakes, particularly if you're raised with a great deal of criticism. So you've got to be willing to prepare yourself and do the best you can. Take your best shot and let the chips fall where they may. And so as you begin to look at people become afraid of success because they feel they're not good enough, they can't handle it, the responsibility is too big, I've been there. And when you feel that way, you begin to unconsciously work against yourself to make sure that you don't get it. You begin to sabotage your own potential in a variety of ways through procrastinating, through not taking care of business, not giving reports on time, not spending your time wisely, squandering your time looking at a lot of idle television or spend all your time lamenting and complaining about how bad things are, using your energy negatively rather than positively, complaining rather than producing. That's what we do when we're afraid of really making it. And when you're afraid of the unknown, when you're afraid to take that leap, when you're afraid to venture out there, that's a real challenge. I'm reminded about a little boy, two little guys were out playing on some ice that was supposed to have been solid. And one of the little boys stepped on a thin area of the ice and fell in a hole. And as he began to start thrashing in the water, he began to move with the undercurrent to other areas of the ice and his friend was there trying to help him beat and hitting the ice, trying to save his friend. And he panicked and he, he looked just a short distance away and there was a tree and he went and he ripped a branch off and he came back trying to get his buddy out and he just took the best he could to start scraping around the ice to make a circle and when he did he started beating on it and beating on it and there all of a sudden the ice began to crumble and he was able to pull his friend out to safety when the paramedics finally got there they saw what had happened how thick the ice was he saved the little boy's life but what baffled him they looked at the branch and they looked at this little scrawny guy and said, how did he do this? It's impossible. They just went beating around the ice to see how thick it was, hearing the thumping sound. Said, how did he do that? 
I mean, it was a miracle that he was able to just take that branch and go around, make a circle, and beat the ice and pull him through. He's just too small. It's just impossible. And an old man standing around, hearing the conversation, stepped forward and said, I can tell you how he did it. He didn't have anybody here to tell him he couldn't do it. See, sometimes life will happen to you like this little boy and you won't have time to say no. You won't have time to think that you can't do it. The only time you will have is to act, to take the leap of faith and believe that everything is going to be all right. Take that leap of faith. Trust yourself and know within yourself that everything's going to be all right. But aren't there some guarantees you can give us, Les? Yes. What is that? You're going to die. <laughs> Excuse me? You're going to die. In case you didn't understand that, you can't get out of life alive. <laughs> so I'm saying to you, you've got six months to live. Live your life now. Live your dreams now. Start acting like this is your last day on the planet. See, if we decide that we don't need a pronouncement from some physician to say we have six months to a year to live in order to really begin to appreciate the beauty of life, in order to really to make some hard decisions in life. See, we have the power in our hands. Like those little boys, we have that kind of power, that kind of genius, that kind of fortune, that kind of wealth that kind of happiness, that kind of sense of fulfillment in our hands. We have that. We have that. It's in our hands. It's on us. And nobody can make that decision for us. We can give it away. We can give it to the company store for $400 or $500 a week. Or we can exchange it for how people think about us, how they feel about us and go through life and resign ourselves to be miserable as we go to our graves looking good for everybody else except to ourselves. Or well, we can decide, hey, wait, this is the only life that I have. And that is my volcano. And I'm going to take the leap of faith. I'm going to jump in it. And I'm going to handle it because I know the universe will never give me anything I don't have the capacity to handle. See, I say to you that you've got the power within you to handle any kind of volcano in your life, regardless of how it shows up, regardless of any kind of challenge that you might have in your life. I say to you, you've got that in you right now. Where will it come from? Don't worry. If you trust yourself, it will come to you at the right time in which you need it. If you believe and don't doubt if everything in you is something about life, I believe. That when a person resolves within themselves that this is how I give my life, this is how I'm forwarding myself in the universe. Dr. Johnny Youngblood out of New York, he said, I must live what's in me. This is why I've got to do this, Les. I must live what's in me. And all of us have something in us that we must live. And if we don't know what it is right now, we must create it or we must find it. All of us have this, whatever this, this something is that gives our life that meaning, that value, and that power, and that happiness. That happiness that a lot of people just wouldn't understand why you got to do it and why you got to take that mountain on. Don't you know, there'll be people who, who've decided that, that what they're doing is who they are. They've been acting this way for so long, they think their act is who they are. They've been evading themselves so long and, and tell that mediocrity is natural to them. They won't understand you. They won't understand why you've got to go and do what you got to do. Why well, you might have to change cities or you got to get another job. Why? What's wrong? This job is paying good. It's not to pay. It's not always the money. Yes, I need money, but I need something else other than money. I, 
I need some peace of mind. I need some fulfillment within me. It's, it's not giving me what I want. No, no, no. Well, what is it? I don't know. Why you got to go? Why, why are you going now? I just, I don't, I don't want to live this anyway, anymore. I just, I'm out of here. Why? I don't expect you to understand. He who knows no explanation is necessary. And he who does not know, no explanation will suffice. I just got to go and jump in the volcano. Excuse me. So I say, design your life so that it makes sense to you. It might not make sense to anybody else, but it makes sense to you. That's what's important. It makes you happy. It gives you that sense of joy. It brings back alive the little boy or the little girl in you. It helps you to have some special joy that other folk just won't understand. Go get your volcano. This is Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy, Leslie Calvin Brown, saying it's been a plum, pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. Thank you all, Kim. about critical options and looking at that and looking at some of the definitions of options decision self-determination choice preference desire I want to share something with you that's relative to critical options because we all have them in our lives and I want to ask you a question what is the focus of your life what is the focus of your life in life, you have a critical option. You can take a stand in your life, or you can follow the crowd. See, people who follow the crowd, their lives are not focused. They're not immersed in anything. People who take a stand, they're living a life that has some power, a life of achievement, a life that has some meaning. People that are taking a stand in life, they are consciously involved in a process to design a life of substance. People who are following the crowd, these are people that they're just doing what everybody else is doing. So that's a crowded road over there. They're following the followers. I want to talk to you about taking a stand with your life. And what are some of the things we can do that will enable us to give our lives up in a way that has some purpose and meaning, that can be real for us, that can give us a sense of fulfillment, of joy and happiness and peace of mind. See, most people are bored with life. Most people feel that life isn't worth the hassle, that life is just wearing me out. It's boring, it's monotonous. I have nothing to look forward to. Here we go again another Monday morning. T-G-I-F day, thank God it's Friday. <laughs> Here we go again, oh boy. You see what the man meant about many people die at age 25 and don't get buried until they're 65? <laughs> Doing the same thing the same way every day, looking at these faces, just walking around. <laughs> I mean, you got to be aware of these faces, they affect you, you know. Try to stay around pleasant faces, and if you have an unpleasant face, try and smile more. It's good for your health. And there's another dividend, you look better too. <laughs> so looking for a way, 
in which we can begin to give our lives some special power. Number one, commit yourself to giving your best at all times. Now that's not easy. See, most people, and particularly those who are working in corporations, they're finding now they've got to change their behavior. We're now involved in a world economy. We will never do business the way in which we've done business in the past. We will never be able to, in the American workplace, do just enough to get by. Now the standards have been raised. Quality and productivity has been increased because of the competition. And so now average performance will not be enough. This is a new day. Competition is fierce. So people who just, who've been locked into a behavior pattern are working just hard enough to keep from getting fired. They're being laid off are forced into early retirement. It's a new game now. So now more than ever, it's about increased productivity. Now more than ever, it's about superior quality service. Now more than ever, it's about creating a positive atmosphere in the workplace and people that have that competitive age, people that are hungry to make it. So you gotta be hungry now. You can't just casually walk around, well, I'll get to it later on. <laughs> oh, no, no, this, this is a new day right now. Committing yourself to give your best at all times, regardless of the competition to do otherwise, or the influences of negative people that will tell you, hey, look here, don't push yourself too much. Now's the time to push yourself, to always get in the habit of giving the best that you have to share thinking about a situation where I had, I had to give a lecture out in Los Angeles, California for Xerox Corporation. A part of what I do when I, my profession is doing corporate training. My passion is doing training with kids. So when I go someplace, I always try and arrange for a community group to have a group of young people together for me to work with them on a volunteer basis in the evening. So I decided to go into an area of Los Angeles to talk with someone about doing that and they suggested that I come to speak at a community center right outside Los Angeles at Carson Community Center. And because of the, the gangs in Los Angeles, one of the young men that was coming there to organize it and his mother, he had a twin brother and he took an interest in me because I have a twin. And his twin brother was the victim of a gang ritual. They brought in a new member in a gang and he had to prove that he was really with them and committed. And his job was just to select anybody at random and kill them. And he did that as this young guy was coming out of a store. So they told me, Mr. Brown, would you come over and talk to the teenagers here? There's a lot of depression and despair and hopelessness and people feeling powerless about the gangs. And bring um, with you some handouts and materials so you can do a workshop. And parents will be involved too. Would you be willing to do that? I said, well, I'm doing a full day seminar and I'm usually just physically exhausted afterwards. How many people you say you're going to have? The we guarantee at least four to five hundred people there. <laughs> I said, okay, I will come there and work with them and take them through this intensive. It's called Project Respect, how to create a shift in the community, how to get young people engaged in a process of creating positive peer pressure rather than buying into the negative peer pressure instruments and, and techniques of how we can provide ongoing coaching for young people to begin to change how they see themselves and their values and how to resist negative peer pressure. So I came there after working in a seminar, totally exhausted, in that Los Angeles traffic. It took over an hour to get there. Got there, they only had seven people. I had an attitude. I said, you had me come all the way from Los Angeles after working all day just to talk to seven people? You told me over 400 people were going to be here. Where are the parents? Only one parent here. My time is valuable. I've got all this material that we've copied to do a workshop. And so I went on and talked to those young people that were in the room, the seven that were there, and I just gave them a little speech. And then I left. Went back to the hotel. That night around 3.30 in the morning, the phone rang. The minister that invited me called me and said, Mr. Brown, I, I, I've got to ask for your attention for a moment. I said, what, are you, what is it? 
Ken Yatta, one of the young men who was there, want to talk to you. He was the brother of the guy that was killed. He'd like to talk to you. He's been here for over an hour, and I told him, please don't call you. But he insisted. Would you please talk to him for a moment? I said, yes, put him on the phone. Ken Yatta, what can I do for you? He said, Mr. Brown, I listened to your tapes for a long time. I've grown to love you and admire you. Among the things that I heard on your tapes that you said you must deal with circumstances such as you find them. You came in this evening and I admit, no, we did not have the numbers that you asked for. No, we did not deliver as we had promised we would. But we were looking for you, the motivator, to give us some hope. We were depressed and we don't know what to do. We were looking for some direction. And you were so caught up in pouting with your ego because we didn't have the place full. You didn't give us your best. I said, excuse me, I was laying in bed. I sit up then, wait a minute here. <laughs> now see, part of what won't let us grow in life is number one, we identify when we get feedback. We start taking it personal. Number two, we start to justify. So I became defensive and I said, wait a minute. I worked all day. I didn't charge y'all a quarter for this. I went carpet material, I came over there. I was there to give a training for the people and you, all y'all had to do was bring people there. If you don't do it for me for the next speaker that you have, at least provide an audience for him to work with. He said, are you through, sir? I said, yes. Mr. Brown, you said you must deal with circumstances such as you find them. <laughs> We went round and round for about 45 minutes. Because my ego on the line, I can't let this young boy out debate me. He was not intimidated. I used all the verbal gymnastics and examples I could. He would not bulge. And I said, okay, I'm sorry. Give me a break. And he said, it takes a big man to say he's sorry. That night, after I finished that young man, I prayed, I stayed on the floor by the bed. <laughs> I said, Lord, if you ever give me a chance to speak again, I don't care if it's one person in the audience, I'm gonna wear that one out. <laughs> I learned my lesson. I wanna read something to you called The Builder that kind of touched me. Because when you start looking at giving your best at all times, that's not easy. But when you are committing yourself to doing something, those are the standards that you set for yourself because that's who you are. If you're working on a job where you're miserable, they're not paying you what you're worth. You don't like the work, you don't like the people, and you're dissatisfied. If you have decided to continue to take a paycheck, you owe it to yourself to give it your best effort. If you get in the habit of being mediocre or doing just enough to get by, you're not hurting anybody but you. You're cheating you. The builder. There was a man who was an efficient builder. He had worked for years in a large company and had reached the age of retirement. His employer asked him to build one more house. It was to be his last commission. The builder took the job, but his heart was not involved. He used inferior materials, timber was poor, and he failed to see the many things that should have been clear to him had he shown even his normal interest in his work. When the house was eventually finished, his employer came to him and said, the house is yours. Here's the key. It's a present from me. The builder immediately regretted that he had not used the best materials and engaged the most capable workers. If only he had known that the house was for him. Whoa. <laughs> if he had made a commitment with his life, with his craft, 
that I'm going to give my best at all times, even if this is my last job. I'm going to give it my best shot because that expresses who I am. He would have been more appreciative of that gift. Would you imagine that? I think that makes a very good point. The next thing is live each day with integrity. Don't try and get over in life. Don't try and cheat. See, a lot of people like to try and cheat. I was with a friend of mine, and we were, went into a service station to get some gas. They gave me back too much change. I discovered it down the road, and I was turning around going back. I said, you're a fool. Hey, man, what when they don't give people enough change? You think they flag the people down? I said, I'm not responsible for them. I'm responsible for me. I went back and I told the guy, excuse me, sir, you gave me a $20 bill too much. I gave it to the guy. The guy just took it and walked away. He didn't say thank you. The guy in the car laughed and said, I told you, you fool. I'd have kept that. I said, I'm not responsible for his attitude. I don't care. Knowing that he would not say thank you, I would still give it back to him. Because my image of myself says, hey, you don't take something that doesn't belong to you. That's the way my mother raised me. Don't try and cheat. Say, well, you know, this little bit won't count. Everything counts. A friend of mine was on welfare after going through a bad experience. Someone, you know, I think she and her husband it became ill. They couldn't work for a while, and they went on welfare. After they both became physically well, he said, look here. We don't ever have to go back to work. We're making more money on welfare than we made when we were working with all the Medicaid benefits and, and all of the food stamps and everything. She said, no. She said, we are not going to accept the checks anymore. He said, I'm not going to work. Now, you can go to work if you want to. <laughs> she went down to the welfare department and said, don't send any more checks to my house. Lady said, excuse me? She said, now, I've been working here 25 years. No one has ever come in here and said, don't send any more checks in. Are you sure you're all right? <laughs> yes, I am. And she went home and told her husband, don't look for any more checks because I told them to cut the check off. Now we've got to find something to do. And they started a paper route and got over 1,500 customers and were making money hand over fist and a spirit of dignity and achievement not ripping anybody off. That was a critical choice. She could have very easily said, well, everybody else is doing it. Why don't I do it? But she decided not to follow the crowd. I like what um, Whitaker said, what you think about me is none of my spiritual business. <laughs> So when you're keeping integrity with yourself, you know that's going to bring you under a lot of pressure. The next thing is, don't try to cut a bargain with life. Life is not Donald Trump. <laughs> life will not give you any special deals because you maintain a sense of integrity. Anybody ever try to cut a deal? Raise your hand, please, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you try to cut a deal? There are no deals. There are no deals. You've got to do what you do because, not with any ulterior motives, that you're going to get some special benefit or some special treatment in the universe. No. Doesn't mean that somebody might not steal your car while you're trying to do some good for somebody. No, there won't be any special light around your car. They will take your car too. <laughs> All the good people. You're going to go too. You've got to do what you do because that expresses who you are. And for no other reason. They might not have a banquet to recognize you or give you a special little plaque and de dedicate a day in your name. No. Do what you do because that's you. The next thing is dedicate your life to something. Dedicate your life to a cause larger than yourself. See, if you dedicate your life to a cause larger than yourself, you're not following in the crowd. 
See, if your life is not dedicated to something of value, and I like what Howard Thurman said, who was one of the mentors to Dr. Benjamin Mays, who was a mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King, he said, the quality of life is often determined by that to which the individual is dedicated. If the dedication of the life is vague and diffuse, the quality is apt to be poor and weak. There is much to be said for the intensity of life. See, most people are not intense about living. Most people are very casual about life. They haven't found anything to become intense about. So when you dedicate your life, you don't care anything about the odds. Somebody say, when the dream is big enough, the odds don't matter. See, when you dedicate your life, you bring on a special power. There's a power in you that people's circumstances, events, and I'm not talking about the physical you. I'm talking about the real you, the indestructible, invincible, perfect essence of who you really are that can bring a government to its knees, that can change the course of history. When you dedicate your life like a Nelson Mandela who has decided to sacrifice his freedom, all he has to do is say whatever the government wants him to say and then let him go free. And he can go to a foreign nation and say, I just said that because I've been in prison for over 20 years. And nobody will say, well, Nelson, you sold out. No one would say that. They will say, wait a minute. Nelson, you gave over 20 years of your life. What more can we ask of you? It's OK. But because of his integrity with himself, and he's dedicated his life to break the back of apartheid and free his people, it was Benjamin Disraeli. He says, nothing can resist the will of a people that will stake even their existence on the extent of their purpose for good. That when you dedicate your life to something, you bring on some powers in the universe that works through you to bring about changes that you would never ever know unless you have dedicated yourself. So I say to you that there is a Mother Teresa in you. There's some work for you to do. I say to you that there is a Nelson Mandela in you, that that kind of commitment, that kind of spirit, that kind of personal power, that kind of vision of allowing yourself to be used by life is in you that all of us came here to do something, to make a difference. And in a historical context, the world will never be the same again because you came this way. Anytime somebody asks me how I'm doing, I say I'm doing better than good and better than most, and sometimes even better than that. <laughs> Let me tell you where I got that from. When I was involved in broadcasting, I used to have the first hour of my show as a disc jockey in Columbus, Ohio. I used to give an inspirational program. And there was a lady that used to call me by the name of Audrey Pelmore. Audrey worked at University Hospital. Audrey was an enthusiastic personality that everybody liked her. I mean, she had a radiant smile and she was just one of those people. You ever meet one of those people that everybody just liked them? She was one of those kind of folks. Audrey became stricken with muscular sclerosis at a very young age. And after a while, she became confined to a wheelchair. She had children. And because of her, her physical deterioration, she could no longer take care of her children. And she had to be confined to a nursing home, Alum Creek Nursing Home on Nelson Avenue in Columbus, Ohio. Audrey used to have the nurses at the hospital call the radio station and put the phone to her ear. And she would ask for a certain request. And I would ask her to say a few words to the listening audience. One day, while I was doing my program, I got a call from one of my regular callers, a young lady by the name of Shirley. Shirley, on this particular day, there was a sound in her voice. And I detected that something was wrong. And she said to me, it's nice talking to you, Les. I'll be seeing you. And I said, wait, wait, hold a minute, Shirley. There's something wrong. She says, there's nothing wrong. I said, there is, Shirley. I know you. Come on, Shirley, what's wrong? 
where Shirley had been diagnosed as having cancer of the breast. And they told her that she had a 60-40 chance of not surviving. During the time that she had had her medical examination, her husband had become distant. Through the pressure of losing her husband and the illness, she just felt, hey, I'm not the kind of person that can handle suffering. And I'd rather just end it quickly. She was at a critical point in her life. And this is the option that she decided to take. I did everything I could to discourage her, to give her a reason to want to go on living. I was trying to find something that she can hold on to that would give her a sense of hope, some thread. I, and I use scripture and everything. And one of my fallback positions, Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And she didn't budge. That did not work. And I was out of my arsenal of what can I do to hold on to her, to get her to change her mind, to create a shift in her thinking. And the thought came to me. I said, Shirley, could you wait until tomorrow? <laughs> she waited for a long time before she answered. She said, why tomorrow? I said, because if you wait until tomorrow, I'd like to take you by to see Audrey Palmore. You remember Audrey that I talk about all the time on the air? She said, yes, I like her. I would like to meet her. And she met me at the Alum Creek Nursing Home. And when we got there, we were both very silent because I'd made a pact with her that if this was not enough to discourage her from taking her life, then I would honor our agreement and I would just release her. And I was going to talk to somebody else to try and get her. I didn't tell her that. <laughs> As we walked down the hall, I did not know exactly what to expect. I had not seen Audrey for some time. When we walked in the room, there Audrey was, all twisted and physically deformed. She had no voluntary use of her arms. She couldn't even fan a fly out of her face. She couldn't get up and move around. And we had to get close to her because her vision was blurred and she can't speak very loudly and our hearing was somewhat impaired. And as we drew closer to her, I said, Audrey, this is Les. And I have a friend with me named Shirley. How are you doing, Audrey? And with what strength she had, she said, better than good and better than most. And Shirley, I know as the tears begin to form in our eyes, I know she had to be thinking that here this woman is. She's been on her back, a prisoner in her body for 17 years. She can't turn herself. She can't get up and go to the restroom. She said to me, Les, I'd love to be able to get up and walk out of here with you. I'd love to be able to take care of my children, to be a mother to them, to see them graduate from high school. She said, Les, I can't do that. And I'm doing better than good and better than most. Surely he had to be saying within herself, what right do I have to feel sorry for myself? What right do I have to cry out, why me? And she decided and left there with a commitment that she wanted to live with whatever time that she had left, that she had no right to cut the time off. She had no right to do that. And she left there with a new determination a new spirit about her. And that's something about what we have, that you have. There sometimes your options are frozen. See, Audrey can't walk out of a hospital. She did not have the capacity to take care of her children, but she had a freedom of spirit. And that's what we have, wherever we are, with whatever hand that life has dealt us. We have the freedom of spirit. We can go through life whining and weeping, or we can have the kind of spirit that people will say, hey, there's a blessing to be around that person. The staff at the hospital used to go in her room to be encouraged and inspired by her because she didn't feel sorry for herself. And she didn't go through life blaming everybody. I'm reminded of a young guy who was on a bus, a little young fellow, and some kids were picking at him, some bigger guys, and they kept on thumping him on the head and hiding their hands. 
And so he got tired of them doing that, and he stood up so he would not be around them out of their reach. And they took him and said, sit down. They set him down. And he stood back up. He said, I don't want to sit down. They said, sit down. Didn't we tell you? And they pushed him back down. Said, I don't want to sit down. They said, sit down. And they held him down. And he looked at him. He said, you might hold me down, but I'm standing up inside myself. <laughs> and what we have got to do is know that there's something about you. There's something about us. There's a power in you that regardless of what happens to you, you can stand up inside of yourself. I think that's what the port meant when he says, out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods there may be for my unconquerable soul. You have an unconquerable soul. Something that George Bernard Shaw said that I think has some power for us. I'd like to share it with you. He said, this is the true joy in life. And one of the things that he said, and I love when he talked about man and Superman, he said that we should establish a tribunal where people would be required to come once a year to give a reason why they should be permitted to go on living for the next year. <laughs> Can you imagine all the do-nothings? <laughs> hopping from one foot to the other, trying to give some justification <laughs> why they should be allowed to live for the next year? Well, um, what do you do? Uh, I, I drink a little bit. Uh. <laughs> what are you contributing to life? I go to work every day. <laughs> no, no, are you making a difference in the universe? Why should we allow you to continue to occupy this space? Can I come back to that one? <laughs> this is a true joy in life. The being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. Being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the opinion, George Bernard Shaw goes on to say, that my life belongs to the whole community. And as long as I live, it is my privilege, my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle for me. It is a sort of splendid torch which I've got a hold of for the moment. And I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. This is Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy, Leslie Cavan Brown, saying it's been a plump, pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. Thank you all here. <laughs> at some time or another, have agonized over making a decision. Some decisions are major decisions. And also there are a lot of small decisions that we don't make, that they tax our minds, they drain our energy, they create a lot of anxiety and nervousness and mental torment because we don't take care of it. We decide not to decide which is a decision. Deciding to decide, to act, is a major, major challenge for all of us at different points in different areas of our lives. And there are things that happen to us along the way, experiences that we have that prevent us from working through the mental block of acting, of doing those things that we know we ought to do 
And so what I want you to think about is what is there that you know you need to do, that you want to do this, but for some reason or another, you've been holding back. For some reason or another, you just have not been able to gather your nerves or be able to work through the procrastinating or putting it off or justifying or blaming. Some reason or another, you just haven't done it. And you know you ought to do this. You really want to do this, but you don't know why you haven't done it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand, please. Okay, then I've got company here this evening. I'm not talking to myself. Now, first of all, we know that this is not easy. Because in order to begin to reinvent your life, you've got to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort that you really have got to put all of yourself into it. It's very challenging to act, to do those things. There are times when you're looking at it and you say, I, I know I need to do this, but I don't feel like it. I don't want to do it. I know I need to do it, yet leave me alone. No. I don't want to do it. So what do we do? What are those things that, that cause us to do like that? I think that among the things that prevent us from acting is the fear of failure. And if you've already failed, you don't want to fail again. The pain of that, the disappointment, the fear of loss is another thing. Because many times when we do those things that we know we need to do, we feel that we might lose somebody that we love very much and care about. We don't want to hurt anybody. Many of us don't act because we want other people's approval. We want everybody to like us and to accept us. And that's not possible. Many of us don't do the things that we want to do and don't act because of lack of self-confidence. We don't believe enough in ourselves. I have a friend who's been working on a job where she's miserable, talented, want to go to another place that she can do what she wants to do and make the kind of money that she would like to make and have had some offers. But because of her fear and her lack of self-confidence of things might not work out, she won't take a chance on herself. So there she is spending eight hours a day, five days a week, and she's miserable. She hates to go to work. They're not paying her what she's worth. She knows it. But yet and still, she won't do that which she knows she must do, and it's wearing her out. There are a lot of people that their jobs are making them sick because they won't act. You check out the absenteeism and the people that are depressed. You see them coming to work angry. How are you doing? I don't know. <laughs> Just leave me alone. It's not even 9 o'clock yet. You're talking about good morning. There are days you go to work, you want to just keep driving past the job. You don't, you don't want to stop because it's not in sync with who you are. But you haven't acted. Have another friend. This guy's brilliant. He's a business consultant. He helped a lot of people get their business started. And people come to him because they know he's knowledgeable. But this guy won't start his own business. Now, he's very smart. He can do it. Everybody believes in him except him. And he's so smart, he's talked himself out of where the numbers aren't right. And so there are many reasons why we don't act. There are other things, though, that affect us. Is that not wanting to take personal responsibility. We want somebody else to do it. And we, many times, we pick up our inability to do certain things from people that we love people that we admire, we identify with them, and we live in the context of their ideas, their opinions, and their life patterns. We buy into it unconsciously. My mother is a pack rat. She keeps everything. She doesn't throw anything away. And I have unconsciously picked that up. Now, my mother never said, let me show you how to keep everything less and just clutter things. <laughs> I unconsciously pick that up. Many times, unconsciously, we try to honor the people we love by being like them. By the same token, I realized something about myself when I had some major decisions to make, and I found myself acting like my mother. 
See, my mother's the kind of person that when she has a problem with one of the other foster children that she adopted, she won't confront them. She will call me. <laughs> Les, why don't you tell Linda to move? <laughs> She's lazy. She won't go to work. She runs the street all day, and then she comes home and wants to sleep all day, and I think she's doing drugs. I said, but Mama, why don't you tell Linda that? I bought the house for you. I told you when she wanted to come home, don't let a grown person come there and take care of them. You let her in. Well, after all, she's my child. Mama, then you handle that. When I tell her to leave, she say, Mama say, I can say, Mama, can I say? And you tell her yes, and then you call me and say, she's still here. <laughs> Why worry me with this? So Mama hasn't developed the courage to act on that. Some people won't act until there's a crisis situation. When Linda started stealing from Mama and took her Social Security check, to get some drugs. Mama got some courage to say, get out of here. <laughs> and don't ever come back. But she wouldn't do it until then. And see, we don't have to wait until a crisis situation. I have a friend that has been having a challenge with losing weight. Both of us have been dealing with that challenge. And for the past 40 years, he's always seemed like weighed over 235 pounds. And so he said, man, I just can't lose weight. I'm big boned it. I said, Bud, I've never seen any fat skeletons. <laughs> no, you need to act on your health. You can change this. You don't have to go to your grave fat. We're all digging early graves with our teeth. We don't have to do this. They need to have a support group around M&M peanuts. You want a support group on something? and throw Snickers in there too. <laughs> Bud and I can tell you about the help we need with that. So what happened with Bud though, he became ill a few weeks ago. See, Bud in the last few weeks has lost more weight than he's ever lost, even when we were competing with each other, betting a lot of money. But what happened was, Bud became diabetic. He went into an insulin shock. He didn't know that he was diabetic. His blood sugar became high. And the doctor said to him, you are diabetic. You're going to have to have insulin shots every day. You're going to have to change your diet. And let me tell you what's going to happen if you don't do what we tell you to do. Number one, there's a possibility that you can become an amputee. Number two, you can go blind. Three, you can become impotent. But say, help me. <laughs> Like those guys when, when Paul when, when Paul broke out of jail, those guys say, tell me what I must do to be saved. <laughs> Bud were to be saved. I say, Bud, you want one of my peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? No. I say, Bud, I can't believe you're eating vegetables, man. You're exercising. He said, that's right, and jogging in place too. <laughs> Now, he had the ability to do it before, but there's some people, it takes that kind of crisis to bring them into reality in order for them to act in their own best interest. Some people have to hit rock bottom in order to rise. I don't know why. You want to begin to look out on your life and what you want for you. And I think that when we begin to focus in the area of what does it take for us to act. I think we can say events can inspire us to act, like that particular event in his life. Circumstances, a friend of mine, he wanted to do something and, and he just did not have the motivation and the drive and the confidence within himself. But his circumstances change overnight through an acquisition of the company that he worked for. He lost his job. Through the inspiration of desperation, he had to act. See, life also are things that can inspire us to act. See, we don't have the courage, and that's what it takes, courage. It takes guts to do that which you know you need to do. If you don't have the courage to act, life many times will move on you and make you act. Life will whoop your butt so bad 
you will be so miserable, you will catch so much hell, you say, yes, I will do it. What do you want me to do? Take me. A friend of mine said, I can't stop smoking. I can't stop smoking. Doctor said, Sam Axelrod, you have emphysema. Sam never picked up another cigarette. And said, look at those stupid people smoking. Sam, you did it for 35 years. How can you talk about people? Well, I was different. I'm, I'm trying to help them. <laughs> they don't have to do the same thing I did. But be compassionate, Sam. Isn't it interesting how quickly we forget? So I'm saying that look at something in your life. It might be just writing a letter to somebody to say thank you. It might be just to apologize to somebody. I had a confrontation in the Penobscot building with the security guard there. He responded to me what I perceived as a negative way, and he and I engaged in an argument. I did not like the way I handled that. I avoided going through the front door for a long time because I didn't want to face him. Finally, I decided to act, and I went up to him and said, I want to apologize to you for the way in which I handled this argument we had the other day. I was wrong. I hope you accept my apology. He said, I do. And I said, thank you very much. I felt relieved. Now, when you decide to act, it's not always going to be like that. A friend of mine did some work for me. It was below par, to say the least. I knew that this guy was capable of doing better work. I knew that he also had a fragile ego. So I was trying to think of what is the most sensitive way in which I can share this information with him. Because I wanted him to do my work over. I was going to pay him for what he did. But I needed my work done right. But I was afraid that I would hurt his feelings. I was very, very meticulous in how I approached him. And I said, let me share this with you. You know I care about you and that you're a very talented and gifted person. And you and I both know that what you have given me is not a true reflection of your talents and abilities. And I'm saying, let's go back in the studio and do this again. And he said to me, I'm going to forget you ever said that. I was wiped out. He never spoke to me again. Now, when you decide to act, you're going to have some people like that. We're no longer friends. I lost sleep over that, ladies and gentlemen. I said, I can't believe that. I, I remember st sitting up one night looking at the phone. I said, I got to call him. He said, no. Then I said, no, forget that. I called, man, look here. We've been knowing each other too long to allow this to come between us. He said, don't call me anymore, and hung up. And then I, I wanted to think about how, what can I do to make it up to him, and then something came to me, less. What do you have to prove? See, many things we don't do is, is because of the fact we want people to like us. There's some necessary losses in life. When you decide acting in your best interest, you're going to lose some friends. Everybody's not going to approve of you. There's some people that won't like you. Who do you think you are? You're arrogant. What do you think you can do? You think you can get away with that? You're selfish. Thanks, I got that. <laughs> it's my life. And so what I'm saying to you is that as you begin to look out on your life, this is challenging. This is not easy, acting. So what are the things that we can begin to do to harness our will. Number one, you've got to bring it out and look at it. You've got to take the power out of it. You've got to expose it to the truth. And the truth is that it has no power over you. So write down something you want to act on, but for some reason that you've been holding back and look at it. The next thing is, ask yourself the question, is it helping you to continue to put it off? If it's an asset for you to continue to, to procrastinate, then continue to do that. But if it's a liability for you, if it's causing you some mental and some emotional challenges or perhaps a financial problem, look at that. <coughs> Examine that for what it is. Next step, ask yourself, what's blocking you? What's preventing you from acting? Why don't you have the courage to handle that? Why won't you face that? What are you running away from? What kind of avoidance behavior are you engaged in? Next is, what is the worst thing that can happen when you take action? 
So I looked at that. And I said, what's the worst thing can happen when I tell him this? He can say, I don't like you. And he did. <laughs> now what happened? I experienced that. I looked at that. I saw that. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? I didn't die. <clears throat> My feelings were hurt a little bit. I lost some sleep about it. And sometimes I think about it when I drive past his house. But I'm still here. It's uncomfortable. But it's okay. It doesn't bother me anymore. I've gotten used to it now. So what is the worst thing that can happen? I want you to visualize that, experience that, feel the nervousness and the discomfort. And the more you run it in your mind, the less power that it will have. Next is, how will you feel after taking this action? I felt a sense of personal achievement when I face somebody that has been my mentor for years. And for years, there was something I wanted to tell him. And I didn't have the courage to tell him because it was always I was the student, he was the teacher. It was always I looked up to him and admired him and held him in high esteem. And I was always grateful and thankful for the impact that he had on my life. And I loved him so much. I didn't have the courage to say to him, Please, stop drinking so much. You're an alcoholic. You need help. I didn't have the courage because I was afraid that he might not like me. I was afraid that he might be hurt and crushed, that we would no longer be friends. I didn't want to jeopardize what we had. I loved him a great deal, and I didn't, I didn't know how this would affect our relationship. And I didn't even want him to know that I knew that he was an alcoholic. And so I was a coward. I was spineless. In the name of love, I did it to justify to myself to, to stop from helping somebody that I love from dying. I said, I love him so much, I just can't tell him this. I, I, I don't even know how he would handle it to know that I know that he's an alcoholic. And finally, after years, I developed the courage to face my teacher my mentor who has molded me, who looks at me now and wanted to do what I'm doing now and did not do it, came at a different time and it wasn't time for what he brought. And he's living through me. And I had to face this man who's been like a father to me and say, I gotta tell you something. You've got a problem. I love you very much. Please stop drinking. You're killing yourself. It's not just social. You do it every day. You need help. And whatever I can do to support you in that, I will. But please stop. And he looked at me, and I had no idea what, how he was going to handle that. And first there was like, I dare you. And we just looked at each other. And then I reached out to embrace him. And we've never, ever embraced men macho, never hugged before. I hugged him and he just stood there with his arms straight. He couldn't raise his arms to hug me back. And he was shocked. And after he got over the initial shock, when he could bring himself to speak, to maintain his composure, because he could never afford to let me, his student, see him vulnerable or admit that I was right. He said, I'll be seeing you. And I said, yes, sir. I said, tell your wife I'll be by the house to see, the, see y'all before I leave. And when he walked away, at first I was very depressed about it. And I said, well, maybe it wasn't my place to do this. And you know, when you act, you're going to have some second thoughts. And then I said, no, no, no. I did what I felt. I, I did it because I feel very strongly about this. And fortunately, he called me back a few weeks later and left word with the answering service. Leslie Brown, I just want to say thank you. And hung up. That was a good feeling. When we look out on our lives, you ask the question, what are you going to do? Look at, as you think about this that you know you need to handle, what are you going to do? 
and then write down three strong reasons on why you know you must take action. And be explicit and descriptive in your reasons because your reasons have power. Your reasons will drive you. When you have doubt, when your faith becomes weak, your reasons will fortify your faith. When you have an inner conversation, say, no, don't do that. Your reasons will become your rod and your staff to comfort you, to take you through those challenging moments. So write down your reasons. And what you will find, that when you decide to act, when you decide to take life on, and let me warn you, it can be painful, it will be uncomfortable, and that's where the growth is. When you're uncomfortable, when you're stretching out, when you're taking life by the collar, you're going to get thrown to the ground again and again and again. But when you have determination and you know that what you're doing is right, it gives you your life, it gives a special meaning and power to you, you will have some power from on high. You will discover some things about yourself that will begin to electrify your personality. You begin to discover some things about you that you don't know you've got when you put yourself in that type of challenging situation. Repeat after me, please. I can go into action, go into action. On, anything in my life. on anything in my life. Nothing is stopping me but me. Is me, but me. No, challenge no challenge in my life has any power over me. Power over me. Here's something that Howard Thurman wrote on the decision to act. He said, it's a wondrous thing that a decision to act releases energy in the personality. For days on end, a person may drift along without much energy, having no particular sense of direction and having no will to change. Then something happens to alter the pattern. It may be something very simple and inconsequential in itself, but it stabs awake it alarms, it disturbs. In a flash, one gets a vivid picture of oneself and it passes. The result is decision, sharp, definitive decision. And the wake of the decision, yes, even as a part of the decision itself, energy is released. The act of decision sweeps all before it and the life of the individual may be changed forever. When you decide to make decisions, to act, you begin to access power within you that will increase your self-esteem, that will increase and enhance your personal power, that, that puts you in charge of life. And life has a whole new meaning for you. There's a sense of personal freedom. Doesn't mean you're not going to have any struggles. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have any challenges. Doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer any defeats. No, 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 it doesn't mean that. But what it does mean, that you're putting yourself in the position to grow. You're putting yourself in line with your higher calling and your higher self. And that's what life is about. Would you, would you join me in this affirmation, please? Everybody stand, please. I'm standing up to life. I'm standing up to life. And the challenges in my life. I'm going to use all of me, all of my courage, my faith, determination, and any help and support that I can give anyone to realize their greatness. Together we can. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got what it takes.
one of the first things I want you to begin to do right now is to take a brave look at your life. Look at your life right now where it is. So let me ask you some questions. As you begin to look out on the future, look out on this year, let's take personal inventory. What has brought you here? As you begin to look at the things that took place this past year, did you get out of it what you wanted? Did you achieve the goals that you set out to achieve? What part of your life or what things did you do that you don't want to be a part of your life? Are there any people as you begin to look at your life and look at where you want to go and what you want to do, are there any people that might be some dead weight <laughs> that you need to think about unloading? <laughs> because what you have found through that relationship that it's more toxic than it is nourishing, it's more debilitating than it is empowering. And so now you've got to make a decision. See, many of us won't be able to move forward because we're not taking true inventory of our lives. As you begin to look at your emotional, your spiritual and intellectual development, how many books did you read? How many seminars did you attend? How many classes did you take to begin to develop yourself professionally, to improve your craft or your skill? How many new things did you learn? Just take some personal inventory, just thinking, just thinking, just thinking, beginning to know yourself. What are the things about your past that has influenced you right now? What's your philosophy of life? What are your beliefs, things that you feel very strongly about? What are some of the things that you have picked up along the way that you've been doing them for so long you think that they're you, that you need to begin to re-examine them and perhaps get them out of your life? See, a lot of things we're doing, we do unconsciously because we picked it up somewhere in life. A friend of mine out of Chicago named Rhea Steele, I was at her house to have dinner, and Rhea, who was born in Chicago, has a tremendous southern drawl. After I met her mother, I said, where did Rhea get her southern drawl from? She said, my sisters came up from Kentucky, and they used to be her babysitter. And she picked it up while in their presence. And Rhea still has that draw. What is it that you've picked up somewhere in life that maybe be, might be a liability to you? What fear, what beliefs that you're holding on to tenaciously that's no longer allowing your life to work? That's not enabling you to produce the results that you want to produce in your life. And you're still clinging to them. See, as we go into a new world, there's some old behaviors that just won't fit. What are the events? What are the circumstances? What are the people that have shaped you? Just thinking, just thinking. What are the things that you need to let go? Some things that have cost you pain, that's stifling your growth and development. What are those things? As you begin to look at your profession or your career, what is it that you need to do to begin to upgrade your skills or your knowledge? to continue for you to be competitive in the marketplace. As you begin to look at yourself and ask some of these questions, what is something that you're good at? Are you living your passion? Are you living your dream? What do you regard as your greatest personal achievement? What is the one thing that other people can do to make you most happy? Just think about these things. What would you do if you had one year to live and guaranteed success and anything you decided to do. What would that be? What would you do with your life if you had it to live over? Getting to know yourself. What is one value, one deep commitment from which you would never bulge? What is one cause that you would like to become involved in to make a difference on the planet? I work in the Cook County Jail in Chicago. It gives my life a great deal of joy and fulfillment. Have you found something like that in your life that you could enjoy doing, working with people? I have a friend that's working with physically handicapped people. She said it's been the most rewarding experience she's ever had. She used to be a constantly depressed individual, always feeling sorry for herself. It has changed her life. She's a grateful person. She's found something that she's lost herself in. What is your biggest setback, failure, or defeat of the past year? What is it about you if somebody really knew they wouldn't get into a relationship with you? <laughs> <laughs> now, 
Now, don't go tell it. <laughs> But once you acknowledge what that is, then start working on it and changing it. Change that. It's easy to blame the other person, but start taking ownership for where you are. Are you proud of how you have been living your life? Have you explored your natural talents, your gifts, by enthusiastically trying a variety of activities? Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of us have so much talent and abilities, we just put them back on the back burner, just left them aside someplace. Never did anything with them, never brought them out here. Used to do them extremely well in high school or college or just had a natural gift and never did anything with it. What are you sitting on? What gifts are you sitting on? Have you resigned yourself to a life feeling that nothing can be done to change your future or your circumstances? Have you been afraid to try something different because you're afraid of how people will react to you or what they will think? Those are some of the things that I suggest that you begin to answer yourself. Now, here are some things that I suggest that you begin to look at working on to develop your character. Some things that will give you some personal strength. Webster says character building activities. He says character, the pattern of behavior or personality found in an individual or group. Moral strength, self-discipline, fortitude. That's what's going to be required in order to begin to manifest your greatness. Now, looking at yourself, one of the things I'm suggesting you look at, what is it that you need to be in the process of doing more of or less of? Like being more direct. So I used to have a problem of not telling people what I actually thought because I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Saying no without feeling guilty. More focused. So I used to be the jack of all trades and master of none. Used to do a lot of things. One year I decided to do one thing well. I looked at all of my talents and I decided the strongest one, my ability as a speaker, that's the one I'm going to focus on. But I'm capable of doing a lot of other things. But only when I decided to focus that I begin to reap the rewards of my talent. And then after you do that, you can begin to expand and use the other talents that you have. Deciding to keep your word if you just decide I'm going to keep my word if I say something I'm going to do it regardless being more considerate more trusting more disciplined being less fearful being more adventurous find something that you can look at your life that you say hey I know I've got a problem in this area being late I need to take care of that. Procrastinating. I need to deal with that. Not taking care of business. Being seriously not serious. Creating an imbalance in my life where I'm spending more time looking at television or having social fun and not spending enough time working on me. See, most people, ladies and gentlemen, spend more time working on their jobs than they spend working on themselves. They work harder on their jobs than they work on themselves. And whatever we achieve in life, whatever we create, whatever we're able to manifest comes out of the human mind. Now, I want you to think about five things as if you had the courage to do them, it will give you a feeling of satisfaction and self-respect. Think of five things that if you had the courage to do those things, you would feel a tremendous feeling of satisfaction within and self-respect. Take the time to write those things down, whatever they might be to you. It might be in your personal life. It might be in your, your friendships, your family relationships. It might be in your business. I was negotiating with a friend of mine that I admire a great deal. And this person went back on their agreement. And I did not challenge them on it. Number one, because of my admiration for her. Number two, because I really wanted the business, and I think she sensed that. So I didn't want to seem too picky, and I was nervous about it. And I was cowardly, because I should have said, listen, that's not what we agreed to. I should have called her on that. But I didn't want to look bad, or to appear to be negative, or risk losing the business. Look at five things that if you had the courage to do those things that you would do those things 
A lot of people say, well, I've been like this all my life. I just can't change. I, this is the way I am. Dr. Harold Griswold, a psychologist and author of Direct Decision Therapy, said something. He says, when someone says, I can't change, some part of them wants to change, but the payoffs for his present behavior are greater than the payoffs for a changed behavior, or his fear of change is too great. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes courage to live your dreams. It takes courage to manifest your greatness. It takes courage to decide to live, to decide to bring out all of your talents and abilities, to decide to stretch out, to decide to take a chance. It takes courage to be happy, just to be you. I saw a friend who I hadn't seen for a long time. Her whole personality has changed. She was an extroverted, assertive person. But because her husband has a fragile ego, when she's around him, she cow down to him. She plays to him. She's very silent. She doesn't express herself, her feelings. And there are many things she wants to do. But before she even make a decision of what she wants to do, she checks. You know, how will he handle this? How will he see this? Will this be disruptive in our relationship? A lot of us readjust our behavior and we end up not being who we really are in deference to relationships, men and women. Looking at the word courage, Webster says, the attitude of facing and dealing with anything recognized as dangerous, difficult, or painful, instead of withdrawing from it. As you begin to look at where you want to go and take personal inventory, it's going to be very uncomfortable. That's why most people don't do it. It's very painful to admit your shortcomings, to admit your weaknesses. It's very painful to do that. It's much easier to withdraw from that and just ignore it. He goes on to say, the courage of one's convictions, the courage to do what one thinks is right. As you begin to look at yourself and look at where you want to go with your life, it's very important for you to ask yourself a question as you look at various areas of your life. Is what you are doing right now, is it giving you what you want? If it's not giving you what you want, it's going to take courage to decide to do something differently. It takes courage to enjoy yourself. What are some of the self-defeating behaviors that we become involved in that prevent most people from enjoying themselves? Some people develop the what's the use attitude. Why bother? Some people have the I really don't care. And they convince themselves that they don't care and they don't feel anything. And after a while, they really don't feel anything. Their lives are empty. Some people say, well, it's really not worth the hassle. Just too hard. It doesn't bother me anymore, the fact that I'm not living out my dream, the fact that I'm capable of doing more and I'm not doing it, the fact that I'm content but I'm not fulfilled, the fact that I'm not living my dream. Tom Rusk and Randy Reed in a book called I Want to Change But I Don't Know How said people go through life many times playing it safe. He says that's the secret hope that they say to themselves, if I never let myself feel too good, maybe I'll never get hurt too badly. A lot of people don't ever do the things they're capable of doing because they allow themselves to go alone with the crowd, following the crowd. Many people have things they want to do and, and they find themselves in relationships with people who are addicted to mediocrity and they allow their behavior to influence their behavior. Following the crowd. Many people don't do it because of the fact that they allow their lack of self-confidence to immobilize them. I remember when I wanted to go into business for years, that was an agonizing thought in my mind. I wouldn't try it because I didn't believe that I could make it. Of the five things that you would like to do if you had the courage to do, I want you to pick one thing. Pick one, and here's how to set it up for yourself that will help free you and get you unstuck. What is the worst thing that can happen if you do it? What's the worst thing that can happen? Let's say going into business for yourself, or changing careers, or getting a divorce. 
taking some kind of chance of something that you've always thought about doing, but you just haven't done it for whatever reason. What's the worst thing that can happen? Do the worst case scenario. Now, when you do the worst case scenario, you write those things down, the worst things that you fear would happen when you name your fears that put you in control. What are you afraid of? Name it, write it out so you can look at it, confront that fear. What is it? I'm afraid that things might work out. What else, Les? I, well, I've never been in business, okay? What else, Les? Um, well, I don't have all the help I need, okay? Good. What else, Les? Well, I don't have enough money, all right? Good. What else, Les? Well, I don't have a college degree. Uh-huh. What else? I'm not as good as those other guys that I've seen up there speaking, okay? What else? Well, that's all I can think of right now. Okay, good. <laughs> now, that takes you to the next step. What are the benefits? What are the benefits of your acting courageously, taking life on? Well, part of what happened was that I felt better within myself and I had a strong sense of self-respect. Going into business for myself, I made a lot of mistakes sometimes. I was down on myself. I felt stupid. I felt dumb because people who were in business said, why would you do something like that? Well, I didn't know. Boy, boy, were you really dumb. And I, I used to chime in with him, yes, I guess I was. <laughs> I didn't know any better. But the other thing is, I had to say to myself, but I did it. I did it. Even if I made a flop of it, I did it. I took the chance. I took the leap. What are the benefits of your acting courageously? Whatever it is that you've identified. Write the benefits down. And then focus on them. Focus on the benefits. Not on the liabilities, not on your fears. Focus on the benefits. That which you hold in consciousness tends to manifest itself. Think about how good you feel. Think about the level increased self-respect, the sense of self-worth that you'll feel. How good you'll feel getting up in the morning, looking yourself in the mirror because you're taking life on. The other thing is acknowledge your fears. And then go into action. This book is called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. That's it. See, I believe anybody who's ever done anything, who's ever taken a chance, doesn't mean that they are not afraid. Courageous does not mean being the absence of fear. I think that being courageous is willing to do it because that's what you feel and you're going to do it anyhow. Regardless, you're not going to be immobilized by your fears or your doubts. You admit, okay, I'm scared to death. Now, okay, what is it that I must choose to do? Go ahead and experience that fear, but don't let that fear immobilize you. In what you've done with your life thus far, is it giving you what you want? Is it giving you what you want? When you look toward the future, when you look at all that's going on out here, is there some place within yourself you say, hey, I know I need to be out there in that arena. I know I can do more than what I've been doing. I know there's some great music that I have within me that I haven't brought out here yet. Is that something that you begin to look at within yourself? So I used to do that and I used to go to big rallies and see guys up speaking when I wasn't courageous enough to go out there and say, hey, uh, my name is Les Brown, the motivator, Mamie Brown's boy, I want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would never do that. I just was, I'd just be back there looking at him and wanted to get the autograph and would say, can I, can I meet you, Mr. Mr. Wadley, or Miss, can I meet Mr. Zig Ziglar? Please tell him, um, who are you? Uh, oh, Les Brown. Les Brown. <laughs> <laughs> because I felt within myself I was a nobody. So who am I to go talk to these guys and go get their autographs? I like to do what you do. <laughs> <laughs> See, I say if you look at your life and if, and if you're not getting what you want, you owe it to yourself to do something differently. You owe, if you're on a job, 85% they say of Americans go to jobs that they're unhappy. If you're doing something eight hours a day that you don't like, it's not giving you what you want, it's not giving you a strong feeling of satisfaction and fulfillment, you're miserable, you hate to go there, you're depressed just thinking about it. You're saying, the, thank God it's Friday song every week. 
It's giving you headaches just thinking about it on Sunday afternoon after the football game goes off. If that's what it is, you owe it to yourself to start strategically working to change directions. See, but you know what most people will do? Most people will resist change. Most people will fight change as if change would be worse than what they're experiencing. See, they know this. They're familiar with this. Most people will not challenge the unknown. They won't just step out there. See, they, well, see, there are certain things that's got to be in place. They've got to see it all together. And life isn't like that. That's not how you grow. So as you look at your life, you're saying, I'm not getting what I want. As you begin to look toward the future, begin to know that whatever it takes for you to create that, you've got that in you. You've got that. You've got genius in you. You've got goodness in you. You've got creativeness in you. If you decide to take the initiative to change the current quality of your life, I say to you that you will find that the universe is on your side, that life is on your side. Now, will it be turbulent? Yes. Will it be easy? No, no. Will you have some opposition? Yes. Will I make a lot of mistakes? Yes. Will I get hurt? Yes. <laughs> yes. See, a lot of people won't try anything different in life because they don't want to get hurt. Let me tell you something. It's too much pain to duck. Pain is everywhere. You can hide under here. It will come where you are. I'm, really, if I go back here, pain will come. Hey, Les, come on out. It will come. It's everywhere. Victor Frankl calls it unavoidable suffering. You can't duck it. But most people spend their life not wanting to deal with the pain of rejection, the pain of defeat, the pain of being disappointed, the pain of losing, the pain of failure, the pain of being criticized, the pain of not being liked, the pain, the pain, the pain. That's called life. Life is full of pain. It's everywhere. But guess what? There's no gain without pain. Now, if you're going to hurt anyhow, <laughs> get some yardage out of it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's the pain of regret that you experience. If I had it to do over again, that's a pain. Don't you know that? Some, when you know, I was in a seminar once and this lady stood up. If I had my life to live over again, she talked about all of the things that she would do. And you can feel the pain of regret in her voice. The pain of regret. She still experienced pain. She was trying not to experience the pain of defeat, the pain of disappointment, the pain of loss, the pain of lack of support. And she still experienced pain. It was right there. We can't get around it. Most people are governed by their habits, their fears, and the opinions of others. A lot of people never try anything differently because they have been convinced by people in their lives that they value that they can't do it. They're living within the context of the opinions that other people have of them, the low expectations. Many people doubt themselves because when they thought about doing something at some critical point in their lives, somebody they respected and honored, somebody they believed in, somebody that they loved, someone they trusted said, you can't do that. And they accepted that. That's why I didn't go off to college. I had an instructor that I believed who said, you're not college material, Mr. Brown. You're not as smart as your brother Wesley or your sister Margaret Ann. You're not college material. Why don't you try and get you a job at the post office? Try and do something with your hand. Or go down to the Miami City Sanitation Department and see can you get a job there. Or why don't you try and go into the Army? I took that test, Mr. Tellers, already. And what happened? I failed. I told you. <laughs> Anybody fail the Army test, you're really in trouble. <laughs> so I went down to the Sanitation Department to try and get a job. 
because that's what I believe was possible for me. As you look at your life, ask yourself the question, what would your life be like? What would your life look like if you decided not to care what people thought of you? What would your life be like if you decided to give up some of your fears? What would your life be like if you decided to become courageous? What would your life be like? If you decided to act on your dream, if you did what you felt in your heart, you know what courageous means? Tom Ruskin and Randy Reed said, they said that courage comes from a French word which means of the heart. That, how does it feel to you? He says that courage, you know, it takes courage to, to live. He says most people go through life not allowing themselves to step out because they don't want to let go. They don't want to be blown around. They don't want to be moved. The courage to face life's whirling wind of contradictions. The courage to love yourself. The courage to love. For years, I was afraid to love. The courage to take a chance. The courage to be who you are. He says, courage isn't for somebody else, for medals, applause, or moral debts. Courage is what at that moment feels most right for you. Not just situational ethics, but what feels right in your heart. The word of the heart. What feels right in your heart. One great philosopher says, cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. What does that mean? The valiant people aren't afraid? No, no, no. It means that they experience that fear and they move forward. They move forward anyhow. Many people are dead now. Many people are allowing their dreams to die. Many people are allowing their ideas to lie dormant and collect dust. Many people have all this talent and ability that they are allowing to be in, buried inside of them that they will take with them to their graves because they didn't have the courage to be who they are. And I say as you begin to look toward the future and manifesting your greatness, it's going to take everything in you, everything in you, that your life deserves the concentrated effort to begin to look at how is it that I can express more of me how is it that I can bring my ideas out here now? How is it? And start living with a sense of urgency because you're here today. You're gone today. Life is unpredictable. It's uncertain. There are no guarantees. No guarantees out here at all. So holding back, what are you waiting on? Ask yourself, what's the benefit of your waiting? What's the benefit of your not living your dream? What's the benefit of not listening to yourself? Oh, please. Listen to yourself. You know the feelings. If you start listening to the feelings in your heart, and I'm doing it now more every day, I find that my feelings, I can trust them. And I say to you that as you look toward the future, you look at life on a daily basis. If there's something that you have been given, if you've heard something within yourself that you know that, that what you're doing now doesn't fit for you, it doesn't work for you, it's not giving you what you want, and there's something else that you want to do, don't allow that inner doubt in you to talk you out of it, to build a case on why you can't have it, to tell you why you're not good enough. You ignore that inner voice and all of the external voices. Don't judge the possibilities for what you can do based upon the circumstances because the circumstances won't determine who you are. Don't determine what you're able to do based upon your resources. Don't determine what's possible for you based upon where your life is right now. Where your life is right now is not you. That's just what it is right now. But the possibilities for you are unlimited. If you're in a rebuilding process, it's unlimited. If you're coming back from adversity and devastation, it's unlimited of what you can do. That's the capacity of human beings. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter how many flops you've had. Doesn't matter how much money you've lost. In fact, I see it only as an investment of what you learn from life, not losses, but investments of what's possible for you. And I say to you that once you start listening to yourself and as you begin to act on your dream, as you start 
just trying to find your way, doing what you can, what you have, you will start seeing things opening up for you. You'll start attracting people. You say, where did it come from? Things will start coming together, clicking for you. You say, whoa, you start brainstorming. Ideas will come out of nowhere as you focus on it. The key to it is to begin to focus on what it is you want to do. Why, Les? Why is that important? Because as you focus on that which you want to do, that which we focus on, that which we give our energy to, it will begin to multiply. It will begin to expand. It will begin to develop your consciousness. And out of that comes your greatness. Out of that comes a commitment. Out of that comes a passion for life. Out of that comes a special power that you have in you that you haven't even called on yet. See, the, the powers that we have will never reveal themselves if we don't challenge them. If we don't put ourselves in a position where we have to use them. So one of the most important things is reading a book that's a really interesting book called Instant Millionaire. And the guy said, put yourself in a position where you can't retreat. Where it's do or die, sink or swim. Here's what you'll find out. You'll develop incredible swimming skills. <laughs> or swallow half the pool of life. <laughs> you'll find yourself stroking unlike you've ever seen before. Through the inspiration of desperation, you'll become more creative than ever before. So what is it? How do we handle that whole piece? Throw your whole self into it. See, most people go at it tentatively. They don't give all their stuff. They don't concentrate. They don't put everything they've got in them. One guy wrote a book called All You Can Do Is All You Can Do. And all you can do is enough. But he said, make sure you do all you can do. And if we're honest this evening, we know that we haven't done all we can do. So as we look at the future, we can decide that from this day forward, as I look at my personal relationships, if I look at my professional relationships, if I look at my family relationships, if I look at all the dimensions of my life, looking at myself mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, I'm going to do all I can do to develop me, to bring my talent out here, to make a contribution to life. I don't know what you want to do. Here's what I know about you. Because you've got greatness within you. As you look toward the future and developing your greatness, begin to know that your life is worth the effort. Is it easy? No. Is it worth it? Yes. Yes, your life is worth it. And so it is. <coughs> this is Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy, Leslie Calvin Brown, saying it's been a plum pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. Thank you all here. approval that's a very challenging area now why is that challenging ladies and gentlemen that's where most people get stuck an area of self-approval that's a stage that a lot of people get there and they never move out of that area why well for a variety of reasons many things can contribute to our not approving our dreams our not feeling good enough a lot of things can contribute to that Many of us never live up to our potential or don't approve ourselves because we never had anybody to believe in us. Looking at some of the things that keep us from approving ourselves, that we've all done some things that we don't feel good about. Things that if we had to do those things over again, we would not do those things. Or we would do things differently. So part of what we must do in order to begin to move into your greatness, you got to remove a major energy block. And that is dealing with the issue of forgiveness. People that have hurt you, someone who's done you wrong, make a list and things that you have done that you, you feel bad about, that you regret, make a list. You know, maybe a time when you weren't a good father or a good mother or a good brother or sister or you, you were a bad child or you didn't do a good job or you lied or you were dishonest or you stole. No one knows this but you, or something you feel good about, so you know, there's a real dog in me to do that. 
something you just really regret. So we make a list of all those things. All of us have some of that. Somebody say there is some good in the worst of us and some bad in the best of us. So none of us escape. Now here's something I want you to do. I want you to become involved in an active process to get some clutter out of your life. So if there's any area in your life that you need to clean up, start working on it. I'm going home tonight to clean my closets. Any of you got any cluttered closets? Oh, raise your hand, please. Good. Let's go home. Let that be our task this week. See, the first law of the universe is order. Go home and clean the closet out. Get the clutter out. Start letting some of this junk go to make some room for something else. Do that with people. There's some people who's cluttering up your life. They serve no purpose whatsoever. They're just holding and occupying the space that somebody useful, positive, nurturing, and contributing could be holding that space. You don't even have time to look to see what else is out there because you all have all of these people surrounding you that's not in enabling you to grow. So look at what is it I need to get out of my life and just start cleaning this stuff out. Getting the drawers together, your dresser drawer, just getting stuff together, just get them together. Maybe your, your car, I gotta clean my car too. Got a lot of stuff in there, I live in my car, you know? Can't put anything in my trunk. I got all kinds of little things back there. Two of my children back there in the trunk, you know? <laughs> Everything, stuff everywhere. So I just say, I say, hey, let me just get this together. See, whatever you have in your environment is a reflection of your consciousness. So you got all that chaos there. That represents some disorganized, cluttered section of your mind. So let's get all that out of there, all right? Work to get that out, clean that up. Anybody that you feel very strongly about, have some negative feelings about, let's look at some good reasons to forgive them. Number one. You must try and see th what has happened or see things from that other person's point of view. Let's look at it from their point of view. That's, that's one area. That's number one. Then number two, holding a grudge hurts you. It doesn't hurt them. So just for good health and peace of mind, let it go. Any feeling of resentment or anger or hatred is called to me the load of bitterness within. Every thought that we entertain produces a chemical in our brain that impacts the body's immune system. And besides, this person you're hating, they probably are not even aware of it. If someplace having a good time, <laughs> don't even know you're really hating them. You've turned up the steam, gone from dislike to hate, intense hate. And here you are killing yourself, making yourself vulnerable to various types of illnesses, putting yourself in bad health. And I say that person is not worth your sacrificing your health or one minute of peace of mind. One minute of anger robs you of 60 seconds of happiness. So decide it doesn't matter. Let it go and experience the dignity and the magnanimous sense of character of being big enough to move on and get on with your life. Letting it go so you can grow. Next step. Lack of self-acceptance. How does it show up? How does it manifest itself? See, we, all of us have greatness within us. But when you don't come to grips with your greatness and you don't work to develop it, if you're not seeking it out, if you're not finding where it is, if you're not trying to locate it, if you're not experimenting with your life to try and find out what fits for you, I'm saying that you're positioning yourself to be a miserable person, an unfulfilled person. How else do we do it? Procrastination. We just put things off over and over and over again. Why? Because we haven't accepted it. We don't feel deserving. We don't feel that we're good enough. So we sabotage ourselves by not ever taking care of business. We get real busy doing a lot of things where we don't have any time. But I'll never forget Og Mandino in the book called University of Success. He said, many of us never, ever discover our greatness because we become sidetracked by secondary activity. We start doing so many things, we just give our time away until we don't have any time for ourselves or any time to do the things that we want to do. And every time you put it off and move it back, oh, I'll do it one day, oh, yeah, I'm going to get to it. I'm saying to you that one day you look around and there goes a year, there goes two years, there goes three years. So is there something you want to do? Do it now. Do it right now. 
Don't put it off. Start right now where you are. There will never be a perfect ideal time. Whatever you have going for you right now, that's enough. Work on that idea. Work on it. Work on it. Work on it. Another way in which it shows up, and that is that because of the relationships we form, people we have around us, thinking about two guys, Larry Littles. He went to Bethune-Cookman College. He was a football player at Booker T. Washington High School, where I graduated from. Larry ended up playing for the Miami Dolphins, became an all-star offensive guard. Great guy. Larry really wasn't the most talented guy in that position at Booker T. Washington High School. It was a guy named Willie Covington that was far more talented. He was stronger physically. He was faster. But Willie Covington never, ever made it out of high school. Why, Les? He started running with the wrong crowd. Big Cub is what we called him. Started running with the wrong crowd, and those people led him to the penitentiary and ultimately to a premature death. Got the word a few months ago he was shot and killed in Liberty City on 62nd Street where I was born on the floor, my twin brother and me. Willie Covington had great talent, great potential, running with the wrong crowd. Watch out with the relationships you have. What kind of person are you becoming because of the relationships that you have right now? Do those people contribute to you? Do they help you grow and develop yourself? What kind of person are you becoming? People who have not accepted greatness for themselves, these people don't study, ladies and gentlemen. These people don't study. They don't have time for personal growth and development. They don't have time to work on their minds. No, they don't have time for that. Too busy for that. People can affect us. Our peers can affect us. Our environment can affect us just working consciously to overcome the poverty consciousness that I was raised in. The feeling constantly of saying, Les Brown, you deserve this. There's no need for you to be afraid. It's not too good to be true. It's true because you've earned it, the old-fashioned way you have worked for it. But every once in a while, it comes up when I least expect it. My heart starts beating fast, and I start questioning myself and doubting myself, and I have to catch myself. You've got to be consciously conscious. So let's look at how we can begin to evaluate our self-esteem, our self-approval. Number one. To determine the height of your self-approval, it's important that you evaluate yourself because you know you quite well, but it's almost impossible to do it totally by yourself. You must get some caring feedback. Find somebody close enough to you that has observed you or been around you that you value their opinion and ask them how do they see you, how do they rate you in terms of your self-esteem, and then compare what you have with what they say. See, there are things many times that people can see in us that we can't see because it's a blind spot. If I were to be talking to you and my breath is offensive and you don't tell me, and then I go around, not only do you know, everybody else around here know. <laughs> and then when I'm walking toward people, they say, oh, Les, I'll be right back. You know? <laughs> and I don't know why people say, well, Les, we, we thought you, we wanted you to come to the party, but you can't come. <laughs> Now, all you have to do is just tell me, Celeste, you need to goggle with some ammonia or something, you know? <laughs> have you ever smelled someone's breath and didn't tell them, raise your hand if you don't? don't. So, so we all have those blind spots. We have those areas of our lives that we need to get some caring feedback. We need some coaching. We need someone to let us know that. And now, why don't people just volunteer that? One, they don't want to hurt your feelings. Uh, one, they don't want to embarrass you. But see, there are some people you know, you know they don't want to hear it. They're going to argue with you. They're going to become defensive. If you're one of those people, just decide to shut up and listen. Next thing is a good barometer to check out how you feel about yourself is how well you handle compliments. When someone pays you a compliment, can you handle it well? Lady was coming down the hall, and lady said, Oh, what a beautiful dress you have. Oh, it's nothing. I caught it on sale. Nothing. <laughs> you know, I didn't ask you, did you get that on sale? I just said, it's a beautiful dress. Can you handle compliments well? That's a good barometer about your self-esteem. Can you handle criticism well? Can you give criticism? Next thing is, what are your expectations? What do you expect to get from life? What do you expect to get from your business? What do you expect to get from your relationships? What is your ideal day? What is it that you expect from this experience, this trip, this journey that you're involved in? People that, that have a strong sense of self-approval 
They have high expectations for themselves and from life and from others. See, a lot of people don't expect much from life. So they don't shoot for much. They're not preparing for much. A lot of people are just showing up in life. A lot of people just get up in the morning and they go through the day, they go to the job just to pull a check down watching the clock coming in. So you want to be a different kind of person as you forward your life. You want to get something out of this. If you're going to do it, it's worth your time, your energy. You've got some expectations from this. I do not let people waste my time. Someone want to meet with, meet with me, excuse me, what is this dealing with? I want to get to the bottom line. Because if it does not measure up to my expectations, I'm not going to invest my time. I don't have the luxury to waste time. I'm expecting some great things from life. And so I have to spend some time working on myself and developing myself. So examine your expectations versus your wishes. Some people wish they could do better. But some people expect to do better. Where are you on that? Next thing, let's look at what are the things we can do to increase our self-approval, our self-appreciation, our self-acceptance. Here's number one, love yourself. Make caring for you the highest priority in your life. Take care of you. Look out for what truly satisfies you. We're not taught to love ourselves. We're not taught to look out for ourselves. We're not taught to take care of ourselves, to become sensitive to our wants, to our needs, our, our desires. So make a conscious effort. Make you number one priority, your peace of mind. Your health is more important than your family and any and everybody because if you don't have peace of mind, if you don't have your health, you can't serve anybody. Don't neglect yourself. A lot of us, and particularly ladies, have been groomed to be sacrificial lambs, putting their dreams on the back burner in deference to their children's dreams or their husband's dreams or their family's dreams and forget about themselves. And then become resentful and angry and bitter. So start taking care of yourself, looking out for you. Develop a health plan. Your health is all you got. So start taking care of you, eating nutritious meals, willing to exercise your body, taking care of this body, loving yourself. So do some good stuff for yourself on purpose. Take some time out for you. I have some good things I do for me. One of the things I enjoy that I do, I take spiritual baths. My assistant introduced me to someone called Sister Sarah who gave me my first spiritual bath. I never heard of this before. She told me about it and I said, come on, come on, Regina, spiritual bath. And um, Sue, my secretary's husband named Larry, he said, a spiritual bath for $50, I'll give you a spiritual shower. <laughs> but I play soft music. I've taped some of my favorite music. I play, I burn a candle and I have different oils that I put in the tub of hot water and I have flowers that I picked and I put, I like, you know, I saw coming to America, you know, Eddie Murphy. <laughs> you know, they were sprinkling little flowers on the ground. Right now. <laughs> so it gives me a feeling of royalty. So I, I sprinkle these flowers in the water and I soak. I like doing that and I soak and sometimes I read or just relax and enjoy the music and just cool out. That's my time for me. Put the answering service on, I just block out some time for me. I'm into meditation. I've been working and, and exercising now, just doing some things for me, taking care of myself mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and physically. You can't develop and manifest your greatness. You can't be a high achiever if you don't feel good. You don't take care of yourself. So I'm taking care of me. And then you know what? It takes the edge off your life. It helps you to manage things rather than allowing them to manage you. Gives you more personal power to deal with stuff. Take care of you. Now here's something else I suggest for you. Become aware of what your needs are and develop compassion towards yourself despite your human defects. Develop compassion for yourself despite your human defects. You will never be perfect. Hello. You will never be perfect. You're human. You've made a lot of mistakes. 
You've done a lot of dumb, stupid things. Guess what? You're not through yet. <laughs> You're going to do some more. Hurry up and get it over with. <laughs> it's all right. You've got to learn to be gentle with yourself. Make it all right. What you don't know, mistakes that you make. It's okay. Handle it. Learn from the experience. Decide that you are going to whatever you become involved in to be up front, to be true to yourself. Are you getting what you need out of it? And be up front with people and tell them what you need from them. Don't assume that they know. Don't say, I thought you knew. No, tell people up front. Here's what I need from this in order for this to work for me. Be up front with your stuff. Tell them up front so they're not surprised later on. So your feelings aren't hurt later on. See, if they tell you up front they can't do it, now you know you can keep on stepping. But tell people up front, here's what I want. In order for me to play this game with you, if we're going to dance, this is what I got to get out of it. See, if you don't take care of your needs, Guess what? You will always have that nagging song in the back of your mind say, well, when do I get mine? When am I going to start enjoying this? Are we going to have a good time together? Do I get any utils out of this at all? You're going to start asking that question. Everybody's happy and having a good time, but you? They say, well, we thought you were happy. How could you think that? Well, you weren't saying anything. Well, I'm saying something now. Hope you got that. See, we're taught to be quiet and not speak up for ourselves and not to be selfish. If you don't take care of you, who do you think is going to take care of you? Who's going to look out for you better than you will? No one. No one's going to do that. You got a business? No one's going to take care of your business better than you. Nobody. Nobody. Anything you want to do in life, you've got to take ownership of it and say, hey, I'm going to make this happen. Be willing to venture out and do something that you have fantasized about doing. And you know you probably won't be good at it, but do it anyhow. Case in point, I have always wanted to sing. I've always wanted to do that. I'm going to sing a song. If I don't do nothing but just a few lines, chances are, you know. <laughs> I might not be a Luther Vandroff, you know, <laughs> or an Andy Williams, you know, but it might be a little Perry Como up in there, a little Mathis and Nat King Cole. <laughs> Next thing is avoid people and situations that upset you. Hello? <laughs> See, there are some people that know just how to push your button. They know just what to say. So, you know what? I don't even deal with them. I just avoid, excuse me. Hey, hey um, I want to talk about something. I, I understand, but excuse me. I'll, I'll be right back. <laughs> now, you might call that cowardly, but I'm not going to expend any energy arguing with anybody. Life is too short, ladies and gentlemen, and unpredictable. I don't want to spend my time arguing with anybody, so I avoid situations that will get me upset. I don't argue with people. I avoid things. I don't look at movies that, that frighten me. Last fright movie I saw was The Exorcist. I never saw another one after that. I never forget going home. At that time I was married and I was blowing the horn, going up into the driveway. I said, open the door. <laughs> I pull up, open the door to get out. And I said, oh Lord, they got me. I started blowing the horn. My wife said, unfasten your seatbelt, fool. I said, oh, all right. <laughs> that movie scared me out of my wits. So I don't look at scary movies. I'm one of the people in a scary movie like this. Tell me, tell me what's happening now. Tell me what's happening. I threw popcorn all over everybody. And that girl was spitting on those people. I don't do that. No, 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 no. No, so I, I slept in the house with lights on all over the house for two weeks. I was embarrassed. But your children said, Daddy, turn the lights off. No. So I don't do, I just avoid things. I go see comedies. I love Danny DeVito and Steve Martin. I like things that make me laugh, make me feel good, like the little boy in me. Life is just 
to serious. Here's something else that can help to increase your self-esteem. Draw the line, ladies and gentlemen. There are certain things that we just go through life just taking, and at some point, you just got to draw the line and just say, enough is enough. You got to do that with yourself. Just draw the line. You know, there, see, when I, how I manage my, my food choices, I get on scale every day. If I get to a certain level, that's a crisis level. I just get down and start doing setups right there. Look at Hey, right away. <laughs> if, I, if my income dropped to a certain level, I go crazy. I start working like, you see this callus on my ear? You see that callus right there? <laughs> that's how that callus got there. You know, my income dropped. And I made 200 calls a day as punishment. Don't you ever let this happen again. Because I'll never, never, never be broke again. So you got to draw a line. You just got to draw. There's certain things that you just don't permit. If you got negative people in your life, just one. So look here. I was talking to someone I loved very much, had a just dynamic relationship with us. Look here. I can't grow from that. If you're persistent in saying those kind of things to me, I'm saying to you right now, I won't tolerate that. And I will terminate this because I'm not going to expose myself to this type of humiliation. I don't like that. I don't like getting called in names and putting each other down. I don't like that. Come back to me, I'm sorry. No, that won't get it. So you put a nail in a hole, you make that impression, you pull a nail out, that mark is still there. That's not for God. We can't extract that from the record. So don't, don't say that to me. So we were talking about something else. Person said it again, boom, you're a loser. Very good. And you are too, because you just lost a very good friend. I don't choose to be around you anymore. And that was it. I said, that's cool. Maybe it is. But I get people out of my life that aren't good for me. One negative stroke is 16 times more powerful than a positive stroke. And if you have people around you who are not sensitive to who you are, and the people that can hurt you the most, ladies and gentlemen, are the people that you love, that you love. They're the ones that you're vulnerable to. They're the ones that can get to you. And if they're insensitive, I don't care who they are, See, if you don't draw the line with people, if you just let them run rampant in your life and you let things happen to you that you don't feel good about, if you continue to allow it to happen, you won't feel good about yourself. Your image of yourself will erode. So you've got to draw the line in the conditions that you find yourself in. Here's a jarring question. Why are no hells preferable to strange heavens? Why would people live in a known hell? Why do people just go to a job where they're miserable day in and day out? Why do people stay together and they're miserable, sleeping in separate rooms, or arguing, or the only thing they have in common is paying the bills? Don't talk, don't communicate, don't share anything together. Day in and day out, as short and unpredictable that life is, being mean to each other. Why do people do that? Known hells are preferable to strange heavens because it's familiar. See, life is rough, ladies and gentlemen. It's rough and it's scary. It's scary growing. It's scary taking a chance. It's scary acting on your intuition, on your guts. It's scary. It's frightening. There are people that are tolerating things right now, and they're immobilized by fear. They can see the hammer coming, and they're afraid to even move because it's scary. Federal White said something. To go against the dominant thinking of your family, friends, and those people you associate with every day is perhaps the most difficult act of courage you will ever perform. See, when you start growing, when you start changing the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you act, 
the way you respond to things, the way you use your time, when you start saying, no, I can't do that, why? You, you're too busy, you don't have the time. No, I have my own agenda. I got something that I'm doing. Not lying to try and get out of it. Just say, no, I'm busy doing something that I want to do. Or, I don't want to do that. And I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm not mad. Not upset about it. I just don't want to do it. Why? Well, I don't have to give you any reasons why. I don't want to do it. But listen, thank you so much for asking me. Take it easy here. Hey, I thought you were all right. Is that right? Oh, boy. <laughs> Ask me, do I care about that? See, if people can put you on a guilt trip, they will. And use you and abuse you over and over and over again. You got to draw the line. You have to draw the line on them. Don't go through life feeling like you're powerless. Victims are people that are powerless. You're not powerless. You are powerful. You direct the power in your life. Whatever your life is right now, it is a duplication of your consciousness. It's a result of how you have decided to use your power. That's all it is. That's not who you are. That's just a perverted use of your power that you aren't satisfied with. And you've got the power to change that. Wherever you are, how, I don't know. But I know you've got the power to do that. But you don't know what has happened to me. It really doesn't matter what has happened to you. See, the only thing that really matters is what are you going to do about it? That's all that matters. That's all that matters. You can allow it to destroy you or you can allow it to build you up. John Powell in a book called Why I'm Afraid to Tell You Who I Am and he went to get a newspaper. Guy was very discourteous to him. He was very courteous to the guy. The guy who was with him said, why would you be as courteous to this guy as you were considering how rude he was to you? He said, I'm not going to allow that man to determine how I'm going to act. That thing's just going to happen to you in life, ladies and gentlemen. Make it okay. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. I cannot change the fact that when I asked my son to go, that I will no longer take care of him, that he became angry and perhaps hate my guts. To change the things that I can. I can change how I respond to it. I can become upset, nervous, tense about it, weak about it, or I can say, it's okay. He who cares less wins. You got to make it okay. Become comfortable with it. What's the next thing? Learn something new and tackle it in a spirit of adventure and love. Somebody said that we are not stricken by the things we do, but we're stricken by the things that we don't do. The songs that have not been sung, the poems that we have not written, the work that we have not done, the ideas that we have not developed, the dreams that we have not acted on. That's what can stricken you. That's what can block your power. That's what can rob you of your peace, of your satisfaction, of your self-respect, of the special joy that you can get out of life, of special achievement. See, one of the things that contributes to, to high self-acceptance or self-approval is self-achievement. When you achieve something, when you've done something, and you can stand back and look at it and say, I, I did this. What if it doesn't work out? You can stand back and look at it and say, I tried it. I went up in there. I went with it. Didn't work out. No, no, I, no but I, I value the experience. I love just the experience of doing it. I love that. So that's why I said, wait a minute. I've been fantasizing about singing. <laughs> so I'm going to do this. Who says that at, when I first stand up, I got to sound like Pavarotti? What's the guy's name? <laughs> I don't have to sound like him. I sound like Les. That's right, Mamie Brown's boy. <laughs> see, see, you've got to look at you and look at your life and find something that you can tackle 
and do it with love, only that which you love, only that which you love. Let me tell you something. When you do that, you're doing it in a spirit of love. Just love it. Make, can you, can you tell I love this? <laughs> I love it. See, I know that there's greatness in you. I know that there's something in you. Everybody has something. I don't know what it is, but you know it's something. You know it's something in you that you want to do. Everybody's got some ideas. I say to you that as you focus on something, as you go into action, as you hold that thought in consciousness persistently, you begin to develop the consciousness to manifest and create all kinds of things. You will begin to realize powers and abilities you have. You will realize you have miracle working power in you. That, that when you move, that when you walk, folk will see you when you come in the room and say, I don't know what it is, but there's something different about you. There's something about the way you look. It's, it's a glow about what is it? Huh? What, what, are you, what are you doing now? Um, I'm just being who I am. I'm, I'm just living out my greatness. I'm, I'm approving myself and giving myself permission to pursue my dream. Ladies and gentlemen, pursue your dream. Pursue your greatness. It's there. I know it's there. I'm waiting on you to come on out here and join me. This is Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy, Leslie Calvin Brown, saying it's been a plum-pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. Thank you all here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Commitment shows up in your life through action. You can tell people who are committed and those people who don't feel worthy. The people that are committed are busy doing it. The people that don't feel worthy are, the, are like a guy I talked to last night who told me, hey, I sure like to do what you're doing. However, I just don't want the responsibility. The company I work for, they're taking good care of me. I say, let me tell you something. Once you increase your sense of worthiness, you won't even be able to open your mouth saying that somebody is taking care of you. You want to take care of yourself. But see, because he doesn't feel worthy, he's intelligent. 17 years for a major corporation. They've spent thousands of dollars training him. He knows he has the book knowledge. But his attitude is, his vision of himself, his sense of deservingness says, you can't have that. So he will fabricate all kinds of excuses on why he can't have it. Robert Anthony said something. Robert Anthony said that you can only have two things in life, reasons or results. Notice, reasons don't count. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Folks will always point out reasons on why they are not living their dream, on why they are not manifesting their greatness. They will always be able to point those things out, but none of those things count. The only thing that counts are results, and results don't lie, ladies and gentlemen. They tell it all. Judge a tree by the fruit that it bears, not the ones that it might talk about, not the ones that it might wish for or think about or firm about, but the fruit that it actually bears. So let us look. I think that all of us are, are committed, but I think that some of us are producing results in our lives that that level of commitment brings that we particularly don't like or find distasteful. I don't think that as a participant in life, you cannot be committed. You're either committed to mediocrity or you're committed to greatness. You're either committed to being productive or you're committed to being non-productive. You're committed to being happy or you're committed to being unhappy. See, whatever you're doing, however you spend your time, that tells you who you are. So think about what it is you like to create in your life experience. Once I look at how you commit your time, once I do an evaluation on how you spend your time, I can tell you exactly what you're committed to. People that say they have dreams or want to open a business or want to do something differently than what they're now doing. They don't like their jobs. They're unhappy. They're unfulfilled. People who say they want to improve their income level. Look at how they spend their time. How they spend their time, the commitment of their time, how they use that, that will really tell the truth. 
People who said, I'd like to do better, but you don't find them in vocational or, or technical schools upgrading their skills and their knowledge, how they spend their time, that will tell you what's going on. People who say they want to normalize their weight, they want to be healthy, but every time you see them, they're eating. That will tell you that they're committed to being obese for the rest of their lives. People tell you they want to stop smoking and they're lighting up at that time. <laughs> Folk that say, I want to stop drinking, and every time you're in their face, they're reeking with alcohol. That will tell you what's going on. Don't have to listen to what they say. Just watch what they do. Commitment shows up in your life in what you do. On the other hand, you can make the commitment to your life that you don't like the results that you have and that you're going to do something about it. See, that power is available to all of us. People who look at life and decide, I want something different for myself. Carol Hatfield, Carol lives in Detroit, single mother, decided that she wanted to go into her own business, did not have enough money to do it. She wanted to have a health food store. She sold her car and used the money to start in a little storefront, a little hole in the wall. She rode to work on a bicycle. And then when she got enough money, she, she bought a motor scooter and did that for a long time. She's now a very successful person. She now has three health food stores. She said it was hard, it's a struggle, Les. She said, but I did it. She said, I made the commitment to do it, and I did it. Why is it that people are frightened by commitment? Because when you say the word commitment, that intimidates a lot of people. Why? Because it means you have to deliver. See, most people, you ask them, hey, look here, I'd like for you to do this. They'll say, I'll try. I'll try means that is my escape clause. When I don't come through, it's really a polite no. I don't have the courage to tell you no, so I'll tell you I'll try. Hey, look here, I need you to come to this meeting. I'll try. I say, what do you mean? You're going to lean toward the meeting? Try and sit down. You either do or you don't. Try and take this pencil out of my hand. You either do or you don't. There's no such thing as try. So most people like to use that language. They don't want to commit themselves because commitment means, among many things, no excuse is acceptable. That's what it means. No excuse that if you decided that you're going to do this, if it becomes hard, then do it hard. If it's difficult, so what? If it's inconvenient, so what? See, a lot of people made a commitment to come here tonight, but they looked outside and said, it's raining. <laughs> the temperature dropped. It's cold outside. And they decide to give up on their commitment. And that's how people do about their dreams. They don't honor their commitment to themselves. Let me tell you what happens when you, when you don't keep your commitment. Number one, it begins to deplete your, your self-esteem and it erodes your self-image. It weakens your faith in yourself. You don't feel good when you don't keep your commitments. The other thing is that you begin to develop weak relationships with people. People begin to realize they can't depend upon you. They can't rely on you because you won't keep your word. You've established that kind of reputation. Just think, what would your life be like if you decided to keep your commitments? What will all of our lives be like if we decided to keep our commitments? That we decided to do the things that we said that we were going to do? That we wouldn't even speak it unless we were going to do it? If we decided just for a week, just see what your life can be like. Just let's do it for a commitment to make, make it a seven-day commitment that I won't say I will do anything unless I'm going to do it. And find out what your life will be like. Let me tell you what, if you follow it through, if you keep your commitment to the commitment, at the end of the seven days, you'll feel strong and powerful. Because by honoring your commitment, each time that you do, that empowers you. Whatever discipline that is required, whatever it is that you must do, so I'm suggesting, number one, commit yourself to live in the present. I saw the movie, um, The Dead Port Society, Robin Williams, and they had a line in there, seize the moment. Many of us are not able to move forward and develop and manifest our greatness because we spend so much time looking back or worrying about the future. Seize the moment. 
See, you cannot go into the future and manifest your greatness when you have various things in your life that's blocking you. Let's look at how we can begin to keep our commitments. Remembering what Dr. Robert Anthony said about results. When you keep your commitments, you're able to produce some different kinds of results in your life. So how can we keep our commitments? And do we keep all commitments? No, we don't. You will not be at 100%. However, you will have a greater percentage rate of, of maintaining your commitments to yourself, whatever those things might be. If it's going into business, if it's, if it's changing a habit that you know that works against you, if it's overcoming self-destructive behavior, if it's retraining your thinking, if it's reinventing yourself, if it's trying to begin to design your relationship differently, all of us have the possibility by focusing and really harnessing our attention and concentrating on it, we really have available to us the power to honor our commitments in those particular areas. So number one, make it priority. See, no one would go get on an airplane if you thought your chances of getting there to your destination were as good as your luggage. Am I correct? See, and I say the reason that you will reach your destination more times than your luggage will is because the airline, and I'm glad that they do, has made it a priority to move the human beings from one point to the other safely. Not send you off to Boston or someplace with your luggage. So I'm not really upset when my luggage doesn't show up. I'm glad they delivered me <laughs> because they've made me a priority. See, they have made delivering you to your destination important. So if you want to honor your commitment, whatever you decide that you're going to do, make sure you make it important. Make sure it is priority. Keep it before you. The other thing is, Whatever that you want to do, whatever you want to begin to create and beginning to manifest your greatness and, and strengthening your level of commitment, and it's, it's really exercising your will, find something that you want to do on your goal, one action step, but make sure it stretches you, that it challenges you, but it's doable, that you can do it. This year I decided that I was going to exercise. So I started out doing just 10 setups and 10 push-ups. I know I can do that and not get upset about it. I can do that without thinking. So I started out small, now I'm up to 50, but if I try to do 50 starting out, I wouldn't still be doing it. So I started doing it in, in manageable segments, do that. And that, that strengthens your will, so my commitment now is strengthened and fortified by the activity of actually doing it. So now I can expand and build from there. When I decided to begin to manage my money differently, and I started saving 5% of my money, then I increased it to 10%, then to 15%. So now I have disciplined myself to live off 75% of my income. I took discipline to do that, but I started watching how I was spending my money. I started keeping a log and following myself. So you want to begin to find something that is manageable, that you know that you can do. The next thing in beginning to, to keep your commitments to yourself, have some friends that will hold you accountable, that won't let you off the hook, that won't tolerate anything less than the best from you. People that will support you in this new way of being, in this new state of consciousness. The other thing is that important is have a contingency plan. See, many times when you make a commitment to do something, there are some other variables that will happen that you can't control or you perhaps did not think about. So you want to have some other plans going on. You want to become creative. See, most people don't keep their commitments because when something goes wrong, they just stop. They don't have a contingency plan. So they don't know what to do next. Start being creative. If you challenge yourself, many times they say, I don't know what to do. And I always ask myself, but if you did know what to do less, what will it be? That activates another part of my mind. I start thinking about the possibilities and just experimenting. But many, many of us just stop dead in our tracks. I don't know what to do. You do know what to do. You've got genius in you. Challenge yourself. Push yourself. Make yourself come up with something. Use your imagination. 
And what you will find is that you know more than you realize that you know. That you're more creative and more resourceful than you realize that you are. And as you do that, the more you do it, the easier it will become. At first, it's going to be a struggle. And after you get into a certain level of consciousness, you will ask yourself, I, how is it that I didn't see this before? At the level that I'm managing my business now, they say consciousness is what we are. I literally look at myself and say, how is it that I didn't do this before? Why is it that I couldn't see this before? And the reason that I didn't see it before, because I didn't challenge myself. I didn't put myself out here. See, the reason that most of us go through life never discovering our true greatness, literally walking, breathing corpses, the uncommitted life isn't worth living. Why? Because it doesn't produce anything. See, you only make things happen. Your life only counts. You only make a difference when you are committed. When you make a commitment with your life, that's the people that make a commitment with their lives, the people that make a commitment to their customers, the people that make a commitment to their families, to their relationships, are the people that make the greatest impact in life. What is commitment? Commitment is the salesman who says, look here, I'm going to make $1,000 today and I'm not going home. You can turn the lights out. The janitors could be here running the vacuum cleaner. I'm not leaving here till I do it. I used to be a door-to-door -door salesman. I had X number of TVs. I had a minimum amount that I knew I had to sell every day in order to provide for my mother who was ill at the time, who had lost her job at the M&M cafeteria because of arthritis. And I said, I'm going to go door-to-door, -door, and sometimes I would not come home until 1 o'clock at night, knocking on people's door, people closing. What do you want? Would you like to buy a nice working month's television set, no money down? No! What about an Emerson TV? No! Thank you very much. Do you know anybody else that would be interested? No! Thank you very kindly. Knock on another, hello? Would you like to buy a nice working television set, no money down? No! Get away from our door! Thank you very kindly. Do you know anybody else would be? Yeah, my cousin, he lives two doors down. Thank you very kindly. I tell him you sent me. When I hey, your cousin told me that you wanted to buy a television set, told me to come in and talk to you, we got a special discount for you. Yes, come in, I'm interested. I would just keep right on. I would not go home until I did it. It's an interesting thing, ladies and gentlemen, that when we put ourselves in a situation where we say we're going to do it, it, it puts you in another zone where the universe responds to you. When you have that kind of consciousness, see, the universe responds to the man or woman that refuses to be denied because that is your commitment. That business that you want, that book you want to write, that dream that you have of controlling your destiny, that is yours. That power to create that and to manifest that, that is yours. That's available to you. But you've got to be willing to stand there and face disappointment, not have support. Be lonely. Doubt yourself sometimes. Be rejected again and again and again. Become bankrupt if necessary again and again and again. And refuse to turn around until life gives it up. Nothing can resist a person that has that kind of commitment. The people that have made a difference on the planet. When a John F. Kennedy said, we will go to the moon in the next decade. He spoke it. That was a commitment, and people shared that vision. People bought into that. We've had all kinds of examples in history where people have made declarations, who have committed their lives to bring about a difference. There are people who are taking a stand today against hunger. I guarantee you it will be a part of our past at some point in time. Someone took a stand against polio. It no longer plagues us as it once did because someone said, it is my commitment to eradicate it from the face of the earth. Someone made the commitment. The reason that we're here and enjoying the democracy that we have, someone made a commitment that whatever is required, if it means that I die, I remember Paul Robeson, here I stand for, I can do no other. And that's how you must be. Commitment means standing up for your life. It means honoring yourself. It means it means beginning to say and to, to see and recognize your alignment and oneness with the universe and that you are a channel for life to express through. And we short circuit it with anger. We short circuit it with fear. We short circuit it with, with envy. 
We short circuit it by being lazy or apathetic or giving up easily. Why, why, why? We say, oh, it's too hard, it's too hard. We don't challenge our spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing as powerful as the human spirit. You can't destroy it. You can pervert it, but you can't destroy it. I was reading Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Frankl. What a powerful book. I'm reading it now for the seventh time. And he gives so many graphic examples of, of the power of the human spirit. And so what are some of the things that can, can fortify us and, and give us the kind of inner strength that will allow us to forward ourselves into the future by manifesting our commitments? Number one, commitment means in some cases going back to school, getting some training, sitting up in classes with people younger than you, putting yourself in a position where you don't know and that is awkward and uncomfortable, but because of your commitment to develop yourself or to go back to school to get a high school diploma or to get a college degree, that it doesn't matter, feeling dumb and saying, what am I doing here, setting up in some boring class? Commitment could mean a lot of things. It could mean that you begin to go back. You've got to back up sometimes. It means to back up and not give up, to regroup, back up and regroup and come back again. Because life has waylaid you, because you got knocked down. I know when, when I was working on my dream, there were times I, I lost my house at one point. I lost my car. I was broke. My credit was bad. I was sleeping at different friends' houses on their couch or on the floor. There were times, months, that I slept on the floor of my office and got up early and dressed before my staff got there to give them the impression that I got there early before they did. <laughs> and we all pretend not to know what we knew, that the boss was staying in the office. <laughs> so we never talked about it. But I refuse, I refuse to give up on my dream. And what happens, they say, you know, in the prosperous years, you put it in your pocket. In the lean years, you put it in your heart. It makes me appreciate it even more. Even more. I, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. The disappointment, the pain that I've gone through by keeping the commitment. Keeping the commitments that you have might mean taking a stand that's, that's unpopular. Something was said one time. When you take a position, says cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Politics asks the question, is it popular? But conscience or commitment asks the question, is it right? And see, most people rather operate from the first two. Is it safe for me to take this position? I remember when I was a state legislator, I saw guys and, and, and women who believed in legislation very strongly, but because the Speaker of the House said, we won't go with that, they backed down. And they felt bad about it. They wouldn't take the position because they didn't want the Speaker of the House to be angry at them. They wanted to be all right with all of the rest of our colleagues. See, it takes a great deal of strong courage and commitment on your part to step out a line to, you know, Henry David Thoreau says, if a man doesn't keep pace with his companions, perhaps he's listening to the beat of a different drummer. Let him dance to the music that he hears, however measured or far apart. When you are committed, you're dancing to the beat of a different drummer. Don't expect people to understand you. Don't expect it to make sense to anybody why you've got to do this. Why you have got to go. Why you leave. This is a good job. I'm going. They pay you well. I'm going. You just a few years from retirement. I'm going. Why? I don't understand. You don't have to.
Here's what I suggest. Number one, that does happen. So take total responsibility for it. Just own it. Don't make any excuses on why you gave in or why you didn't come through. Just own it and face to flack whatever it is and stand up inside yourself. Next thing is assess the situation. How did you get here? What happened that you broke down, that you had a breakdown and you surrendered? What happened? What was going on? See, when I used to go on a diet, and I no longer do that, I've made a commitment to a healthy lifestyle. I used to eat up until 12 midnight on Sunday. Anything that wasn't moving. <laughs> and on Monday, I would, I would get up and, and, and um, eat a fruit, get a light fruit breakfast, and for lunchtime, I would um, fix some broiled chicken and meticulously peel the skin off and eat the chicken and then eat the skin. <laughs> Do five setups, look in the mirror and become discouraged because my stomach doesn't look like a washboard or one of the Avon Haley dances. And I say, what the use? And then I go to the refrigerator and eat food cold standing right there in the refrigerator. So when I evaluated where I broke down, I... So I changed my route. I stopped taking people to lunch or to dinner because I couldn't sit there and watch them eat. When I had to go someplace and speak and they were eating, I said, call me downstairs when it's time for me to speak because if I sit at the table looking at them, the food's gonna call my name. <laughs> and I know this. So I had to begin to make sure that I wasn't putting myself in a position where I would give up on my commitment. Am I making sense to you? So I began to strategize around avoiding situations where I knew that I was going to become weak. Another thing I do when I don't keep my commitment, I either deny myself something or I do a trade-off. If a glazed donut takes advantage of me, <laughs> then I require myself to do an extra 25 setups. Or I walk for an extra 15 or 20 minutes because I got a hammerlock on my head and say, come on over here. So you might have to deny yourself something or do a trade-off. Do something that will offset it. The other thing is, start again. So what? You fell flat on your face. So what? Start again. Learn from the experience and start again. Don't count yourself out. Don't sentence yourself to a lifetime of being miserable, a lifetime of being broke, a lifetime of being unhealthy, a lifetime of being in a relationship that is no longer fulfilling to you, a lifetime of, live, of working on a job that, that does not bring you satisfaction, that's not giving you the creative um, urge that you need and, and, and that got to have in your life that stimulates you. Don't sentence yourself like that. You are a human being. Don't volunteer your life that way. Your life has too much value to the universe. You've got something to contribute. You've got something to give. And so what if you make a commitment and you're not able to do it like a pro? That you're not good as everybody else. Live in the moment. I like what this says. Look to this day for it is life. The very life of life. In its brief course lie all the realities and verities of existence. The bliss of growth, the splendor of action, the glory of power. For yesterday is but a dream and tomorrow is only a vision. But today, today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness. And every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well therefore to this day. See if we just start enjoying where we are. If we make that kind of commitment to enjoy where we are, to experience the experience of life where we are, to do all we can right now where we are. Forget about the mistakes yesterday. Forget about all your failures yesterday. Forget, forget about what you don't have. That's not important. Only thing that we have is right now, right now, right now. And I say that life is calling on you to call forth on that. The optimists, which I think one of the most positive groups in, in the world, they have something called the Optimist Creed, and I like, it says promise yourself. I changed it to commit yourself, because I think that commitment has more power than promise. It says commit yourself to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. To talk health, happiness, and prosperity to every person you meet. To make all your friends feel that there is something in them. To look at the sunny side of everything and make your optimism come true. 
to think only of the best, to work only for the best, and expect only the best, to be just as enthusiastic about the success of others as you are about your own, to forget the mistakes of the past and press on to the greater achievements of the future, to wear cheerful continents at all times and give every living creature you meet a smile, to give so much time to the improvement of yourself that you have no time to criticize others. To be too large for worry, too noble for anger, too strong for fear, and too happy to permit the presence of trouble. Commit yourself to these things. Isn't that powerful? What a commitment to make with your life. Commit yourself to stretch, to get outside of your comfort zone, and not be concerned about what people think about you because they're thinking it anyhow. <laughs> Don't worry about what they will say. They're already saying it. So what do you care? Decide that, that your life has so much meaning to the planet. Decide that you have something to give. That's why you're here. So you didn't just show up. You brought something here. You're on a journey, you have a destination, mission to achieve, to do, to implement, to perform, to experience. Decide to commit yourself to be an adventurer in life. Look out on life around you. Look within yourself and say, where is it in my life that I need to make a commitment right now? Where is it that it might be for your health, it might be to be a happier person? It might be to make a difference in your community. It might be that. Where is it? I say that commitment shows up and the man or woman who has some idea, some, some dream that they've been nurturing within themselves and no one believed it, no one saw it for them. That they weren't masters at it, they weren't experts at it, no one would build a statue and ever call their name and recognize them. They never made it to the front page of the newspaper, but they had something that was theirs, something that, that was their baby, something that they loved and, and they believed in, and they just did what they could with what God gave them with their dream. Commitment shows up, and people that are willing to give themselves a chance who look at their lives, look within themselves and say, I know, I know that, that this just cannot be it for my life. I know that there's, there's something I'm supposed to do. I don't know right now. Or maybe you do know. Maybe you do know and you've talked yourself out of it. And I understand that. Because I, I I'm, I'm late. I've, no, no, no. Everything happens as it should. I, I got the courage to step out, to, to become committed. I was, I was seriously not serious before. And, and I decided it took me some time to build up the courage to become committed because it frightened me. So I understand wrestling with it. I wish I could tell you I've been doing this for 20 years. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't. I'm just glad that, that I decided to become committed before I left here. And wherever you are, Decide that you're going to commit your life now and let it show up in your contribution. Let it show up in what you have to share. And whatever commitment that you make, honor your commitment as yourself. Honor your word as yourself. Whatever you put out there, do it with what you've got. I want to thank you very much for your consciousness. This is Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy, Leslie Calvin Brown, saying it's been a plum pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. Thank you all here. Yeah. We've been going through several stages. We talked about self-awareness. Who am I? Asking that central question in one's life. Looking at your strengths and your weaknesses. Getting some evaluation, determining what it is you want out of life. Then we went to the next level of self-what? Self-approval. 
approving yourself to do the things that you like to do and going after the dreams that you like to go after. And we know when we don't approve of our dreams because of the fact that they stay up in our minds. We don't act on them. We procrastinate. We come up with a variety of excuses on why we're not going into action. And then the next level is what? Self-commitment. Going for that dream. Going for those goals. Deciding to do the things that are necessary to bring about the changes that we want to bring in our lives or what we want to bring in society. And then after that, we are now to this level. And this stage is what? Self-fulfillment. Because when you are involved in commitment, when you are implementing your plan of action, you're going to produce some results. You're going to have some victories that you can feel good about. And it's a time of celebration. So what happens when you hit the level of self-fulfillment? First of all, what we want to know is that self-fulfillment is unending and should be viewed in that context. Robert Shuler says it best when he says, success is never ending. So that means that we never get to a level where we feel that there's nothing else for us to do, that we've achieved certain number of goals and we figure that we're through. No, no. You don't want to stay there and celebrate too long like a lot of people do. When they do something they consider outstanding, they go around talking about what they used to do. See, let me tell you, I used to do this and I used to do that. Excuse me, used to bees don't make no honey. <laughs> what are you doing now? What have you done for me lately? You know? <laughs> go around telling people about what you used to do and who you used to be. <laughs> what does that count for now? Nothing. What are you doing now? You're still here breathing. That means you've got some more to give. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter about where you are, doesn't matter about what you have, doesn't matter about what you've done. Life is about growing, it's about being productive, it's about stretching, it's about challenging yourself. So you start looking around and decide, hey, hey, wh what else do I want to do? What, what got me here? It's a time for celebration, but also a time for reflection. What got me here? What worked? What did not work? What do I need to do to repeat so that I can get the same kind of results in other areas of my life? If the goal is to improve my health, if the goal is to improve my relationship, if the goal is to improve my income, if the goal is to improve something in society, what is it I need to do? Now don't get confused with what you do with who you are. Don't trip. Don't go on some type of ego trip by talking about how bad you are. None of us do anything by ourselves. Develop an appreciation for external support as well as good fortune because all of those things play a role. And the other thing is don't go overboard celebrating. Kipling says it best. You must meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. You look at it, hey, I did it. I feel good about that. Now you're moving on to the next thing. Things did not work out the way you wanted them to work out. You didn't produce the results you wanted to produce. Hey, miss that. Win some, you lose some. Next, moving right on. Don't confuse who you are with what you do. Let's go on to the next level looking in that particular area. You return to the area of self-assessment. You start looking at yourself and evaluating yourself. Now, what are some of the elements or the characteristics or the qualities of people who are fulfilled, who, who live a life of fulfillment. What are some of the things we can look at about them? I think, number one, make your mind fertile ground for the seeds of opportunity. I think if you want to experience a sense of fulfillment, you've got to have an open mind so that ideas can come in there and take root and grow. So part of beginning to have fertile ground, you know you got to break that ground up you got to break up that hard crust because if you don't, seeds will fall there and the wind can blow them away, the winds of doubt. When you're set in your mind and you refuse to grow and you're not open to new ideas, new methods, new ways of doing things, if your mind is already fixed, you become stagnant. You can't grow. You can't have a sense of fulfillment. You become extremely cynical and negative about everything. You know it all. So you want to begin to look at life and have a sense of curiosity, not know it all. You want to keep learning, keep growing, and realize that we had a theme. You never find out how much you know until you find out how little you know. And there are some people you can't tell anything. They have all the answers. Oh, I've already done that. 
Larry D'Angelo was telling me, he said he was on a plane and he was observing two men talking and he, and the guy was um, reading a magazine. He looked at the guy next to him and said, would you like to um, read this magazine, I'm, share this magazine I have? No, I read that before. Don't like it. Don't like it. Okay. So he had a newspaper. He said, um, what about the USA Today? No, I read that before. Don't like that either. Try that once. Don't like that. So they served them some food and he said, would you care to have anything I have here because the guy wasn't eating? No, no. Tried that before. I don't like that. And um, he noticed guy only had one child. He said, <laughs> what Larry was trying to say is <laughs> that a lot of people go through life prejudging things. How many of you don't like buttermilk? Raise your hands, please. How many of you raise your hands and never taste buttermilk, please? Uh, <laughs> and I'm one of them. I just don't like the way it looks, all right? I might be missing out on something, all right? So many of us count ourselves out of things prematurely. You don't know what the possibilities are up in there. So you want to be open. You want to continue to learn. You want to continue to grow. You want to begin to know that there are unlimited ideas out here waiting for you to latch on to them. And if you don't take advantage of them when they come your way because you're so close-minded, do understand somebody else will. And we've all had ideas that we did not act on and looked around and somebody else had the idea and gone with it. So be open and receptive. Next thing, if, in order to live a fulfilling life, Become involved in life. Live your fantasy. Most people go through life not living their fantasy, going, sitting up in the bleachers, looking out on the field, looking out into the arena, wishing that they were down there, just fantasizing, seeing themselves running with the ball. I used to do that. I used to always see myself at a basketball game. One second to go, Les Brown comes down court. He looks to his right, looks to his left. He's the only one that can do it. Dush, the basket goes in, Les saved us, and people picked me up and carried me off. But I never went out and did it. <laughs> Decide to live your fantasy. See, in life, you can go through life, you can come up with reasons or you can come up with results. You can come up with excuses or you can come up with achievements. You can go through life blaming or you can come up with solutions. The choice is in your hands, satisfaction or despair. We can choose that. So look at your life and decide what it is that you want to do that will give your life a sense of worth. Someone said that your life worth is measured by your accomplishments and not by your complaints. If you want to have a fulfilling life, decide not to make your life predictable. See, some people, their lives are very predictable. They got a little routine, they do that, and they follow that day in and day out, day in and day out. You don't get much juice and happiness out of life like that if you're predictable. You want to change it up. Variety most certainly is the spice of life. Here's something else. Want to create a greater sense of fulfillment? Challenge your fears. Challenge them. Look those fears in the face and take them on. Don't allow them to rule you. Decide that you're going to take some chances. A friend of mine by the name of Adrian he said one day he decided to have a day of challenge. So he and a friend went to Cedar Point. <laughs> so he's always been afraid of certain rides. So he said on this particular day, he said he decided that he was going to go on the most dangerous rides at Cedar Point. So they went around looking at all the rides. And so the young lady that he was with and said, that's the one there. That's it. She's, he said, why that one? He said, well, she said, um, I, I read about it in the newspaper. said, two people were killed last year on that. <laughs> he said, yes, that's the one I want. That's the one, you know? So he got in the line and said, it was a long line. Had to wait in line for about two hours. And agent said, while he was in line, and as they started getting closer, he said, he started doubting him. said, well, maybe I should not do this. Maybe. <laughs> so she says, no, come on, get back in line. He said, no, 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 I changed my mind. I don't want to do this. I don't have to have the most dangerous ride. He said he started visualizing himself being thrown out of this big ride and his name on the front page of the newspaper after being splattered against the wall or something. So he just started saying, no, I don't want to do it. But his friend insisted, no, come on, Adrian. We said we were going to do it. We we're going to confront our fears today. Come on, just stay in line. 
So he kept on, he said he was arguing with her the whole time. They got up there and the guy said, okay, next. He said, no, no, I just decided to change my mind. She said, come on. She pushed him. They went there and he got in the, in the little seat and they strapped him in. And as they began to move, he said, wait a minute, I want to get out. But it was too late. <laughs> And he started taking him up. He says, oh, no, please, please. I got a bad heart. Let me out. And he was up there and he was gone. He said he screamed all through that ride. <laughs> His friend was laughing. Her wig came off. <laughs> Before they finished, he'd lost his partial. <laughs> when he got off, he was gumming it. Yeah. <laughs> But Adrian said, less when I got off, he said, I walked a little taller. <laughs> and he said he felt good inside. And one of the things he said, he said, hey, it wasn't that bad after all. <laughs> and we've all had experiences, things that we dread doing. And when we finally did it, we said, hey, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Raise your hand if you ever had that experience before. Hey, 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 I just thought I'd die if I did this. I didn't die. I'm still here. And ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's what most people miss out of life. You've got to be willing to risk. If you're not willing to risk, you can't grow in life. Life has no power when you're not willing to risk. Somebody wrote this and it was given to me. It said, to laugh is to risk appearing the fool. To weep is to risk appearing sentimental. To reach out for another is to risk involvement. To expose feelings is to risk exposing your true self. To place your ideas, your dreams before a crowd is to risk their loss. To love is to risk not being loved in return. To live is to risk dying. To hope is to risk despair. To try is to risk failure. But risk must be taken because the greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, is nothing. They may avoid suffering and sorrow, but they cannot learn, feel, change, grow, love, and live. Chained by their certitudes, they are a slave. They have forfeited their freedom. Only a person who risks is free. I'm reminded of a missionary who had gone to Africa to work with a certain tribe, they were called the headhunters. And there was a reporter observing him and for a long period of time he had a, a limited relationship with him. They would not take him in. And he said because he was tentative and hesitant and fearful, he didn't want to risk having a relationship with him because he didn't want to mess around and have his head taken off. <laughs> he had this fear and obviously it showed and the tribesmen sensed it. Say one night he was sleeping and he made a decision because the reporter came back and saw him and he had an incredible relationship with the tribesmen, these headhunters. The guy said, what happened? How did you convert the distance, the hostility, into a warm, close relationship? He said, I had a dream one night. He said, I was thinking and, and he said, I dreamed. He said, what, you know, what's my passion? What's my life goal? He said, I always wanted to be a missionary. And he said, this is the work I love. And he said, in the dream, he asked himself, how much do you love it? And I said, I'm willing to die for this dream. And he said, and he thought about that and he woke up. That he loved doing this so much that if it was in fact his passion, that it was in fact his life's work, he's willing to die for it. And so therefore he said, he had no longer any fear of death. And he went in there and started working with them. And obviously, they picked that up. And he said something else that was profound. He said, when you no longer fear dying, what else can life threaten you with? What else? See, when, when you are willing to risk all of it, when you're making that kind of commitment, somebody always defined commitment, I love it, Said so next time you have bacon and eggs, look at it. Say the chicken was involved, but the pig was committed. <laughs> he had to give it all up. <laughs> See, when you're willing to give it all up, <laughs> 
See, that's, that's what life is. See, you've got to be willing to give it all up. When you're willing to, to throw it all on the line, that's when life takes on a whole new dimension. See, most people won't do that. They won't risk that. So decide to take some risks. You want to break the routine. Most people go through life following that routine, and we know that that is a living death. Going through life, playing it safe, is, is, is like a breathing corpse. Because the only way that you can grow, you've got to risk. The only way that you can become your best, you have got to risk. You've got to challenge yourself. You've got to venture into the unknown. You've got to take some chances. Got to put you on the line. So in order to have that sense of fulfillment, getting out of your comfort zone, as you get out of your comfort zone, you expand your whole life. The more you do, the more you realize you can do. You expand your capacity. You expand your potential. You expand your horizons. You expand your vision of yourself and of life. You expand your participation in life. You're involved in life more. You'll get more out of life because you're putting more into life than most people. That's why it's so important that we are willing to take some risks. I don't know exactly what to do. It's okay. You'll find out. You either learn that you're going in the right direction or the wrong direction. And from that you learn. You'll get some feedback. The universe will tell you, where do I get started? Just get started. The universe will give you immediate feedback. Don't worry. You hit your head long enough, you'll get the message. <laughs> Lose enough money, you'll learn real quick. Get enough knots on your head, it'll be all right. Here's something else. Choose to be happy in spite of life's challenges. In spite of life's challenges. Life changes every day. Sometimes things will be going your way. Sometimes things work well for you. Sometimes it won't work so well. Sometimes you have your health, you're feeling good and energetic, have a yes I can attitude and, and there's some things that can happen to you in life that can take all of that from you. All of that can go. Sometimes you might be financially secure and a sickness, one sickness can wipe out an illness. Life always changes. But you can choose, you can choose in the midst of all of this that's going on to be happy in spite of it. In the good times and in the bad times, you can make a choice. Viktor Frankl, he, he talks about that. He said, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Douglas Matlock has a poem I love entitled, It's Fine Today. He said, sure, this world is full of trouble. I ain't said it ain't. Lord, I've had enough and double reason for complaint. Rain and storm have come to fret me. Skies are often gray. Thorns and brambles have beset me on the road. But say, ain't it fine today? What's the use of always weeping, making trouble last? What's the use of always keeping, thinking of the past? Each must have his tribulation, water with his wine. Life, it ain't no celebration. Trouble, I've had mine, but today is fine. It's today that I'm living, not a month ago, having, losing, taking, giving, as time wills it so. Yesterday, a cloud of sorrow fell across the way. It may rain again tomorrow. It may rain, but say, ain't it fine today? <laughs> Isn't that good? I like that. So even if a cloud of sorrow comes over here, Ain't it fine today, living in the moment, getting everything we can out of where we are in the moment where we are right now, living in the present. The other thing is willingness to let people and things go. You want to live a life of fulfillment. You've got to be willing to let certain people go in your life, especially if they want to go. Get addicted to material things. Be willing to let things or people go. When they're no longer good for you, just let them go. Just to hold on tenaciously, 
really doesn't make really good sense, all right? Just many times we do it because we don't realize that we might desire it, but we don't need it. Next thing is face the truth about life and deal with it. And a lot of people, when someone in their life that they love very much dies, they allow it to take such a toll on them, they make themselves miserable, and they literally will themselves to die early because they feel without this person they have nothing to look forward to. And no, no, life has other opportunities, other relationships, other experiences for us. And the people that we love really want us to go on. Other thing is, things are going to happen to you. Here, in order to have a fulfilling life, knowing that, that things are going to happen, expect the unexpected. Whatever happens to you, use everything for your upliftment, learning, and growth. Everything that happens, use it for your upliftment, learning, and grow in the midst of it. Ask, what can I learn from this? What can I get from this? How did I end up here? What's the blessing in this for me? Ask yourself that whatever it is, and don't let it go until you get your blessing out of it because there's a blessing there. There's a lesson there. There's something for you in everything that happens to you for you to learn from that experience. Look at it, examine it. Analyze it, dissect it, take it apart until it reveals itself to you. And then get what you need from that and move on. But everything that happens to you, I have a friend, she stutters, and I said, are you taking any special classes to stop from stuttering? She said, N -n 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 no. I said, why? Because it helps my business. I said, how? <laughs> when I go in, to somebody, I say, now, if, if you're busy, I, I, I'll come back because I, I, I stutter. And they used to say, oh, no, 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 you can tell me right now. <laughs> and then she say, well, this is, this is my product. And she said, after she goes through it, and if they say no, she said, well, you didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Let me t t t t t t tell you again. <laughs> and she, they say, oh, no, no, that's all right. How much you say it is? That's all right. Don't tell, don't tell me no more. That's all right. Just let me know how much I need to give you so you can get on out of here. <laughs> so she's turned that stuttering to her advantage. Somebody says, if life give you lemon, write yourself a lemon cookbook. You know? <laughs> so everything, so I have people say to me, hey, uh, I really feel sorry, you know, for you. The fact, it's a shame they labeled you educable, mentally retarded. I said, it's okay. I've told this story before. AT&T, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's Corporation, Xerox, they pay a whole lot of money to head, too. <laughs> What would I have to say if they hadn't done that? You know, <laughs> whatever happens to you, turn it to your advantage. So I have now made that a blessing for me as opposed to a handicap. I went and proved them wrong by engaging in self-study and consciously working to develop myself. So now they have to ask themselves, what, what were we thinking about when we labeled this guy? What was going on? And then there are people who look at me and say, wait a minute, this guy, he, he labeled it, what? Re retarded, you got to be kidding. If he's done what he's done, what can I do with what I've got? <laughs> That's what happens. So when I get through talking and, and motivating a sales force, they leave there ashamed not to be motivated. <laughs> say, that retarded guy can do it. I know I got to do something. <laughs> <laughs> They're ready to run out the room, you know. <laughs> I got to do something up in here. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Am I making any sense to you? Huh? <laughs> Here's something I encourage you to do. Whatever you do, do it in a consciousness of love. See, if, if, you, if you love what you do, and if you decide to love people, 
to make wherever you are an experience of love. Just decide to be a loving person, regardless if the people you're around are loving or not. Just see, I've never read anywhere where they say God has love. I've never read that. What is, what, but how does it go? What, what is it? God is love. Not that God has love. Now, if we are the children of God, we are the offsprings of God, then we are what? Love. See, love is not an emotion. Love is not something you can give. You, you can't give love. You must be love. You've got to be a loving person. So as you operate in that consciousness, and this comes not just overnight with enlightenment or insight or just someone recommending that, but with practice. Practice and practice and practice and doing it and doing it and doing it and working consciously. How, how do you do that? How, when, with all of the evil things and evil people, how, how do you do that? Well, one of the things is we've got to practice to be non-judgmental, to suspend judgment. That if you can, in the midst of where you are, I know a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey in Chicago when I go there do my training. He's a quadriplegic. He used to be a bitter young man. He's involved in a car accident and is paralyzed. Cannot move his neck. He's quadriplegic, complete. He used to be very bitter, very angry. He decided to become a loving person as a result of Jeffrey's decision. Jeffrey's life has taken a dramatic turn. He is now an inspiration and a blessing to other people. There are people who say, wait a minute. And I know one guy in particular who's always a cynical, negative guy, and I introduced him to Jeffrey. He said, if this guy could be pleasant and loving and have a smile on his face, how can I worry about this little stuff I'm worried about? How can I allow life to get next to me? How can I talk about being depressed when I can get up and move around and walk around? And Jeffrey can't do that, and he's confined to this wheelchair. Jeffrey has decided in, in a spirit of love to make his life a blessing to other people. He's going back to school. He writes with a pencil in his mouth. He is determined. Sometimes he becomes a little frustrated. Sometimes he does get a little depressed, but he doesn't allow it to keep him there. He's a loving spirit. You can feel it in his consciousness, just being around him. You can look at him and feel good inside. He's an inspiration to the people that come in contact with his life. That's a decision that he has made. And I feel that we can all make that decision. And through practice, practice of being loving and giving out what we want, that we can become that kind of person in spite of the circumstances. Emmett Fox said, love is absolutely invincible. He said that there is no difficulty that enough love will not conquer, no disease that enough love will not heal, no door that enough love will not open, no gulf that enough love will not bridge, no wall that enough love will not throw down, no sin that enough love will not redeem. It makes no difference how deeply seated may be the trouble, how hopeless the outlook, how muddled the tangle, how great the mistake, a sufficient realization of love will dissolve it all. If only you could love enough, you would be the happiest and most powerful being in the world. And he ends it in a scripture that says, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Decide to be a loving experience in life. That whatever work you have to do, do it lovingly. That whatever relationships that you have, just decide to be more loving, more giving, more caring, more concerned, more sensitive than you've ever been before. But what if you don't get it back? It would be great if you get it back. It would be great. But don't count on it. You might get it back and you might not. But don't let someone else determine who you're going to be. Be who you are. Give what you want. 
Why? Because you want it back? No. Do it because that's who you are. Do it because that's how you've decided to live your life. Do it because it gives your life a sense of fulfillment and worth and self-respect. When we get off center, when we allow people or circumstances to determine whether or not we are loving because of the way they treat us or because of what we are experiencing, then we are not operating at cause in our lives. We are not controlling our destiny. We are not determining what happens to us and for us. And that's the power that we have been given, the power to choose ye this day. Whom you you serve? Who will you serve? Those negative feelings and emotions, anybody can hate. Anybody can be revengeful. Some people rather get revenge than get ahead in life. Anybody can do that. Anybody can hold a grudge. Doesn't take any greatness on that. Don't need any motivation and encouragement to hold a grudge. Have some resentment in your heart and some bitterness. But the real challenge about growth and moving into your greatness it's about being who you are, being true to you. I say, as you look at life, here's something I like what Charles Fillmore said at age 94. I fairly sizzle with zeal and enthusiasm as I spring forth with a mighty faith to do the things that ought to be done by me. I spring forth with a mighty faith to do the things that ought to be done by me. And I say, as you go toward your goals and your dreams, spring forth with a mighty faith to write the book that ought to be written by you, to sing the song that ought to be sung by you, to start the business that ought to be started by you, to help the people that ought to be helped by you, to make the difference in our society that ought to be made by you. Determine what is my life work? What is the work that I ought to do? How is it that I can make my life a great experiment? How is it that I can make the contribution that I showed up to give? Something that when I go to sleep at night, I can feel good within myself and know that I've given life my very best. And one last step, I think, in the area of self-fulfillment, and that is that you must live in a spirit and an attitude of gratitude. There's so many things, ladies and gentlemen, that we take for granted. So many things. As I look at my life, there are a lot of things I know I... I could have done, and I haven't done them, but I've also done some things, and I'm thankful. There are a lot of things that we need to be thankful for. There are big things, there are little things. I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for my children. I'm thankful for my mother. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for for the life that I live and for the people who have enriched my life, who have contributed to my being who I am. And as I look at my life, and I was up like three o'clock in the morning and sometimes just laying there in the bed, staring at the ceiling, thinking. I just said, thank you, Lord. When I look back on my life, I've come a mighty long ways. And even if I don't reach my goal, I'm thankful. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
What we're going to talk about now is simply some keys to self-motivation. And all of us have motivation of some sort. I define motivation as the desire to achieve that which you believe to be worthwhile. And many people go through life never getting in touch with their greatness because of the lack of motivation to push themselves or because they have not found something that they believe to be worthwhile to challenge them. I heard a poem once that said, um, many a flower has bloomed unceasingly and wasted sweetness upon the cold desert air. It's translated that means simply that many a talented persons have gone unnoticed and the world never had a chance to be exposed to their talent because that person did not take the time to begin to express or to demonstrate or to motivate themselves in the direction to bring that which they came into the universe to bring. How can you measure your motivation? How can you evaluate where you are on a scale of one to 10? Let's do this for ourselves mentally. How do you rate yourself from one to 10? Your mental attitude about yourself, how you feel about you, how you feel about life. How do you rate yourself on a scale of one to 10 in terms of your physical appearance, in terms of your health? Do you take care of yourself? Are you allowing yourself to get overweight and out of shape? Are you conscious of your health? Are you watching the food that you take into your body do you make a deliberate effort to exercise? You know, it was George Burns. He said, we cannot help getting older, but we don't have to get old. And many of us get old before our time because we don't take time to take care of ourselves. Your environment is a very good indicator on a scale of one to 10. Is it what you want it to be? Do you find it desirable? Are you satisfied? the job or career that you're involved in. Someone said that 85% of the American public unhappy with their jobs. Are you spending eight hours a day just doing time? Doing something that you don't find challenging, that does not make you stretch mentally, that does not stimulate you, that does not inspire you. Something that you don't find a sense of fulfillment in it. If you're doing that day in and day out, it has to affect how you feel about yourself, your level of motivation, your relationships, what kind of impact is it having on your life? Is it nourishing or is it a toxic relationship? Does it drain you or does it build you up? Ask yourself that. How motivated are you to do something about it? Your contribution, your actions. What are you giving? Many people will leave the universe without a trace. No one will know they were here. And in fact, under their name, we could put under there, not used up. Will anybody know that you came this way? What contribution are you giving? What will you leave? What will be different because you came this way? Someone once said that life is our gift to us that God has given us and how we live our lives is our gift to God. What kind of gift are you formulating? Is this a gift that you like to take back and do something else before you turn it in? Think about that. What can we do? What are some of the keys that we can begin to use to motivate ourselves when our batteries run low? Because I don't care who you are, I don't care what you do, at some time you are going to get tired. At some time you're going to get in a rut, seem like nothing you do works out right. At some times it just seems like you just don't have the wherewithal or the will to do anything. That sometimes you act like you're punch drunk. You're just wading through life, just doing time day in and day out, looking at non-discriminatory television, anything that's on, just looking. <laughs> and depressed, feeling powerless, feeling useless and bored. What do you do? How do you get yourself out of a rut? How do you, when you know you can do more than what you've been doing and you're not doing it and you're discontent with where you are, you get angry at yourself. How do you get out of that rut? How do you motivate yourself? One of the things that we must do is that we must be involved in working on achieving self-mastery. You must work on yourself continuously. 
Never be satisfied with yourself. Always know that as you invest the effort and time on you, that's the greatest ability that human beings have above animals. See, a dog can't be anything but a dog. A tree can't be anything but a tree. Human being, you've got unlimited potential. You can put effort on you, and by concentrating on you and developing you, you can transform your life wherever you are right now. So you want to work on yourself. You want to read books that inspire you and motivate you. You want to listen to tapes over and over and over again. And I suggest that you listen to tapes when you first get up in the morning. You want to control the spirit of your day. When you first wake up in the morning, your mind is operating at 10.5 wave cycles per second. That's when the subconscious mind is most impressionable. Whatever you hear in the first 20 minutes when you wake up, that will affect the spirit of your day. When you listen to tapes, listen with relaxed belief. Believing that this can happen for you. And by listening to them, listen to them over and over and over again. And you will get a breakthrough. You can listen to the same tape for months and all of a sudden you hear something you never heard before. It have a special meaning for you. Or read the same book over again and you find some special insight. You said, I can't believe I didn't see that the first time. So you want to be involved in developing yourself. Most people won't do that. Most people won't take that kind of effort and invest that kind of energy in themselves because they will fall prey to that conversation within. Oh, don't do that. You don't have time. You're too busy. You're too caught up in the rat race. Most people won't do that. Well, they won't take time to go to lectures. They won't take time to go to seminars. They won't take time to, to go to classes to improve themselves. And as you continue to work on yourself, you will begin to expand your vision of yourself. You begin to work towards self-mastery and you will begin to see it reflect itself in all the dimensions of your life, your mental life, your physical life, your social life, in your relationships, your monetary life. So concentrate on developing yourself because if you don't, I guarantee you that you will make a settlement and most people have and most of us already have. What kind of settlement have you made with your life? You know when we make settlements, out-of-court settlements, you've heard them? That means that you decided to take something less than what you originally wanted to get had you gone into court. And the reason that you settled outside of court is because you didn't believe that you can get it. So you made an out-of-court settlement. Many of us are making in-life settlement. We're settling for less than what we actually deserve. We don't feel good about it, but we make it work in our minds. We'll come up with some kind of excuse to make it all right. What kind of settlement have you made with your life? Many of us settle for less than what we want out of relationships because we don't have the courage to change them. I had a seminar I used to do called, Are You Living Together or Dying Together? <laughs> Many people are just dying together. Gladys Knight used to have a song that says, neither one of us want to be the first to say goodbye. The next thing is, in order to begin to find some keys to self-motivation to drive yourself, in addition to working on yourself, and as you work on yourself, you feel good about yourself, and as you feel better about yourself, you treat yourself differently, develop a health plan. See, you can't feel well and do well if you don't have good health. You can't perform if you don't have your health. Your health is valuable. Develop a health plan. A plan that you will follow because this is the only vehicle that you have to carry you through this experience called life. And you want to take good care of it because you love you enough. You care enough about you. And that's not easy. It is not easy having a health plan and sticking to it. But you're worth it doing it again and again and again. I have lost 22 pounds several times. It, it, I always do it. I love potato chips. People who know me know I love M&M peanuts. I love peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I love my mother's sweet potato pie. I love this. It's not always on my health plan, but I put it on there sometimes. <laughs> I said, life is too short to go without sweet potato pie. <laughs> if I go tonight, I want you to slip a slice of sweet potato pie in my casket. <laughs> and watch the smile on my face. <laughs>
Next thing is, as you take care of yourself, the next key is keys to motivation, to self-motivation. You want to live life with energy and passion. You want to make a conscious effort to be lively. See, in life, you either saying hello or goodbye. You either on the way or in the way. <laughs> Leave dead people alone. Some folks just walking around looking sad. How you doing, honey? <laughs> Stay away from these people. Just go away from them. It affects you. You want to smile. You want to be happy. You got a lot to be thankful for. But you watch some of the faces around you every day. And I tell you, some of these faces, they will put you in a depressed state of mind. <laughs> so you want to avoid these kind of faces. When you see them coming, turn your head. <laughs> Next thing is that you want to monitor your inner conversations. The things that you say to yourself. You want to watch them, and in watching them, you want to take charge. A friend of mine told me this evening, and she did it excellently. She said, I didn't want to come tonight. I was feeling so depressed. And I said, I'm going anyhow. See, that was the conversation. She said, oh, you really don't feel like it. You really don't need to do it. You don't really need to read anything. Forget all that. That's that inner conversation. Oh, you don't need to worry about trying to go into your own business. Forget that. You can't do that. What if you lose everything you've got? That inner conversation that stops you from doing the things you want to do less, don't do that. How can you possibly think about being a motivational speaker? You don't have the contacts. You don't have the money. You don't know the right people. You're going to get up there and your mind's going to go blank. Forget all that. You remember that time you got up before some people and you panicked? You stood up and your mind sat down? Don't you remember? And I said, yes. And then I said, shut up! So you've got to learn to stand up to yourself inside yourself. And short circuit, override that conversation that's always going on. 85% of what that conversation will tell you is negative. It's negative. It will tell you you're tired when you really are not tired. It will tell you you can't do it. It will fill you with fear. So you've got to watch that conversation. And when you find it going on, you've got to stand up to it and say, I'm going to do this anyhow. I'm afraid, but I'm afraid not to do it. And I'm not going to let you stop me. The biggest challenge that you will have in life is you. There's an old African proverb that says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. The next thing that is a key to self-motivation is that you've got to ask yourself, what do I want out of life? What do you want out of life? What do you want out of a job? What do you want out of a career? What do you want out of a relationship? What do you want? What gives you your life? What, how will you know when you got it? What will make you happy? You need to know. You need to start asking yourself some questions. What do I really, really, truly want? You need to be exact about that. Don't be vague. Oh, I just want to be happy. That's too vague. What will make you happy? How will you know when you got it? Zero in on it. Be exact. Be specific. And as you do that, that will stimulate that superconscious mind or the reticular activating system of your mind that will begin to find those things, to identify with it. And once you begin to determine that which you want, take the time to write it down. Don't just think about it. Write it down. That is a subjective process that engages the subconscious mind. Write it down. Once you write it down, Read it three times a day, morning, noon, and night. Why is that important? Because what it will do, it will cause you to focus. It will cause you to concentrate. When that other conversation is going on telling you what you cannot do, telling you all of the impossibilities and all of the obstacles, your concentrating will begin to create a larger vision within yourself and you start looking for and seeing some new opportunities. You start creating some openings for yourself. 
as you begin to read that every day, every day, day in and day out, that will make you focus. That will discipline your thinking. And you'll get all kind of creative ideas. As I talk to you right now, being involved in this immersion process, you're going to create some openings for yourself. You're going to get some ideas. You're going to feel your adrenaline flowing and you're going to think about something, some idea you had. You say, I want to go back and I'm going to look at that again from a different vantage point. Not from the level of the problem or the obstacles that I encountered, but from a higher vantage point. Because what you will begin to see and to know as I talk to the higher consciousness within you, that you are powerful, that you are a miracle worker. And that inner conversation has conditioned you to believe that you are not. And as you begin to discover the truth of who you are, whatever challenge that you're facing in life, and if you're living, you're facing some challenge, you'll begin to know that you're powerful and that you're a miracle maker. So as you begin to write down exactly what it is that you want, read it every day. The next thing is, see yourself there. How will you feel once you get there? What will the experience be like for you? What will be different? What kind of person do you have to become in order to get there? Visualize yourself there, living the experience. I remember when I ran for state representative in Columbus, Ohio, and I had a lot of people telling me, and you gotta watch not only the conversation within, but the conversation without. <laughs> telling me, Les, you can't possibly win, you can't do that. And I went down to the legislature and I saw myself, I knew what I wanted. I saw myself in the chair. I pointed out the chair that I wanted. I used to go and sit up in the galleries and watch the legislative process. I used to go to the committee meetings and listen to legislation being introduced. I learned how to write legislation, how to amend legislation. I started thinking like a legislator, got up every day dressing, thinking like that, selling myself on it, seeing myself in the legislature, Mr. Speaker. I'm the gentleman from the 29th House District, I'd like to introduce a bill. I went in the legislature, walked around, I had the experience of it. And when I ran and won against overwhelming odds, they were shocked. I won the election even before it was held because I was living it in my mind. You want to see yourself beyond your circumstances. You got a challenge, see yourself beyond your challenge. See yourself with the challenge already resolved. And knowing that all is well, seeing yourself in control and in charge of your destiny, being healthy and happy. The next thing is, it is important in the area of motivating yourself, it's important to know why you're doing it. Because that mind will say, why bother? Why go through all this? This is too hard. No, throw in the tower. It's not worth it. Has it ever said that to you before? Here's how you can handle that. Here's how you override that. Write down five reasons why you deserve it. Why do you deserve what you want? Why you? Why do you deserve it? What meaning and value will it bring to your life? What's so different about you that you deserve your goal or this goal? And when you write down those five reasons, when you have some down moments and you're going to have them, when that conversation starts talking to you and it's going to talk to you, what you will do is you can pull that out and read it and it will build you up. It will be your rod and your staff to comfort you through some challenging moments because you're going to have some. Life will knock you between the eyes. It will catch you on the blind side, come out of nowhere, stuff you can't anticipate that will knock the wind out of you. You want to give up. That's why it's important for you to work on yourself, listening to tapes, building yourself up, talking to yourself with power, feeling, and conviction, building yourself up day in and day out because it's coming. <laughs> I guarantee you, life is just waiting. Oh, he's doing good now, huh? Very good. I remember I had an experience. I was pursuing my dream. And that's why you have to work on yourself. You don't know what's going to happen. And I was telling people, I had this big rally I had to do with 5,000 people there. And I said, you must work on yourself. If you want a larger vision, you've got to empower yourself continuously because life will catch you on the blind side. And after I finished my speech, I got a rousing standing ovation. And I went and called the young lady that I was dating at the time. I said, hey, guess what? 
I said, they love me. I got a standing ovation. And they were chanting, we want the motivator. We want the motivator. I said, listen, we want the motivator. We want, do you hear? She said, yes, unless I need to talk to you. I said, well, wait a minute. You talking about tough. I was getting off and I'll be home soon. Les, I heard a voice in the background. Hurry up and tell him. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Les, um, you've been gone a lot and there's somebody else. What? And they came in. Les, come on, Mr. Motivator. They want you back out there. Wait a minute, hold on, hold on. What'd you say? <laughs> I'm sorry, there's someone else. And I heard the voice say, hang the phone up. Clump. I say, wait a minute. I say, hey, hey, Motivator, come on. They want you. Can't you hear them cheer? I say, oh, 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 oh. Okay, uh, I say, I say, uh, when you working on a larger vision, I say, you, you got to really work on yourself because life will catch you on the blind side. I say, you better be ready and you better make sure you want it because it'll make you cry. And somebody said, the spirit is on him. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I was talking till it started blinking the lights. They had to come pull me off. And I said, you got to have a larger vision. You make sure, wait a minute. You make sure you work on yourself. They said, come on, Mr. Brown, come on. Yeah. I went back to my hotel room. And loneliness and heartbreak was sitting on the bed. Said, are you coming in now? Do you have your larger vision now? <laughs> How's your positive attitude? <laughs> Say, get on in here. <laughs> Are you still breathing? Shut, shut up. <laughs> no, you want your gold? No, I don't want this gold. No, I don't. <laughs> Life will wear you out. You'll be saying, no, I can't. And no, I won't. <laughs> you try to read it, can't see nothing through the tears. <laughs> I went plundering through the drawers in this hotel trying to find a Gideon Bible, anything, you know. I said, somebody, anybody help me, Yahweh, Yahoo, anybody. So, <laughs> boy, I tell you, that's why you got to work on yourself. Because life will send you some curves you cannot anticipate. The next thing is that whatever you do, you want to develop technical mastery. You want to be the best at what you do. You want to master it. See, part of, of, of self-motivation is you've got to find something that gives you a strong sense of competence. Well, you become known for that. You develop a reputation of being good at doing that. You set some high personal standards for yourself. You're not competing with anybody else. You're just unfolding yourself to be the best person that you could be. That you want to give the best quality service that you can give because that is a statement about who you are. The other thing that's the key to self-motivation is recognize the fact that you're going to get into some slumps. Recognize the fact that you're going to encounter a great deal of failure in life. It goes with the territory. But in the face of that, you want to be relentless. When you want something, you don't expect everybody to say, oh, come on in, we've been, oh, you want this? Oh, great, we want to give this to you. You're such a nice person. You're doing it for your family, aren't you? Great. No, no, life isn't like that. No, many doors will be closed in your face. Many loans that you will want. And they'll say, no, you don't have enough collateral. You don't have enough credit. And most people will give up. But you've got to decide that I'm going to be fearless. I refuse to be denied, and I'm going to go all out. I'm going to be relentless. I don't care how many no's I encounter. I like something Isaiah Thomas said when he's getting ready for a basketball game. He said, I'm going to either shoot us in or shoot us out, but I'm not going to not do anything. <laughs> and that's the way to go. You can't make a basket unless you shoot the ball. You can't hit a home run unless you take a swing at it. Most people won't even take a swing. Well, I probably won't make it anyhow. That's the conversation within. They probably won't give it to me anyhow. If you want something, you've got to be relentless. You've got to decide, I deserve this and I'm going to have it. And you go all out to get it. 
that drives you. The next thing is that when you want something out of life, you've got to be willing to go into action. Don't wait around for things to be just right. Don't wait for things to be perfect. Don't wait for the ideal situation. It will never be ideal. There will always be a reason. Well, as soon as the children grow up, as soon as I pay my bills, as soon as I get my divorce, all kinds, as soon as I get enough money together, do what you can where you are with what you have and never be satisfied. A lot of people never take a chance in life. They don't want to take any chances. They want the situation to be ideal. See, that's not walking by faith. That's walking by sight. If I can see it, I'll do it. No, 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 no. That's a lot of people say, if I can see it, I'll believe it. No, 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 no. If you believe it, you can see it. And don't be disturbed because no one else can see it. That's not unusual. That is ordinary. But because you want some different kind of results in your life, you've got to be willing to be unreasonable. If you want unreasonable results in your life, you've got to be willing to be unreasonable. Part of being unreasonable, you don't judge according to appearances. Part of being unreasonable, you can see it because you believe it. That's part of being unreasonable. Part of being unreasonable, you're like Paul who said, you must have the faith to call forth those things that be not as though they were. That's part of being unreasonable. Most people won't do that. Most people say, call me when you get it together. <laughs> then I'll support you. <laughs> the other thing is that one of the keys to self-motivation that empowers you is that you want to find a cause larger than yourself. Find something that you can contribute to. Find something that you can make a difference because you can. Part of what feeds your larger vision, part of what gives you a reason for being, part of what gives you your life is being able to give something back. Say, I can't afford to give anything. You can't afford not to give. Give your time. Give your talent. There's nothing just to go over there and lick envelopes. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I'm going over there. It's part of my tithing in the universe. Once you develop that, that special sense of mission, and that's what you develop when you're part of a larger cause than yourself, it drives you. You don't need an alarm clock to get up in the morning. You have special power. You'll go places and folk will like to be around you. They will know there's something different about you. When you go in, they'll say, hey, that's somebody important. I want to know who you are. I just want to be near you. That energy that you have, that consciousness that you will embody will affect everybody around you. The next thing is, is that you want to create a home court advantage for yourself. You've got to be aware of who you have around you. So you want to be selective. Have friends that will enable you to grow. I have friends that help me to grow spiritually. These are my spiritual friends. I talk spiritual stuff with them. I have some other friends who are just intellectual friends. They make me grow intellectually. They make me stretch. I have some professional friends. I'm a member of the National Speakers Association. I get together with other speakers and we learn from each other and we grow from each other. I have other friends who are just social friends. All we do is just socialize together. We'll look at a basketball game together or go out dancing, but that's all we can do. We don't talk anything serious, nothing spiritual, nothing intellectual. That's not that kind of relationship. <laughs> nothing heavy up in here. <laughs> have other friends, we walk together. That's all we can do, walk together. Talk about we're gonna lose weight one day by and by for good, all right? That's all we do, nothing else. So according to the relationships that you develop. We grow from people and projects. And the relationships that you develop can enhance and can enrich your life or they can drain you. I know many talented people who had a great deal of potential but because they didn't surround themselves with other people that will inspire them to transcend themselves, they never realize their greatness and they will end up going to their grave with all their good stuff still in them. 
So you want to look at your relationships, the people that you're involved with, the people that you communicate with all, most often, and you want to ask yourself the question, what am I becoming because of this relationship? Does it inspire me? Am I motivated? Am I encouraged? Am I driven to develop myself? Am I seeking my own greatness? What kind of person am I becoming because of this relationship? Am I becoming more cynical and negative about life? Ask yourself that. The next thing is, you've got to say yes to your life. You've got to say yes. Yes to my dreams. Yes to me. Yes. I can make it. Yes, I can. Doesn't matter how many failures I've made. Doesn't matter how many mistakes I've endured. Doesn't matter about my defeats. Doesn't matter about what I've done. Yes. Yes. I don't care about the fact I'm in a hole now. Doesn't matter about where I am. Yes. The last chapter to my life has not been written yet. If you judge me now, you'll judge me prematurely. I haven't exposed all my stuff yet. I'm still in the process of transforming my life. I'm still in the process of becoming. Yes. I had somebody in my life at one time told me, you'll never make it. And I said, I'll show you. And, I, and what energized me, what motivated me was something that Frank Sinatra said. He said, the best revenge is massive success. you you just watch my smoke as old folks used to say so say yes stand up for your dreams stand up for what you want in your life decide that your life is so meaningful to you that you love you and you love life so much that you're going to stand up for something you want I used to have a saying when I was on the radio stand up for what you believe in because you can fall for anything. So what I say to you this evening, that you are powerful. You have miracle working power in your life right now. But you've got to work on yourself. You've got to develop yourself. You've got to talk to yourself day in and day out. Selling yourself on you and on your potentials. And you've got to know that, that you are worth all of your effort. And that the key to your motivation, as you get a larger vision of yourself, is to know that you have something to give. Is to know that you have a reason for being in the universe at this point in time. I want you to stand up for your life right now. Anybody want to stand up for your life? Stand up for your dream? Stand up for your dream! it's going to come back now it might not come back through that channel but it's going to come back why because it is a law whatever you give it's going to come back now all of us hear the saying as you sow so shall you reap and we usually we use that in a negative context but let's look at the positive side of that that if you sow some good stuff out here if you make it your business how you give your life to give the best that you have, to give love, to give encouragement, to give help, to give support. If that's what your life is about, whatever you put out here, ladies and gentlemen, I guarantee you, it's going to come back. Now, the reason that most people don't give is because they operate out of a, a consciousness of scarcity. They don't believe that there's enough to go around. They can't see themselves having the capacity to give. They don't believe that they have anything to offer. They don't see themselves as an opening for the universe to work through. So if you begin to look at this new era that we're in, begin to see yourself as an opening for the universe to move through, to work through. 
to make a difference in life. See yourself being used by life to improve the quality of life, to expand and to grow. Most people have a very limited view of themselves and a very limited view of the universe, do not see their relationship to the universe and cannot see how energy and things can flow through them. I love Gibran and the prophet. Then said a rich man, speak to us of giving. And he answered, you give but little when you give of your possessions, but it's when you give of yourself that you truly give. Gibran goes on to say that those who give little of the much which they have, and they give it for recognition, and their hidden desire makes their gifts unwholesome. And we know people who give only to be recognized. I, I love that old saying, judge a man not by what he does, but by that that he doesn't have to do. And to judge the true quality of a man is what do you do when nobody's looking? Gibran goes on to say something else important. He says, and there are those who have little and give it all. These are the believers in life and the bounty of life. See, most people don't give, ladies and gentlemen, because they don't believe in life. Most people don't give because they don't understand the abundance in life. And so they go through life holding back. Holding back on life. Not understanding this also. That what you hold back from life, life holds back from you. So most of us go through life, ladies and gentlemen, not giving. And we're cheating ourselves. And you're also cheating life. See, I believe that, that all of us have some work to do. I strongly believe that. That each one of us showed up to do something. That each one of us showed up to contribute something to life. And that if we don't do it, it will not be done. See, no one is going to give Les Brown speech. No one is going to write your book. See, if you've been given something to do, and if you don't do it, what you're doing is short-circuiting the flow of the universe. See, if, just imagine, if you please, we had a circle, and people are standing around in this circle. And let's say we were given a bucket of love. And then I pass it to the person to the right, and they pass it to somebody else, 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 and it comes back to me. One of the great things about giving is that as you give, you're going to receive. What we want to do is keep the flow going, keep the flow going. If anybody gets the bucket of love and stops and holds it there, all of us suffer. They've short-circuited the flow. They've stopped what was going on, the energy that was going around. See, you are part of an equation, and you are needed. Part of why we should begin to look at how we give up our lives, and that we've got to begin to see what is it that I'm supposed to do? What is my life work? And then give ourselves to that. Because as we do that, ladies and gentlemen, I guarantee you, as you begin to take on this new era that we're in, if you decide that I'm going to begin to start living life generously, I'm going to start giving more of myself. I'm going to start putting out more, contributing more to life. Here's what's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. I guarantee you that life will take on a whole new meaning for you. I guarantee you that as you begin to give more of yourself in your work, give more of yourself in your marriage, give more of yourself in your relationships with your families and friends, give more of yourself to your talent, to your vocation, to your job or your business, as you begin to set high standards for giving that which you have been given to share in the universe, I guarantee you that life takes on a whole new dimension. That you'll be happier, you have a greater sense of happiness and fulfillment in life. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to have some challenges. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have some problems that you'll be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. No, that doesn't mean any of that. No, that will not exempt you from that. But what it does mean that now you will begin to take off on some new paths to some new horizons. That you'll begin to see life totally different than most people. I think that's what Henry David Thoreau meant when he said most men live in quiet desperation. That most of us go through life because we're not using that which we've been given, that we are punished. That we're going through life getting up in the morning with no reason to get up. See, once you find out your purpose in life, and once you decide that you're going to live a life of sharing and giving and contributing to life, you don't need an alarm clock to get up. That you move differently. You have more life in you. But most people are walking around dead. Most people are looking lifeless. Most people find it a hard effort to smile. 
Most people abusing themselves with alcohol and drugs and evading their own greatness and, and holding back on themselves for years. I was cheating myself. For years, I could have been doing exactly what I'm doing right now. But I was afraid. I didn't feel I was worthy, and I didn't want to recognize that which I had been given. I had a limited view of me, and I was literally running away from me. I mean, life sometimes chases me and says, no, 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 we want you to do something great. No, not me. Go get somebody else. No, 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 no. You're not talking about me. No, no, no. You don't know what I've been doing. No, 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 no. We want you. We can just groom you and, and train you and, and get you ready. Me, yeah. Are you sure? Me, yeah. No, no, not me. No, I just, I'm just down. No, I don't want to do that. See. <laughs> and then said, I just get tired of chasing. Say, come over here. Come over here. <laughs> you ain't got enough sense to come. Just come over and shut up and straighten up. <laughs> They just whip you so hard after a while, you say, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the reasons that we should begin to give more is because we owe a debt. Reading a book, John Powell, who I'm afraid to tell you who I am because you might not like me and that's all I've got. Line in there, I, I love to quote, we are made by those who love us and by those who refuse to love us. As I talk to you right now, you're looking at a lot of people up here, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just Les Brown standing here. A lot of people have contributed to make me who I am right now. None of us are here because of our own doing. All of us have had life to contribute to us. Many times complete strangers. So we all have cookie people in our lives. What do you mean by cookie people? Cookie people and chicken soup people, as I call them when I do my workshops. Cookie people are people like Miss Lillian. When my mother used to whip me as a kid, and I was a bad twin, always getting in trouble, Miss Lillian would hear me screaming, and after Mama would get through, Miss Lillian would come over to the house and give me some cookies <laughs> and milk. And my, you know, and, and my Mama said, "What you doing back, Lillian? I'm just giving him some cookies, Mamie." And she said, "Here you are, Leslie. Even though you're a bad little boy, I brought you some cookies." <laughs> So cookie people are people who, even when you are bad, even when you are not being who you really are, they look beyond your faults and see your needs. Even if you're a moody person and curse them out and dog about sometimes, these cookie people love you unconditionally. How many of you have ever had cookie people in your life? All right. So we all have had cookie people that the universe has put in our lives to contribute to us. The other people are the chicken soup people. Chicken soup people are people that you can call at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, I got a flat tire, will you come help me? Or my battery is not running, would you come give me a jump? Or I need some help, would you come get me out of jail? <laughs> if you don't have some chicken soup people in your life, you better get some. <laughs> but these are people that you can always call on to help you out. So I'm encouraging you to give a letter of appreciation to some of the cookie people in your life. Some of them might have already made their transition. Write some letters to some people who were a leg up for you, some people who contributed to you being who you are. And just say, I was just thinking over the years, I know you know I love you and appreciate everything you've been to me, but I just wanted to drop you this letter. How do you think they feel if they get that? Just out of nowhere, just want to thank you for how you have enriched my life. You might not have thought much of it, but because of the help and assistance you gave me on that particular day, that was a turning point in my life. Why should we give? Well, giving creates a vacuum. And as we know, nature abhors a vacuum. See, when you give, you create a vacuum, you are now in a position to receive. See, if I have my arms closed holding on to everything I've got, nothing is available to come in. But if I'm open, if I've created a vacuum there, by giving and keeping the flow going, the stuff in the universe is going to come back to me, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to come back, whatever you give. Whenever I go into a room and give a speech to inspire people, to help them to develop their greatness, if you get 10% of what I get, because as Bach says, we teach that which we need most. I'm not wearing any crown. I need it as much as I'm sharing it. I'm still growing. I'm still unfolding. I'm still seeking to discover my greatness. And if you get 10% of what I get when I walk out of here, see, there will be a different man walking out of here than who came in here. And as I give, the more I give to you, the more I get. 
Most people don't understand that. That's a law of life. Do you know that we can literally eliminate poverty overnight? We can eliminate hunger and homelessness overnight if people understood the concept of what giving means and the power in it about the difference that it can make in our lives. I guarantee if you go to any rundown neighborhood and interview the people there, evaluate their lifestyles and what they're doing and what they're contributing to life, and then go in a wealthy neighborhood and talk to those people and evaluate them and check out what they're doing with their energy and their time and what they're contributing to life. Here's what you're going to discover what Earl Nightingale said. He said, our success in life is directly related to the quantity and the quality of the service that we give. I guarantee you that you will find that people who have more, people that are living the abundant life, are the contributors to life, ladies and gentlemen. They are the people that are giving more. And the people who are operating out of scarcity and poverty consciousness, these are the people that are down and out. These are the people that are complaining. These are the people that are blaming the world and everybody for where they are. But if they took that same energy and begin to invest and give something back to life. I was in New Jersey and I had to give a, a political presentation to a group there that were trying to organize a community to begin to revitalize that particular community. And a guy was telling me very proudly as we were walking through a housing project, he said the city is about to give $55 million to renovate these housing projects. I said, what a waste. He said, why would you say that? I said, let me ask you something. And the person that was standing next to him, I said, do you live in this building here? He said, yes. I said, how many families live here? He said, six families. I said, we walked in the door and we can smell the stench of urine. Does it take a genius to go down to the store and perhaps sacrifice buying three packs of cigarettes and buy some tired of soap and water and come back here and wash this stench out of here? Does it take a genius to get a can of paint and paint over the graffiti and repair the mailbox? Does it take a genius for that? I say to you, you pour the money in these housing projects and you don't change the people that are living in the projects before you are completed, they'll be right back to where they were before. Yeah. If it is to stand, and I'm not saying that there aren't situations where people need some help and assistance, but people must be allowed to contribute. I say they should pay for the paint. I say they should pay for the mailboxes to be repaired and the windows to be broken. And I guarantee you, if the children go outside throwing a ball, they say, don't you hit that window, you fool. You know how much I paid for that window? <laughs> Makes a difference. People need to be given the opportunity to contribute and invest in life. And then life is appreciated. But if we just give, and you don't want to just give. You want to give to people who are out there struggling and making it and trying to make impact on the universe. I'd rather give to a man who's already doing it than somebody over here doing nothing and trying to go over there. Man, why don't you get up and do something? Hey, listen, if you have to go over there and get them up, you have to do that for the rest of your life. So do it with those who are doing it. So you want to keep the flow going by working with people who are contributors to life. Leave the dead people alone that are taking away from life. There's a scripture, when I heard it, I couldn't understand it. I say, how cold? He that hath shall get, and he that hath not, even that that he has shall be taken away. I said, now that's not fair. Ladies and gentlemen, that is fair. He that hath what becomes the key. He that hath a generous view of life. He that has courage. He that hath initiative. He that hath resourcefulness shall get. But if you're like the guy that I was in a hotel and asked him, I said, look here. I said, um, you know, he was a bellman. I said, you know, I, I need to get my shoes shined. Oh, I don't shine shoes. Oh, how long have you been working here? Oh, about three months. What were you doing before then? Oh, I just got out of the joint. Yeah? You don't shine shoes. That's beneath you, but it was okay to steal. That's not beneath you, huh? <laughs> See, it, uh, same, another guy was ex-offender. I was telling him I had a job for him. What kind is it? What do you care? <laughs> Making an honest living, not worried about somebody knocking on your door in the middle of the night. If it's cleaning toilets, you ought to be happy. See, he's a taker, ladies and gentlemen. He thinks that somebody's just going to come give him something out here in life. It doesn't happen that way. No, it doesn't happen that way. Here's something else you're going to discover in giving.
something that's very important. Give thanks. Giving thanks creates power. Give thanks for your house. Give thanks for your apartment, for your car, for your family, for your health, for your relationships, for what you have. When we focus on something, it expands. When you're giving thanks, when you're showing a spirit of gratitude for what I got, not that you're satisfied with it, but you're grateful for what you got. Whatever you focus on, that's what you're going to continue to multiply and expand in your life. But if you focus on what you don't have, if all you can do is point out the negative things in your life, whatever you focus on, you're going to expand that. Some people, all they can do is complain. That's all they can do. They can't find anything to say good about life or about anybody else. Every time they open their mouths, that's what their minds are consumed with, and that's all they're producing in their lives. And these are people that you don't want to be around. Develop a spirit of gratitude. I'm thankful for life. I'm thankful to be an American. I'm thankful to be on this part of the planet. I'm thankful to see another day. No things aren't what I want them to be. No, I don't have all the things I want to have. But I'm thankful that I'm still here. I have another opportunity, another day to live, another chance to contribute, another chance to make a difference in life. So begin to give thanks for what you have. Whatever you focus on, remember now, you want to become aligned with the universe. If you have scarcity in your life, it's because you have a consciousness of scarcity. As you begin to become thankful for what you have, but the abundance that you now know is coming your way, that you're attracting to you for the good relationship that is coming your way right now, it will begin to create incredible opportunities for you to begin to improve your life and the quality of life of people around you. Giving is also, ladies and gentlemen, forgiving. Give forgiveness. Many of us do not realize that we cannot grow, that we are blocking ourselves, we are blocking our good in the universe. We're literally standing in the way of the flow of what life has to us because we haven't learned how to forgive. We haven't learned how to let things go so we can get on with our lives. When we forgive, ladies and gentlemen, it's not for the other person. Oh, no. It's for you. It's not for them. Not because they deserved it or they earned it. You're forgiving other people. First of all, you've got to forgive yourself. But when you forgive other people, it is mentally and spiritually healthy to forgive. To let that luggage go, as Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. Oh, we hear it, but it's hard to do. It's hard. What you have is enough. Whatever you have to give. And the more you give, the more you realize you have to give. And we all have to. There are people who made the supreme sacrifice for us to enjoy freedoms that we take for granted. Oh, none of us, none of us can feel that we have nothing to give back. Next thing is, giving empowers you. It makes you more powerful. See, the more you give to life, the more you are able to get from life. See, most of us go through life, ladies and gentlemen, feeling that we don't have enough to share, feeling that we will be depleted if we give of our resources because we don't see ourselves connected to the abundance of life. I feel very strongly that we can make an incredible difference in life. Phyllis Marx said, giving empowers you because taken to its ultimate, what you are really giving is love. Love is the motivating force behind the infinite supply of universal energy. Love truly makes the world go round. And as with anything circular, it's going keep coming back. Phyllis is right. So as she continues to give love and hope to these people, she receives love and hope for herself and helping to begin to restructure and redesign the kind of life that she wants. We all have had experiences in our lives that if we permit these experiences to do so, we will allow them to weigh us down. If we permit them to do so, there will be luggage that will be dragging through life holding us down, stifling our potential to give and to contribute life. If we continue to carry all of these things, we can never be open to the love and the abundance and the opportunity that life has to offer us because we are so full with what we've got. I'm thinking about an exhibition that was 
held in Africa where they were trying to catch some monkeys that were a very rare species. And because they were so fast, so agile, and, and very fragile, they did not want to harm them in, in catching them. They did not want to hurt them physically. So what they did in order to catch them, they found that these monkeys were very fond of a certain kind of nut that grew in that particular area of Africa. And what they did was that they put these nuts inside of bottles and put a rope on the bottle and held the rope from a distance. And so the monkeys would come and, being curious, see the nuts inside the bottle, would reach in and pick the nuts up. Now, what happened was that they couldn't pull their hands out with the nuts still in the bottle. <laughs> and so then the exhibitioners, the hunters, would come while the monkeys are there just jumping around. All they have to do now is let the nuts go. <laughs> That's all they got to do is just let they just dance it all around. All they have to do is let it go and they can be free and run. They hold it on to the nuts and the people come and catch them. <laughs> and a lot of us, that life is kicking our butt and all we have to do, <laughs> all we have to do <laughs> is let it go. <laughs> We just keep holding on <laughs> like we're crazy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, giving creates energy in ourselves and in others. Have you ever helped a blind person go across the street or help a senior citizen or give somebody some help? You know, just, you know, held a door for somebody, an elevator. I mean, don't you have a good feeling inside like, I done good. <laughs> How many of you get a good feeling inside when you do something good for somebody? See, we're really giving to ourselves. See, that's really the law. When you are giving, you are giving to yourself. That's who you're giving to. So you want to give yourself some good gifts. There's a principle underlying the concept of giving. The energy flowing through us as we do that love generates abundance in our lives and we are able to reap so much from life as a result of our giving. How are you giving up your life? Do you know to the degree that you are giving to that degree determines how much you enjoy life? How meaningful your life is? There are things, ladies and gentlemen, I used to do I can't do now. That is unbecoming for the role that I have selected with where I am at my life and what I want to contribute to life. It is inconsistent. I can't do it. Even if I desire to do it, I can't do it. No, because it doesn't fit because of my vision of myself and the contribution that I want to make to life. Because it's not enough to give the message. You must also be the message. Next thing is that we must give out of a sense of oughtness. Emmanuel Kant in the book called Critique of Pure Reasoning, he says sometimes we must give out of a sense of oughtness, that the certain things that happen, that we just say something ought to be done about this. A policeman in Washington, D.C. was working one of his patrol areas and he came up to a car in a park and the car was running, and he saw a figure slumped over the stern wheel. He got there looking in with a flashlight, and he saw a 14-year-old boy with a bullet through the back of his head. And he said, oh no, he has a son himself. That could have been his son. And he said, something ought to be done. We're losing too many young people. And so this man went home. He had like several thousand dollars worth of exercise equipment, in his basement. He rented a place. He started bringing the kids in to get them involved in taking care of their bodies and physical exercise and athletic activity. He now has expanded that to getting them involved in entrepreneurial ventures, saying that this is a free enterprise system and the more enterprising you are, the freer you are. And now these kids have started their own business. They have a little shopping center that they run, they operate, they are managing. And they have commercials on radio, and I'm going to be going there doing some training with them. So he decided, because of that event, that I ought to do something. 
Now, some of the things that's going to happen when you look out and see what can I contribute to, what can I give, I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have a voice that's saying, it's just no use. It's, it's, it's out of control now. There will be a voice telling you that you'll be wasting your time and wasting your energy and wasting your effort. I say, don't listen to it. Listen to that still, small voice that says, I can do something, and I ought to do it. We ought to do it. The Israeli said this, nothing can resist the will of a people that will stake even their existence on the extent of that purpose for good. I strongly believe that as we begin to look toward the future, and that as each day we get up in the morning, and be it that you're going to give to make the environment safer for everybody on the planet, be it that you're going to do things to help the sick or the physically disabled or recovering crack cocaine addicts, be it that you want to help and contribute to youth or do something for the homeless, whatever you want to do, if you get up in the morning out of a sense of oughtness and decide that I am an opening for the universe, that life can work through and use me as a channel and as an instrument for change. And each day we get up, we make it our personal business to make a difference in those areas that we're concerned about. How are we going to do it? We don't know. But we know that we can make a difference. And we might not be here to see the results of our efforts. We might not be here as many of the people who before us made sacrifices that they did not live to see or reap the benefits of. James Weldon Johnson, Stony the Road We Trod, Bitter the Chesting Rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers died? We've come over a way that with tears has been watered. We've come treading a path through the blood of the slaughtered. When we came here, somebody paid the price for us to be here. And as we begin to look toward the future, we all have an obligation to give something back. A lot of us don't give more because of the fact that we allow ego to get in the way. I'm thinking of a man that was well-dressed walking through a neighborhood one day and a lady came to the door and she said, hey you. He stopped, he said very politely, yes ma'am. She said, come here. He came to her Yes, what may I do for you, ma'am? She said, I want you to cut my wood. He said, yes, ma'am. He took his coat off, and he took the axe that she had there, and he cut the wood. She said, I want you to take some around the back and put some in the fireplace. He said, yes, ma'am, and he did that. And after he finished, she said, what do I owe you? He said, nothing, ma'am. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you. She said, okay. And he left and he was walking down the street with his coat over his shoulder. And her maid came up. She said, do you know who that was? And the lady she worked for said, no. She says, that's the great Negro educator, Booker T. Washington. She looked out the window. She said, is that right? She said, send for him. And that lady that Boogie G. Washington went in and cut the wood for, contributed several million dollars to his dream of building an institution of higher learning, Tuskegee Institute that is standing today. What if he had said, Excuse me. you said, do what? <laughs> Cut your wood. Don't even come up in here with that kind of stuff. You better cut your own wood if you wanted to get it cut. You cold. He didn't allow his ego to get in the way. He gave what he had, he contributed. How much have we denied ourselves? How much have we blocked ourselves? 
because we allow that little ego to get in the way, to prevent us from giving and serving, which is the essence of life, which is the essence of life. It's about service. And so I say, as you look out on the future, decide that you are going to allow your life to be a life of service. Decide that you are going to give more than you have ever given before. Decide that each day that you are given life, that you're going to make a difference with your life, that you're going to make a statement with your life, that once again, as opposed to sitting back feeling like a victim, that you're going to see yourself as a channel, as an opening for the universe to work through, and that you'll say to life, use me. Oh, use me. I got more to give. Use me. Repeat after me. I want life to use me. I want to give more. Share more. Be an expression of love. Be an instrument of hope. To impact our youth. To recreate their future. I'm grateful for life. I'm grateful for being here. I'm grateful to be able to serve. This is Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy, Leslie Calvin Brown, saying it's been a plum-pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. Thank you all here. Thank you.